Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, open session for our October meeting. We're meeting virtually uh, because of uh, the situation we all find ourselves in with COVID. So we have a great session this afternoon uh, calling Preparing the American Chemical Enterprise for Disruption. And I will tell you, we should have had this session three years ago because right now we are living in the great disruption. We're seeing it through our lives. Uh, I can ex talk in my own area, which is uh, automotive plastics. Computer chips are radically changing the, the automotive market. We're seeing specialty chemical shortages. Most of specialty chemicals come from India and China, a lot of them. And so just I, uh, for my own company, we've had hundreds of force majeures this year because of this great disruption. We're also seeing huge labor shortages as well. And we see this in our own lives as we go into restaurants, but we're also seeing it for uh, chemist and chemical engineering talent that we are, we are living in a very, very different dynamic. We were probably on the on teetering of this, but COVID has really forced the world over. It's a very dynamic cost environment as well. Logistic shipping companies are, are it really dramatically disrupted the supply chain. And so uh, this is a really critical session and of utmost importance uh, to the United States. So I'm really uh, happy to introduce the team that built this wonderful program. Uh, my good buddy, Gerard from Procter & Gamble and the BCSD uh, uh, program officer, Linda Anon, who's been working on it. So I'm gonna pass it to Gerard. Hey, thank you, Scott. I'm doing the usual sound check, Cincinnati. You can hear Cincinnati. Terrific, thank you, Scott. Hey, good afternoon all. And you said it very well, uh, Scott. Uh, and for those who are attending uh, externally to this uh, board of uh, chemical science and technology, uh, this is a smart choice of your time. Uh, and I want to thank specifically Linda Non uh, from the staff. She has done a brilliant job, not only with me, but also with the speakers. I will come back later to prepare this session. So uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, for the next 90 minutes, uh, we have an exciting trio of speakers who will engage with us, like Scott says, on the topic of very high on our mind, how can the chemical enterprise in the US prepare itself for the next disruptions? How can it set itself up for success for tackling some of the considerable challenges that we know are in front of us? And we'll come back to those later. While simultaneously, and this is the uh, power engine and what makes us so hopeful, while capitalizing on the astounding, and I say that from an industry vantage point, the astounding pace of advancements in the fields of computational, environmental, biological, or more traditional chemistries. And like Scott said, it's an appropriate time to have this session. COVID-19, Scott said it, has been a high opener. And this forces all of us and the speakers we engage with Linda to ask ourselves a lot of questions like, were we prepared to protect our society against COVID-19? Most importantly, are we prepared for the next threat? And maybe we are, maybe we are not. Were we ready to handle the acute escalation of supply chain challenges that Scott you know, is seeing every day in his job and so I do and so is the society? Are we prepared to see the more and more visible signs of global climate changes happening? Are we prepared for them, sustainability? And are we prepared to attract and develop and retain the right diversity of the new skills and talents that we will need to be able to disrupt constructively the chemical enterprise? And finally, and you will hear that from a lot of speakers, is <sighs> how can we reinvent the way we are innovating in the chemical enterprise? In this context, begs two major themes that I will facilitate with the help of my, uh, our three guests. First theme, what recent or new strategies are being developed or already employed that have the potential to drive and elevate the American chemical disruption process? And I'm glad to report we have some success models that will give us some hope to, with us this afternoon. And importantly for all of us after this meeting, how can we as players in the US chemistry enterprise be more effective? Were we into the industry, into the governments, or in the academics, or coaching students? We have all a role to play. So we are delighted to have three speakers. They are not going to address all these questions, but they are going to give us some hopes, and they are going to give us some tips, 
and we may also challenge them with some tough questions. These three speakers have anticipated, and I really want to say operationalized, new ways to disrupt the chemical innovation process. The collaboration within the chemical enterprise and they have been able to create value. So we are going to learn a lot of them from them. They have built also during their careers, strong partnership across the chemical enterprise, industry, research institutions, or government agencies. And I will present them briefly. Uh, you have their bio in the pre-reading. So let me give you some uh, teasers. And first I will uh, start with uh, Mr. Ignacio Martinez. Ignacio is a senior leader with flagship pioneering currently. He has a track record of participating to some of the most disruptive and value creation institutions like Syngenta Venture, which has played a very innovative role in the world of the agricultural field. And of course, flagship pioneering, creating new companies, modernize one of them, but there are more of them that have clearly challenged and changed and disrupted the healthcare. Uh, Ignacio is altogether a scientist, an innovator, and an entrepreneur who not only are creating a successful portfolio of uh, innovation, but also new business models. So we are going to enjoy our talk with uh, Ignacio. Next, we will have Dr. Jess Lieber, who works for Ginkgo Bioworks, whose reputation I'm sure as a pioneer in synthetic biology is well known to all of you. And Jeff has over 20 years of experience and expertise as a microbiologist, molecular biologist, and metabolic engineer. So some, a lot of empathy with the members of this board. And Jeff has a vast experience in the university as well as in the industry with unlocking commercial opportunities out of new scientific advancements in the field of scientific biology. Then we will have Dr. Anthony Bocanfuso. And I know Anthony is well known to many of you with his enduring leadership in UIDP. And UIDP has elevated clearly, we see that from the industry, the partnership between corporate industries, small industries, uh, government and academics to the new levels, stimulating new value creation on the way. And UIDP is obviously a poster child from the National Academy of Sciences and the NSF. Um, Tony was recently involved into the creation of ERVA, the NSF's Engineering Research Visioning Alliance, which is one of the springboard for the chemistry industry to be able to disrupt itself. So all these speakers will share their experiences and their perspectives on how to approach the disruption and the innovation process with finding solutions to big society problems. They will help us a lot, I'm sure, during the discussion, survey various strategies, to drive the innovation and drive to the solutions of the problems that we are dealing with. Overall, again, the objective is to judge if this topic is of interest, so I hope there will be a discussion and further follow-up. Let me start now with Ignacio from Flagship, and I would like, Ignacio, uh, for you to share for 20 minutes a bit more out of Flagship Pioneering and your personal experience and then we can have a 10 minutes chat on some of the questions that we have for you. Ignacio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gerard. Can you hear me well? Perfect. Perfect. So thank you, Gerard. And uh, first of all, thank you, Linda, as well, uh, for the opportunity uh, to share with you our experiences on the innovation landscape uh, and the opportunity to interact with everybody here. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm going to talk. The, the, the kind of the title of my talk is Pioneering Innovations, Opportunities and Challenges. Um, I'm gonna explain first why we are obsessed with uh, pioneering innovations. Then I will explain what Flagship does and how we do it very, very briefly. And they'll end up with a slide uh, sharing the opportunities and challenges that we have at Flagship, but also that I'm sure most of you have on your respective of your respective roles. So if you go to the next slide, please. So the reason why we are obsessed with this um, mindset of pioneering innovation is because as Gerard mentioned um, in a different way, we don't have a lot, a lot of time left. Um, there are two uh, 
observations here. One, that we are healthier than we've ever been before uh, as human beings. Uh, and second is that the fact that we are more people and we are healthier and live longer uh, is putting the resources we have on this planet um, at a very difficult situation. So uh, there are, uh, on the good side, we have more life expectancy, children are living longer, are, are healthier, we are increasing crop, crop yields in agriculture, population is growing. Um, on the pressure, on the resource pressure side, there is a lot of water, water pollution, air pollution, there is biodiversity loss and, and deforestation, and there are obviously more challenges and, and, and good things happening, but we are as kind of a, we have a collective responsibility to innovate and use uh, chemistries because as the chief scientific officer of one of our companies who used to run Syngenta Global uh, Crop Protection Chemistry, he said, he said, chemistry is everywhere. So if there is a group who have a responsibility um, to address these, these opportunities and challenges is, is all of us. If you go to the next one, let me introduce you to your flagship uh, pioneering. Um, so we are an institution that has evolved obviously like all institutions over the years, but uh, we are conceiving, creating, resourcing and developing companies in those both areas of human health and sustainability. And when we say companies, uh, we talk about uh, platform companies. It is not just developing companies with the idea of creating value and then sell them over, over philosophies to create platform companies, make them grow and make systemic changes in the different industries uh, that we go after. Um, as as you mentioned, one of our companies is Moderna Therapeutics that we all know. Uh, and we have examples of other impactful companies in both areas of human health and, and sustainability. So it's life sciences broadly. Um, I'll explain to you a little bit the process that we have to uh, develop these pioneering companies. Um, is that we believe in teamwork, we believe in process, um, we believe in, in the fact that uh, discipline has to be applied to the uh, company creation um, activity. The firm as a, as a whole has now around seven, around $6.7 billion of committed capital. Um, we proactively uh, issue, issue patents. So we have at Flagship now 250 people um, doing origination, protecting our inventions, doing research. Um, and and the, the, these days we are launching between five to six uh, new companies per year. So this is Flagship in a snapshot. Um, if you go to the next one, please. And please feel free to ask questions along the way uh, if, you, if you want. There are four components of our platforms. The first one is the kind of the integrated business model. Um, we are an institution where we combine capital, and I mentioned the amount of capital that we are managing, with the scientific um, our research um, that we perform. There are majority of the organization at Flux are scientists and entrepreneurs. Uh, and the fourth, the third dimension is the entrepreneurship. Um, so usually these three these three domains are in different places. Could be uh, in a university, could be in a venture capital firm, could be an entrepreneur that is trying to to develop new companies. In the case of Flux, if we have brought this into one single roof. Um, we have five origination teams. Each origination team has between eight to 14 people originating ideas and, and ventures as, um, as a living. And they are supported by functional groups like intellectual property, finance, human resources, etc. The process, um, we have a process that I will explain on the next slide, which we do systematically. Business principles is the third component uh, and the business principle uh, touches both a couple of things. On the first side, as I mentioned, is about building bio platform companies. So the idea of having multiple uh, goals on, shot, uh, uh, on multiple shots on goal. Um, there are um, obviously a lot of issues with regards to building platforms because at the beginning, um, people tend to develop 
uh, product mindset and we try to delay that product mindset uh, to make sure that we have uh, the we develop the breadth of the platform. But then at some point, obviously, um, we have a, a product pipeline and, and a pipeline of solutions as well. And the fourth one is a pioneering culture. So here we apply kind of a um, orthogonal thinking where we put ideas under a lot of pressure. Um, we have what our founder calls the an immigrant mindset because we are very comfortable being uncomfortable because we don't know at the beginning if these things will be true. We don't know if they will work. Um, and we pressure test the ideas uh, to make sure that um, we develop the best iteration of the ideas. Uh, but it is all the people embedded at Flagship have this mindset of trial and error. Um, and it's okay being wrong because we are working in multiple things in parallel. So if you go to the next one, which is a key slide at, at Flagship, this is the way we work in terms of phases. Um, phase number one, and call highly over this because this could be a long discussion and we could spend the whole day talking about this, but we start the first phase with an exploration or a what if question. Uh, for example, one of the questions that we asked was, what if we could develop a set of biological products that could complement chemical pesticides uh, to be used in agriculture? Uh, we start with nothing. In most of the cases, it's a kind of a dream. Uh, and with the idea of this phase is to develop what we call venture hypothesis. So there is a group of two or three people or four people in some cases that explore an area of interest and they know that if they reply, if they can answer to this what if question could be uh, something transformational. If we find one hypothesis that we like, um, we go into the phase two, which is what we call protocol. And it stands for prototyping of a company. So the same way manufacturing companies prototype products, automotive companies prototype cars, we prototype companies. And this phase is last between six to 12 months um, we invest between one to million dollars. We hire scientists. Uh, we lease laboratory space to do experiments. And the idea within this phase is to prototype the company and put it under a lot of pressure uh, and see if it survives. Uh, and obviously, during this phase, there is iteration variation. We learn, um, and and we see at the end of this phase, we we usually see if there is a platform technology. We see if there is intellectual property. Uh, we see if we have attracted the interest of people. And, and one thing that we do, obviously, in this case, is talk to external people and pressure test the ideas. And we usually go outside, talk to experts in a particular field. We don't know, ask an open question. We ask. Uh, we explain to them what we try to do. They tell us most of the times that will never work. And these are the reasons that that will never work. And that says inform that information serves us to come back and iterate on the idea and try to overcome the hurdles. Uh, but if we overcome some of them or think that there is a reason to believe that we could do it, we go into the phase three, which is what we call NUCO for new company. And that's when we invest between 10, $20 million, in some cases more, and then we run. We, we start building the company. We give the company a name uh, until that is a project. Uh, we have a CEO, a CSO, and the C-level roles filled with external uh, people and a board of directors. And then when the company grows to 50, 70, or even more employees, we go into the fourth phase, which is like a growth cost. So this is not very dissimilar to children. Um, you can see if the children, then they, they need you to walk. Then they are uh, teenagers and need some money, and then they kind of become more independent. So it's, it's very similar. And obviously, every phase has, has different challenges. Uh, we've done this, as I mentioned, Many, many times uh, we've learned a lot, but obviously we continue to make mistakes and, and in every case, is, uh, every, every, in every case is, is different. If you go to the next slide, please. The interesting thing about building platforms is that there are, um, and the areas that we are touching both human health and sustainability, in, mo in some cases, the same platform conceptually could be applied to multiple fields. Uh, the things, the areas that Flagship is interested in is in human health, where we have been uh, very strong and we have a tremendous track record, both on, mainly on therapeutics, but also on diagnostics and medical devices and other R&D platforms. But some of these platforms, as, as I say, have applications in, in agriculture or what we call here planet health. 
uh, and nutritional health. So one example, for example, could be uh, gene editing, another could be microbiome, another could be other classes uh, of, of chemical platforms that could be used for um, different things and delivery or, or new uh, chemical entities discovery. Um, and that's, this is what we try to do. And this is where we have built teams of multidisciplinary members that have expertise on, on these fields, but sometimes it's, it's good to bring people who are unbiased and have, I don't know, experience in, a lot of experience in the pharma space, but never been exposed to the agricultural space and they come with great ideas and innovations and vice versa. Sometimes we start in pharma, go to agriculture, sometimes start with agriculture and go to pharma. Um, and it's a very kind of, uh, I would say, horizontal view of the world rather than vertically in, in silos. So for us, silos are, are not a good thing. And we try to think, again, uh, with vertical expertise, but more horizontally. And, and there have been uh, very interesting discoveries uh, following that regime. I'll finish with the next slide. Um, and hopefully we can have a good uh, discussion. Everything that we try to do um, falls into, in, into this legend of uh, pioneering innovation. So big companies and um, like P&G and others are, or Syngenta have current solutions. They are taking them to market. They are super successful. They have the go-to-market channels established, et cetera. There are innovators around this kind of core uh, solutions that try to innovate and improve the way things are done. Uh, sometimes they are closer, sometimes they are farther from the core. What we try to do at Flagship is to imagine different islands or different planets and try to innovate in areas where there is really um, no one or not very many people operating. And this has obviously opportunities, but has a, a lot of challenges. So if we start with the opportunities, obviously if you are on an island that no one has discovered, there is a potential to, um, to create a broad intellectual property. Um, there is no competition uh, or very, very, very little. Uh, this is an opportunity as well to define the field. Um, there was one thing we talk about as the viewer, uh, kind of pioneering innovation on a systematic basis also could be an in innovation supply chain for incumbents uh, and other stakeholders uh, and obviously, if you are there first, there is potential, and you have all these other things that I mentioned, there is a potential to um, capture uh, large value pools that at the beginning seem very, very unreasonable as these things are coming to reality, um, uh, become more, more tangible. Um, but while these opportun or opportunities are true or could be true, uh, there are a lot of challenges, and this is what we face um at Flaxi most of the times um when this is something really truly disruptive of pioneering obviously contradicts dogma um and there are uh, and it's difficult to find key opinion leaders who have been on a field for 20 30 years uh embracing it is human nature um what we try to do uh, to do on this case is learn from them because they are right in the challenges that we'll have and all the problems that we will uh, be able to deliver. And as you can imagine, um, mRNA and, and Moderna and BioNTech faced, faced it, uh, even uh, they are facing it today. Uh, it's difficult to, to, to adopt because there are a lot of things that need to be proven. Um, the other thing that is very challenging is that if, if we are developing platforms and they are very unique, um, there is no playbook to follow. So where do we go first, which is the challenges that we have all the time is you build a product platform and you need to develop a product to prove the platform. Uh, where do you go first? Where are the opportunity costs? Uh, what is the market? Um, where are the experts? And sometimes we need to bring people from, from different expertise as well. Uh, it is also very, very uncertain, as I mentioned earlier. Um, there has to be conviction that something will work without proof at the beginning that the, the platform will deliver on the promise. And obviously one, one challenge that I think is also an opportunity is this insurgent mindset. Uh, there is no leverage because there is no brand, there is no experience, uh, there is expertise. Um, 
but it is also provides the opportunities and the ventures that we develop um, with the the right to try different things because they have there is nothing to lose. So we we'll start with uh, zero. Uh, we are not going to lose anything. Uh, if Syngenta or Procter and Gamble or any other big company they start to operate in this way, they would be prob they would be also uh, kind of cost in terms of keeping the brand if things don't work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. These are some um, opportunities and challenges that we face at Flagship. There is a, um, has not been a better moment to do this activity. Uh, there is a lot of collaboration uh, as well uh, with universities. There is a collaboration with academic leaders. There is a, a, a collaboration with incumbents. Um, our philosophy is that to, to develop pioneering innovations, you, not, you, you need a consortium of players in different ways. Um, but we are also very passionate about this idea of developing these technologies for different industry segments and developing really, really fast. Because again, I don't think the the world has much a lot of a lot of time to uh, solve problems that we are we are facing today. So, with this, I'll stop. Um, I've talked a lot and I've talked fast, uh, but happy to answer any questions from the audience about flagship or about the innovation, pioneer innovations topic in general. Very good. Thank you, Ignacio. Um, perfect. Just for the audience, we will have two opportunities to ask questions to Ignacio. First, I will spend 10 minutes, you know, opening on some urgent questions, and then we will have the three speakers in a panel, which will be another possibilities for uh, the audience to engage. Hey, Ignacio, first, thank you for sharing and really giving us a lot of hope that we can make a big difference and face disruption. So thank you for that. I hope, by the way, that uh, flagship pioneering creates this new solution for the chemical enterprise to make us comfortable to be uncomfortable. We certainly are all uncomfortable, and we should be double comfortable. Uh, but seriously, I mean, this is uh, uh, the undertaking that you have taken. I'm turning to culture. And for you, maybe to give us some um, cues for the chemical enterprise, not for flagship pioneering about the culture. What you are sharing is not for the faint hearted. You are going after uh, opportunities that are not in the adjacencies, that are not in the core, they are in almost no man's land. And you create out of that of a platform. So it's certainly something very, very uncomfortable. Um, what is, how can you help a culture? How can you support a culture of high risk? Because this is a high risk development not only internally to flagship pioneering, but also with your other stakeholders, because none of us feel comfortable to play into an area that is not the adjacencies, that is not an established market, and then yet to go for it. From a culture standpoint, is what is it you do that maybe you will advise a chemical enterprise to do more of from a culture standpoint, in as you? It's a very good question, Gerard. I think that the, the main, Thing is like obviously there are differences between all the stakeholders that are on on this landscape um, and on the chemical landscape as well. I think that there are um, a few things that could be super super helpful. One is is the definition of risk. Um, so for us, risk is our friend. Uh, for a big incumbent, risk is the enemy. Um, we usually talk about return on innovation because that was what, what we do for a living. And then comes return on investment because that is more planful and, and you can do more things. Um, I think it's a question of being um, comfortable with the risk and ways to mitigate the risk because in our, in our, I think the one thing that we, it could be very helpful is the mindset of, of what failure means. For us, we don't fail because if something doesn't work, we've learned something. And then we can apply that knowledge to another thing. Um, so for, for us, failure doesn't exist and risk is our friend. I think the other thing that is could be super powerful is to, to uh, push for more collaboration um, between these different silos that exist in society and also in, in, in the chemical industry as well. I mean, See, just to give an example, Syngenta was the, the, the formation, I don't know if you know, the, the formation of, of um, uh, the two agrochemical divisions of two pharma companies, Seneca and Novartis. 
um, they separated the agrochemical part and they kept the pharmaceutical part. And then over the years, they lost this interaction where there was synergies between the different the different platforms. But I think that it should be a more, um, or there should be less silos on the one hand. And the other thing that is important for the chemical society or for chemical industry in general is that as we are thinking about new fields that will have an impact everywhere, like artificial intelligence or machine learning, uh, that it is another extra of complexity or uncertainty or risk however you want to, or opportunity, depending on how you want to say it. But I think there has to be an open mind to look at different fields that will have an impact because, as I said, AI machine learning is one example. We can discover new molecular entities using a different approach that was not possible a few years ago. And there would be more technology being developed over the next few years uh, that will help to do things differently as well. So it's, I, we always say that the only thing constant is change. So. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, so as you moved into uh, from incubation to some new businesses or experiments, is there any help that you had or you wish you had from the uh, US um, stakeholders, whether it's government, NSF, agencies, have they played a key role for us and can they play a key role to stimulate and help you know, yourself or other companies to follow the suit on going after these high risk areas? So the, yes, the obviously regulatory is extremely important. Um, there are on the good side, there are examples with the fast approval process of the vaccines. And that has been obviously super helpful and the support that the government has given different companies is, is really supportive. I think that the, the, the and we are working on this and starting to put more more effort in on on this topic of regulatory and stakeholders is the idea that if breakthrough and pioneer innovations are being developed they are disruptive in probably in less cost better performance and less time um and speed so that you can develop them and take them to market faster um that also needs to adjust or at least reconsider regulatory approval processes to approve uh, new chemical entities that could be safe for growers in the case of agriculture or, or people. Um, and the regulatory regimes are difficult to change um, and difficult to, or, or regulatory bodies are difficult to influence, but it's, I think, as we are developing pioneering innovations, we should also push on that regard as a, as a kind of a stakeholder um, management approach, but it is, uh, I think there the, the two ways in the, in which the government can help is the faster regulatory processes and more support for pioneer innovations to manage those risks that we were talking at the beginning as well. That's a good point is, um, I mean, obviously you have to ask it, the audience will ask it with Moderna, but what did it take for the regulatory experts to partner with you? and to be able to move these scientific ideas from what was an idea up to, you know, accepting it for the market. Uh, I understand obviously the COVID-19 crisis at that, but there must be more to it. So what is it brought them to the party? Is it something that you started late in the game or you brought them very, very early in the early infancy of your platforms? How did it work, Ignacio? So I don't, I honestly haven't been close operationally uh, with the case. Um, I know that there, there were, um, uh, there was an effort uh, on developing a relationship with the government and that was a good because it was kind of on both sides needed. Uh, so when the, the pandemic hit, it was not a new player and tell me who you are. They knew each other really, really well. And I think that is an important learn, learning there. Uh, they knew the companies well, they knew the technologies, they were already working together and that helped a lot with the rapid response to to the COVID crisis. Um, and I think it's something that we need to do with all innovations is, is put it in front of people and number one, educate people on, the, on these new technologies and second, get feedback from them on what could work well, what couldn't work well and be uh, humble as well as we as we are developing this, these platforms. But it's, again, it's education, uh, financial support, regulatory support, um, and if you think about it and step back a little bit, if, if so 10 years ago, if you told someone that you could develop a vaccine in 
12 yeah. months, no expert in the world would have told you, yes, you can. No one. And we did it. And, and to me, the same analogy we, I put with sustainability. We don't have, a, I mean, we don't have 50 years. We cannot continue like we are doing it now for another 50 years. And this is the COVID crisis and there is the climate change crisis. Um, and, and we have been, we have shown ourselves that we can do this because we've done it under a, a pandemic, but we should put more pressure to develop more sustainable solutions to the world. Thank you, Ignacio. I'd like to open the floor if anybody wants to uh, have a question. Uh, again, we will have a chance to have uh, Ignacio with uh, Jess and Tony later on for half an hour, but uh, please uh, chime in if you have any questions. Um, I'd like to, yeah. Uh, hi, Gerard. Maybe uh, you don't see her, uh, but I see Jen uh, has her hand up. Um, yeah, thank you. And this might be a question for later for everyone on the panel, but um, I want to thank you for that talk and, and thank you for highlighting the power of collaboration. I was curious for your thoughts on where academia, academia or academic industry partnerships kind of fit in this ecosystem and what you see as the strengths and the challenges there. Because I know, you know, again, FAST and academia often do not go together, but at the same time, there is so much freedom to, to innovate as well. I think it's a super important stakeholder for sure. I think we, we in the case of Flagship, we partner with academics quite a lot. When, when we develop ideas, as I said, and concepts, sometimes we co-develop them together. Sometimes we develop them on a, by ourselves. And then later on, we go and, and talk to them. Uh, to key opinion leaders just to get feedback and again we are we know the response we are going to get with if, if we get the response this is possible it's probably not a good sign uh if they say it's not possible it will never work and all these things and we engage with them in a relationship and at some point in the process they they become involved uh because they see we we have iterated and and created something so it's very i think academics are a very very important part universities are a very important part uh Tech transfer offices are a very important part, um, and again, it's, it's, it's better we go faster if we do this together than if we go in different ways by ourselves. So, absolutely critical. Yeah, I, I guess I was curious. Do you have thoughts um, based on your experiences of you know? I know that there are significant barriers, but are there things that we can be advocating for within our universities? You know, policy changes regarding tech transfer, policy changes regarding grants and contracts that would overcome, you know, some of the hurdles or, or allow us to better take advantage of the strengths here? You're like, what well, are there pain points on your side where you feel like, ah, maybe this isn't worth it, that, that we could be advocating for then within academia to, to change policies? I think the thing that we have to work is on is to make the system, the process more agile um, and do it fast, do it faster. Um, and it's both, it's everybody, it's not just, university all innovators as well as because it usually takes a long time and can be frustrating on both sides um but i think that if there is an academic there is the university there is flagship or there is the company sometimes we go we have developed relationships with with academics at a company company level uh there was only obviously in scientific advisory boards we have um mostly academics and industry people uh, but to me, the thing that should be improved is the agility of, of the system to make it faster. What I like, if I may, and I will encourage, and this is great, I will encourage maybe for the rest of the audience to put some thoughts when we have the 30 minutes with the panel. Let me give you a bit my perspective coming from the industry. In the industry, we like to say, let's be in love with a problem, not being in love with a solution. And out of that derives an activities. Um, the way you know, flagship pioneering is coming with this platform concept is very interesting because you are not locking yourself into one problem or big problem. You are not locking yourself into a solution, a molecule or a specific, you know, biological uh, technology. You are opening it, uh, you know, in uh, qu quite broadly. And I would dare to say, and maybe we can have the, the, uh, the discussion with this group, and I will say this should be exciting for the academics and the basic research, as well as very exciting for those who want to solve a big problem or industrialize it. It seems that I may be you know, uh, very hopeful with what you share with us, but it looks like 
this could be a huge catalyst for the different constituents of the chemical enterprise to come together. And I'm explaining, and then we will move with Jess, who will give us some other insight. But in Procter & Gamble, when we work with the uh, universities, uh, Jen, it tends we need to know the problem and we need to lock ourselves into a three years, four years research that is already into a type of solution. Here's the way that Ignacio is talking is you broaden it. We don't know exactly what the problem is, but boy, there is a big problem to be faced. And as Ignacio says, we don't have a lot of time and we can think about what is this platform. And when this platform start to take shape, it can serve different problems. So I'm just saying, wow. And I'd like to have in the 30 minutes, maybe some of the you know, comments or questions from the rest of the of the board and those who are joining us. So Ignacio, stay with us. Okay, you have really set the expectation very high. So we count on you uh, in the in the in the last thirty minutes before three o'clock. But I'd like to turn to Jess, Jess and Ginko Bioworks, because at least in my area, synthetic biology is already mainstream, and it has been mainstream because there were some pioneers uh, making it so. And Ginko Bioworks is one of those. And Jess. You are pretty well positioned to tell us a bit what you have learned and what we should learn from uh, from the company and from you. Jess, the floor is yours for ten minutes, and after that, you know, you and I will will engage. Actually, you have five minutes, I believe. So, uh, all right, thank you, Gerard. And I, I think you've set me up very well for this talk in talking about the the benefits having a, a flexible approach, a flexible platform. Uh, and thanks as well to to Linda and as well as Ignacio. I certainly enjoy always hearing about. Uh, our, our fellow Boston area uh, brethren over at, at Flagship. So uh, I'm coming to you today from, from Ginkgo Bioworks here in, in the Boston area. Uh, we are the organism company and we are at the forefront of cellular engineering and synthetic biology. And it's perhaps appropriate to, to reinforce what is the Ginkgo mission, because this really pervades everything we do technologically and commercially. Um, and I, I should back up and say that I am a scientist, scientist but now on the, the commercial side of, of Ginkgo Bioworks, where our mission is, is to make biology easier to engineer. We are not a product company. Uh, we instead function to help our partners more quickly resolve their biggest cellular engineering challenges and get their product ideas to market all the way from R&D to, to commercial scale manufacturing. Um, Ginkgo grew out of MIT. It was founded uh, with five scientists from MIT uh, starting in 2008. Uh, and it was really built on the premise that, that we can now program cells like we program computers. Uh, and that's really it in a nutshell. And this is, this is Tom Knight here, one of the five founders of Ginkgo, and it was four of his biological engineering PhD students. And it was really the decreasing costs in DNA synthesis and sequencing combined with the decreasing costs in, in computing power that led to the, the inception of Ginkgo Bioworks. And, and Tom was uniquely positioned in this regard in that you see him on the left, uh, back when he was a, a graduate student at MIT, he went on to become a professor, uh, creating one of the world's first microcomputers. Uh, and then he brought that same engineering mindset to the early days of, of Ginkgo Bioworks. So as I said, we're located here in Boston. We're approximately 650 people, uh, about half as many, again, uh, pieces of automation or, or robots with a consolidated cellular engineering platform largely under one roof. But lately, we've outgrown this roof quite a bit, uh, and we've also expanded out to the Bay Area and to the Netherlands. We've been a privately held company uh, up until about a month ago, and now we're finally listed on the New York Stock Exchange uh, under the ticker symbol DNA, which was uh, obviously my, my kids are excited that they could get to go to college now. Um, so so Ginkgo is a horizontal technology platform really built on three layers. There's the program layer at the top, which includes the program teams, the PhD scientists, the management that performs the technical execution for each of our collaborations with a designated commercial partner. There's the middle or the platform layer, which includes our proprietary software and automation, which serves to aggregate or organize the third layer, which is really off the shelf technology. You can see some of our technology providers on the bottom, where we tie it together and in an automation driven way, allow it to be much more functional for delivering on cell engineering. So uh, our work is cell programming. So like I said, we program cells uh, by programming their DNA, just like software engineers uh, code computer programs. And in developing a new project for a customer on our platform, 
we determine their specs, design the program, and, and execute that program using our two differentiating assets. One is our physical foundry, which is the hardware, the software, the automation that lets us achieve positive economies of scale on, on the actual manipulations of cellular engineering. And the other pillar of Ginkgo is that all of this work that we do leverages our, our code base, which is again, borrowing an analogy from the software programming world. Code base is all of the reusable genetic parts, data and know-how that we've built up across our previous 50 or 60 commercial collaborations. If you're a computer programmer writing a new code, you don't start from a blank page, you take the appropriate parts from code you've written before and only add on what you need to to develop a new product. And the output of all of this work is, is a cell program for our customers so that they can make and commercialize their products. Ginkgo has a kind of a consolidated footprint where this is not uh, unfamiliar to the, the engineers here, where we have design, build, and test all under one roof for, for close iteration cycles. But because we're dealing with engineered cells, we also have in-house fermentation at the end, which is how our programs get scaled up and commercialized. Um, we're a, a horizontal technology platform company. Uh, we work across many different industries, uh, flavors, fragrances, industrial chemicals, bioagriculture, food and nutrition increasingly, and, and finally now pharma and, and biotech as well. And I'm just going to spend you know, brief vignettes on a few of these. Uh, we're working with a Cambridge area biotech company, uh, Synlogic, for living medicines or engineered probiotics that deliver metabolic payloads to patients with metabolic deficiencies. We're working with Canadian cannabis company, the Kronos Group, who no longer wants to grow cannabis under LED lights in Ontario. Why grow the biomass when all you want is the active molecule, which we're now making through engineered yeast cells? Uh, Bayer Crop Sciences. This is one of our first forays into bioagriculture, with Bayer going after the moonshot idea of what if corn could fix nitrogen at its roots with colonizing microbes uh, instead of just leaving that fund to soybeans. Uh, and, and this opportunity would displace the, the, the global nitrogen fertilizer market. And now finally touching on some of the recent problems that Ignacio has highlighted, uh, we've recently spun off a company called Alonia, which uses using engineered cells and enzymes for, for environmental remediation for contaminated water and soils. Uh, and, and, and the last one would be entering into the, the non-animal food space, uh, where we're using our engineered cells to make all of the proteins and other molecules that you could get from animals, but now you, instead you get them from engineered microbes as well uh, to create the next generation of plant-based foods. So interestingly, and I'll, I'll end here, you know, in, in, in 2019, the economists predicted that biology was going to be the most important manufacturing technology of the 21st century. Uh, and then one year later, biology shut down the globe. Um, but, but Ginkgo pivoted, right? And, and why were we able to, to pivot so quickly? We did this because we're, a, we're not a pandemic preparedness company, but we're a bioeconomy company with a flexible platform. It's just as easy for us to help Moderna optimize their production processes to increase the production of a critical vaccine component as it is to make a new flavor and fragrance ingredient. Uh, and the way that we can make proteins can just as easily be applied to making say new antibodies with our partner, partner Toshient. And so with the flexibility of this platform, we're industry agnostic and it's really just leveraging our scale economics and cellular engineering applying it to different partner problems that they select, that they tell us are the most important problems to help them solve. And I've gone past my, my five minutes, so I'll, I'll end there. Um, uh, and thank you and happy to take any questions. Hey, Jess, yes, uh, we will have 10 minutes for questions. And again, we hope that you participate to the last 30 minutes. And first, thank you. Uh, it looks like Happy Friday to me, right? You are bringing to the body of evidence that the U.S. chemical enterprise should be able to disrupt itself. And really, this is a telling example. Also, congratulations for uh, managing to become a public company just one month before engaging the board. I'm sure <laughs> you were trying to do so just before showing it to us. So this is really, really uh, important. Um, could you elaborate on uh, data and digital? It is very clear, obviously, that biology 
is a core competency of Jinko BioWorks. But could you comment on the data science, artificial intelligence, and modeling and simulation? Is it the competencies that you have embedded in your biologist, or is it something that you were very uh, intentional in the early days of Jinko BioWorks? I would say it's very intentional, but it's certainly grown over the year and has, has more outsized importance now than it did 10 years ago. And that's largely driven by the, the decrease in cost and computing power, certainly. Uh, I think we've all seen some of the, the recent uh, 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 work out of DeepMind, where they're now able to make uh, de novo protein predictions uh, you, with, with abundant computational power. Uh, so certainly something that we're leveraging. But while Ginkgo is a biology company, we're certainly a data company first and foremost. And, and really one of the benefits of having this horizontal data-driven platform is that, that every new program we execute, every new commercial collaboration feeds data back into the platform that makes us that much better positioned to execute on the next program. So what we learn on a, a collaboration with Ajinomoto uh, creates Ginkgo's data uh, architecture that creates certain economies of scale, our ability to predict certain cellular programming outcomes that makes us that much better positioned to, to execute on our, next, on our next project. So it's really the ability to generate cost effectively vast quantities of data and interpret that data to inform the next iteration on experimental design that's really led to the explosive growth of Ginkgo. Thank you, Jeff. Could you share with the group, and I, I put you a bit on the spot, and uh, if you think about the past 10 years, like 2008 was the beginning of uh, Ginkgo, and uh, now we are almost 20 years later, and you guys are, are thriving, I would say 15 years later. Is there any, when you think about the support or the headwinds from the chemical enterprise around you, by the chemical enterprise, we can mean the regulatory agencies, we can mean, you know, the incumbent of the industry or the universities. What was the most helpful uh, help, the best help you got from this enterprise, or maybe the setbacks? A any comments on this one? Yeah, I would say certainly the biggest support that Ginkgo had, especially in the early years, was U.S. governmental funding. You know, Ginkgo took no, uh, uh, pardon to, to flagship and other venture capitalists, but we took no venture capital money for, I think, approximately the first five or six years for the technology to really prove its capabilities uh, before we settled on an eventual technological level of preparedness and commercial model before we started that explosive growth phase. So it was really government support for those first few years that enabled Ginkgo to, to grow at the appropriate pace, to, to incubate Ginkgo. I think currently uh, we are certainly engaged in a number of different commercial partnerships with the chemical enterprise, where we are looking to now more sustainably produce uh, a number of the, the environmentally degrading products or replace certain processes. Um, I think as we look to, to combating global climate change, uh, people really need to look to the chemical enterprise as an ally rather than a foe. They are going to be the solution. They are not going to be part of the problem anymore. They are the ones who have vast experience in deploying capital to, to build new facilities, to fund new lines of work. Um, and, and they're really already at the forefront of using technologies such as Ginkgo's to more environmentally responsibly solve some of their challenges. So I think the, 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 the close partnership with the chemical enterprise uh, is going to be essential for tackling some of these global, global problems. And as you discuss with the chemical enterprise, like the question of infrastructure, uh, it's very easy to say the chemical industry is, uh, you know, used to invest in capitals, but I think the situation will be there is existing capitals that may not be usable and we need to move to the new era, which is based on synthetic biology. So any insight about how can the U.S. enterprise, including government, could help on setting the infrastructure that can really take advantage of the technologies of the one you develop and scale it up? Because it's yeah, one thing to do specialty chemicals, to do all the surfactants, polymers, resins, that's a lot of million tons, uh, Jess. So any observation about what, what, what help could look like for moving from where you are into scaling up synthetic biology to solve the sustainability issues we have? Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Gerard. I think right now, globally, there's, there's 61 million liters of, of fermentation capacity to make products, setting aside uh, bioethanol. 
the, the global demand is already outpacing that. And as we've seen during the, the supply shocks of the COVID pandemic and the desire to, to reshore production of say certain critical antibiotics, there simply isn't going to be enough fermentation capacity in the world to allow this cost-effective shift over to fermentation-based production. So having uh, support from not only the chemical industry, but from the, say, the US security interests for building out a domestic fermentation supply chain uh, is going to be critical for allowing scaled yeah. production of many of these, these critical components, not just antibiotics or vaccines, but as we look to replace certain chemistries that are uh, derived from petro, uh, petrochemical sources currently, there's going to need, be the need for a significant support to allow the commercial scale up of those products. Thank you, Jess. Uh, I do not see any raised hands, uh, Linda. There's a new you see? Uh, a new has his hand up. Sorry, Gerard. Hi, a new. Sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> do I still have a couple of minutes? You do. Okay. Thank you. Hey, great presentation. Uh, both of you, actually. So I'm going to uh, ask a question. So you, you know, so you are building a lot of databases, but that are, they are proprietary, right? So now on the say other side, you have lots of university professors, right, and others who are also building databases which are public. What? How do you see? And now you can access them, but they can't, or their databases. So you can build on, you know, the the failures, right? This is what I'm talking about. Most of the synthetic biology. You know, designs fail, and and uh, and how do we learn from that as a society uh, to address you know lots of problems we have? You have any thoughts on how you can feed into you know the larger uh, research ecosystem that can yeah, benefit it's... from some of your data if you are willing to share? So it, that's a great question. The mistakes. It's a great question that we normally think of in an international context, but we should also apply to a, a domestic context as well. So Ginkgo certainly benefits quite considerably from the publicly available and publicly funded genomic databases. Uh, when we go to design a new organism, we, we dig deeply and using proprietary algorithms into those you know, deposited genetic sequences. So we look for inspiration for our, our cell programming designs. When we work with, with international partners uh, where we might be accessing, say, agricultural samples found in a foreign country, we need to be very compliant with the relevant UN uh, treaties and agreements like the Nagoya Protocol on, on maintaining the integrity of biodiversity uh, ownership. And so we are very actively working, say, with the UN, again, more on an international basis, to, to provide that information that we that that knowledge we glean from other people's databases back to the country of origin, so they're benefiting as well. You know, it's a challenge, of course, working with with commercial partners who are looking to protect their patent positions on the underlying genetic parts. But we do have very robust relationships with a number of U.S. governmental agencies, uh, not only in cell programming, but also in biosecurity and biosurveillance to, to make that information flowing backwards as well. But, but it is challenging, I will admit, uh, but it is something that we very much want to, to participate in because Ginkgo has really benefited from uh, all of the public financing in this, in this area, and, and we are actively looking for ways to give back as well. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, and you great question. And let's continue to uh, for the audience to prepare, you know, the engagement in the last 30 minutes. We'd like to turn now to Tony. Uh, we have heard two great vantage points, and we have started to hear how important has been the collaboration, and the collaboration did not start with Ginkgo and uh, pio flagship pioneering just two years ago. It started far away. So I think it's very timely, Tony, that with your vantage point, you tell us how this collaboration can be made put to the next level to help the chemical enterprise in the US to disrupt itself, which we need to do. Tony, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. And if my colleagues need help getting the slides, I can do it myself if you can't put it in the slideshow. I'm okay. Is well, it not um, in slideshow? Um, it doesn't appear to be, but let um, me just let me just keep going here. So uh, I just want to thank Gerard and, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with you all today. Uh, I'm going to give just a quick overview of this uh, organization, the UIDP that I represent and that P&G and many of you on the phone are in organizations that are members of our group. And then I uh, look forward to a robust question and answer and dialogue that we'll have at the end. So if we can just go through these slides, I'm going to try to get through these fairly quickly. 
Um, so, yes, next slide, please. Yeah, so we are an organization that actually started as an activity of the National Academies in 2006. We were set up because a bunch of companies and universities and government agencies like the National Science Foundation thought that uh, much needed to be done from a process perspective in terms of advancing university industry partnerships. Uh, there was a lot of concern around contracting and we were tasked with trying to look at that and, and really address some of the challenges. And so uh, we stood up, like I said, in 2006, we've expanded our portfolio, which I'll tell you about in a, little, in a few minutes. Uh, we actually left the National Academies in 2015. We're a 501c3 organization now. And at that time, we also invited non-US universities, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Next slide. Okay, so as an organization, we really have a singular focus, and that's on strengthening university industry partnerships. Um, we have a, a great membership of large multinational companies and large research universities from throughout the world. And we look at common problems, and so, you know, the problems that we look at are not technical problems, they're business improvement problems. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but as was alluded to earlier, I think Jen talked about contracting and intellectual property issues. There are a myriad of issues uh, that add weight to uh, collaborations between the two sectors. And we try to find ways to optimize the process to make the ROI better between companies and universities. We crowdsource our solutions by working together with really smart people like Gerard and others uh, to, to address these challenges. And then ultimately we want these collaborations to provide societal benefit. And, and there's a lot of things that we can do to, to do that. Uh, companies can improve profits. Hopefully universities can improve their standing, produce more research results, prepare for better students. But at the end of the game, we have to have a societal benefit to what we're doing. Next slide. Okay, so we have a long history of working in the triple helix space. Uh, as I mentioned, NSF helped get us started. And um, I think, you know, Dave Berkowitz is on the call from the chemistry division at NSF. Uh, you, all you have to do is read what's going on in the, in the press uh, and in the trade journals, but there's a tremendous amount of interest right now around how we take use inspired research and translate it to products, services, those could be materials, that could be algorithms, whatever, but um, just this translational aspect. Next slide. Okay, so just a couple of things about our group. I'll tell you, talk very briefly about our membership, our projects and our events. Can I have the next slide? So as I mentioned, we have top tier companies and world-class universities. Can you go to the next slide, please? And here's just an, an illustrative list. Uh, and so for example, I know Shirley's from UCSD, they're not on this list, and I apologize for that, but they're certainly a great member of our group. Uh, I made sure the P&G was on here because of Gerard, but this is just an illustrative list. We have about 175 members from throughout the world, and uh, the neat part about our group, and I think what makes our group unique, is we have company representation from totally different sectors. So, you know, Gerard's colleagues and Gerard can interact with people from Facebook or Apple or Boeing or other consumer product companies, chemical companies uh, in a non-antitrust uh, environment. So that's, I think, a real asset of our group. Next slide, please. So, uh, like I said, we're a sharing group. We do a lot of crowdsourcing on solutions and um, that's how people gain benefit. And, you know, uh, we have a, uh, we tackle challenges, people have issues and, um, I'll just give a one illustration and I don't really have time to go into great depth, but when the COVID crisis hit back in March of 2020, uh, companies were trying to decide what to do with their internships. And I got a phone call frantic from one of our industry member representatives. He was going into a meeting the next day and they were trying to decide whether or not to keep the internship program or cancel it. And we sent out a query to our industry members and asked, what are you guys doing? We got a response back. 80% of the companies were keeping them and of those 85% were keeping them remote. And we shared that with uh, that company and they decided to keep their internship program. So that's the kind of stuff that we do to help people with their day jobs. Next slide. Okay, we do projects as I mentioned. You can go to the next slide, please. Our projects fall into these various buckets. Um, they don't, you know, there's nothing magical about these but these are the ones that we use. 
contracting and compliance, partnership management, government engagement, and then workforce development and student engagement. So talent basically on the last one. Next slide. Okay, so at the end of the day, um, we produce tools and resources to help our members on a greater ROI. Next slide. So here's just an example. This is a, a, a resource that we put together to help faculty members and industry researchers understand better what it's like to work at the university industry interface. This project was funded by the National Science Foundation and DITRA at the Department of Defense. This is publicly available. Uh, we've literally had hundreds of thousands of downloads of this PDF and it's a great resource. So, you know, if you have an assistant professor who's at Emory or at uh, Pittsburgh and they were approached by a company and they don't know anything about working with industry, this is a great starting point for them. And so this is an example of the kind of practical stuff that we do. Next slide. We will on occasion do technology specific projects when they're around university industry partnerships. This is a report that we did after a workshop in 2018 on quantum uh, quantum research opportunities for areas of collaboration. We look not just at computing, but quantum sensing, um, quantum communications. Uh, we had as many companies represented in that room as there were universities. And this report actually has been cited many times and has actually now led to some new funding for university industry collaborations through a program called IUCRC. Next slide. Okay, we do lots of conferences and I'm, I don't really have a lot of time to go into detail on this, but um, there's lots of information on our website. You can go to the next slide. Um, I did wanna mention uh, something we're doing now, which should be of interest to this group. Uh, we are leading a series of workshops around the bioeconomy. We've done uh, three to date and we are gonna do two or three more. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about this, just email me at tony at uidp.net. Uh, this is an effort that was uh, really looking at translational opportunities to take youth inspired research to uh, agile translation to products and services. And we've done uh, three to date. We've done one on uh, feeding the planet. We've done one on circular economy and we just did one on climate change. All right, next slide. All right. so. Uh, events are great because they allow us to do corporate team building exercises and people get to know each other. And we think that leads to stronger trust and relationships. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I'm starting to travel. In fact, I'm in a hotel room right now in Salt Lake City at a conference. And um, people are yearning to get back together because one of the things we've lost is this interconnectivity that we have with people. Zoom is great, but to be honest with you, I'd much rather be uh, at Constitution Avenue with you all sitting in a room and having Gerard buy me dinner tonight. Um, it would be a much more enjoyable, much more productive use of our time. Next slide. All right, just quickly, I just want to mention, we were recently asked to lead something called IRVA, which is the Engineering Research Visioning Alliance, uh, which is an opportunity to look at future research directions for where investments uh, from the private public sector uh, could lead to substantial benefit. And this is an opportunity, this is a program that we just launched six months ago. There's a lot more information um, at irvacommunity.org. That email is actually wrong. It's irvacommunity.org, or you can just email me or just Google Irva. Okay, I think that's the last of my slides. And I think I got through in about eight minutes. So I apologize for running a little bit over my five minutes, but I'll be pleased to answer, answer any question about UIDP. But I know the heart of what we're gonna do is this dialogue uh, with some Q&A going back and forth. So I'll be pleased to answer any questions right now. And I, once again, want to thank the uh, the academies for inviting me to be part of this, uh, this important discussion. Thank you, Tony. And the way we are going to proceed, I would like to ask you a, a question and then we will transition to um, the four of us, sure. Ignacio, Jess, and you and me uh, to, uh, answer and facilitate the question that hopefully the audience will have. One question, Tony, first, you know, congratulations and thanks for the progress made in the U.S. since, uh, you know, the NSF and uh, the NAS created UIDP to bring at least the industry and some of the industries, my side of the industry, not to be oil and water, but to become more co-creation and yet a lot to do. I think, you know, I shared many times with uh, Tony for the sake of the audience to say from our company, 
it has been easy to work with universities in Europe because the collaboration and the facilitation was there. Uh, the beauty in the US, astounding competitive advantage on sciences, but sometimes the value creation and the business model is opposite. And I think, Tony, you know, with UISD, USID, I see a lot of progress. With your vantage point, is there one thing that you wish we do more or we start to do to really realize your aspiration to the next level? So things are working, but you know, what are the one or two things that you will really like this enterprise to be a bit more committed to to continue progress? Yeah. So so thank you. That's a that's a great question, and you know, I think there's going to be a theme and a thread that we talk about throughout all of this. But you know, if there was one one thing that I could do to change the the paradigm a little bit in, in the U.S., but even, even outside the U.S., that is that the leadership of organizations clearly articulate the importance of collaborations between the sectors, not just universities and, and companies, but government as well, and, and increasingly nonprofits, because then the people that are in the trenches, the transactors, you know, the people that are managing intellectual property management, the people yeah. that are doing contract negotiation, the, you know, the associate chair of a department who's asked about letting a student do an industry internship, they'll feel empowered to, to be able to do that. So I don't think from a leadership perspective, we do a good enough job communicating the importance of collaborations to solve big problems. And I know we're going to get into you know, some of those examples downstream, but if you ask most people that work at a university in the transactional, in, in an office, an administrative office, or even a faculty member and said, what is the university's vision for solving societal problems? They're, they're not going to have much yeah. of, a, of a response. And even within companies, I think, it's, I think companies do a little bit better job, but I, I don't necessarily think that it's um, as well communicated as it could be. And so, you know, the ability to effectively communicate that so that everybody's kind of rowing in the same direction, I think is extremely important. And so, you know, there are some examples of, of I think, universities in the U.S. where they clearly articulate their approaches to external engagement, to commercialization, to innovation. They have that kind of in their DNA. But at a lot of campuses, it's not that way. And so I think if you really want to have change that will matter, I think leadership needs to clearly articulate that importance. And I don't think we do a good enough job doing that. Very good, Tony. So if I take it, the leaders, and we have a lot of leaders of the different constituents mm -hmm. here today. Right. Okay, we have a job to do. Uh, the yep. materials seems to be there. Uh, and I want to invite Linda to have the four of us on screen so as oh, we can um, take questions. Yep. Yes, I think that Shelly has a question. And then Jen is after Shelly. Yes, yeah, so, so you brought up that it's not just university um, and industry, and you brought up government, but, but this, uh, today it's been mostly kind of talking about the government, but not really um, the national labs. Um, so, so where do you see the role of the national labs um, in, um, in, in this disruption? So I assume you're at a national lab, correct? No, I'm not. No? Okay, I'm great. All right. Utah. I'm just up the hill from where you are right now. Okay, great. So um, let's talk about national labs. So first of all, I think it's important to say that all national labs are not the same, just like all companies aren't the same. You know, they have different missions, right? Some are national security labs, some are department, you know, office of science, some are defense, some, you know. So I think we need to be a little careful about saying national labs. I think if we look at the innovation ecosystem as a mosaic, the national labs have a really important role to play. You know, uh, I think ideally national labs would play a a better role of overcoming kind of the translational aspects. Um, you know, they have tremendous resources, facilities. Uh, there's some unique, you know, uh, aspects of things that they have that companies shouldn't invest in, universities can invest in, right? So, you know, you think about synchrotrons and the ability to do molecular structures, you know, right? I mean, the national labs are perfect for that. There is, and by the way, everything I'm saying are, are my personal opinions, okay? So I, I'm gonna start by saying that, but, uh, you know, I think on the national lab front, there is um, a disconnect. Every company that I know of at the UIDP 
even outside the UIDP and every university wants to do more with national labs. The national labs will say that they are open and ready for business. And yet to work with them is incredibly difficult. And so, you know, they'll say, oh, we wanna work with you. Oh, by the way, though, you have to do it through our mechanisms and through this approach. And we have this one narrow lane. And if you don't do it this way, then we're not gonna do it with you. And I think until there's a financial uh, incentive for the labs to work collaboratively outside the gates, it's not gonna happen. So, you know, based on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, and I think you can take it various points. If you're a pessimist, you would say that actually working externally is more work for them because they have to do things. You know, if they're, if my salary is covered and I have access to this equipment and I have to work with Shelly, well, actually that's a little bit more work for me, right? Whereas like if I just do my own experiments, so that's kind of a pessimistic view and I don't, I don't want to be a pessimist. I'm not naturally a pessimist, but I think we need to incentivize the people within labs and the leadership to say, okay, you're going to do more with companies and universities to solve these big problems. And I think some labs do it better than others, to be honest with you. So I think they're part of the solution. I think they could be a bigger piece. I think everybody would like them to be a Fraunhofer, you know, kind of model, and they're not, but they could take on some qualities and aspects of the Fraunhofer. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I realize we have 15 minutes. Jen has a question. I uh, realize that Ignacio, Jeff, and Tony are all together, so feel free to engage and ask questions that can be relevant for the three of them, or Ignacio or Jess. Uh, Jen, you have a question, I think your, your hand Thanks. is right. Yeah, and mine might be a broad one as well. So I appreciate, Tony, that you brought up um, uh, internships, because I think there's obviously a huge space for collaboration on the research itself, but also uh, a huge um, untapped space for collaboration on workforce development. And I was especially thinking about this as Jess talked about platform technologies that um, you know, I think the engineers are much better at training students to think that, you know, it's really a mindset of how you think about solving research problems. And I see that on the engineering side, but I think in the sciences, you know, it's in some places, like I try to run my lab that way. I call it mercenary. One of my friends calls it om omnivorous. So I'm, I'm using that now. Um, but how you, do you see space, you know, all of you for, um, for partnerships in, in thinking about how we innovate in uh, in education, because we're, you know, the mindset that we're instilling in our science students and our chemistry students is going to be the mindset of the researchers that you then get when they come out of academia and are, are entering industry spaces. And, and what do you think are, are the kind of biggest levers or, or, or the areas where, where the biggest impact can be have, had there? Yeah, so there's a lot there. I'm gonna just make one comment and then I'll let Jess and Ignacio talk because they're actually, you know, they're out in the trenches. Huh? You know, um, I, I think in the abstract, everybody thinks it's a good idea for students to have more engagement with companies. Faculty members think about it as being a good thing. But when you get to specifics and I'll use industry PhD internships as a specific example. In the abstract, that sounds great. But if I'm your grad student and I'm in my third year and Jess wants me to come work at Ginkgo Bioworks for six months and do a chapter on my PhD. You're gonna go, well, wait a second, Tony, you, I, I train you now for th three years, you're just getting productive. <laughs> and now you're gonna go work at Ginkgo Bioworks? How's that gonna work for me? What, what do I get out of it? Now, I can make a good argument at that in the long term, it is gonna benefit you because then if Jess likes me, I'm smart, I do good things, he'll hire me and then Five years later, hopefully I'll be a lab lead. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to support Jen's lab because Jen does great work, right? Because I graduated from Jen's lab. But it's very hard. So if you did a poll of your year of Emory, correct? If you did a poll of the chemistry department faculty members and said, how many of you are okay with your third or fourth year PhD students spending six months at a company doing an internship? They'd be like, mm, not, not too enthused about that. So I think those are the kinds of things that we have to talk about. I'll, I'll jump in next, perhaps. And, um, so uh, I'd say that where we see ourselves working with universities is very complementary, but a bit more of a clean handoff. So we, we don't have an internship program per se where, where PhD students come and spend part of their thesis work with us. But, but you know, a lot of the, the cutting edge of, of cellular engineering, metabolic engineering is clearly happening in universities. And they're the ones who show the proof of concept, you know, elucidation of a biosynthetic pathway for important therapeutic molecule. Um, and so, you know, a very 
very significant portion of the PhD researchers here at Ginkgo are, are straight out of their PhDs or straight out of postdoctoral work because they come in with that cutting edge academic viewpoint. We then find that we almost have to give them a supplemental education in the different ways that you can do that kind of science at Ginkgo. You know, a scientist coming from a, a, their PhD work they're going to, to discover a new enzyme. They, they might, you know, after their literature research, try 20 variations, and that's what they can do with their budget and their, their equipment. At, at Ginkgo, we need to almost re-educate them and say, you know, don't think 20, think 1,000. You know, that's, that's the kind of resources or brute force approach that, that is necessary for commercialization. But, but the combination of that uh, top-tier thinking, given all of the tools that we have with our automation and resources, uh, you know, Ginkgo is built by and run by scientists. And, uh, you know, send your scientists to us. We, we promise to give them a good home and uh, we'll do great things with some of the work that they might have started in universities. I'll just be to, to finish on my end, I will say two things. One, Anthony, if someone tells you that he or she want to go to Ginkgo, say, no, 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 go to flagship. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no, seriously, we have a, we at flagship, uh, have actually a fellows program that we do every summer. And then where we bring between 25 and 30 PhD candidates, they are finishing, they are thinking about what to do with their lives next. And they spend three months with us. Um, and we kind of go through the process that I explained earlier. Uh, they do explorations, then uh, they spend, they have, there are three cycles and they work in different teams in different areas. And we kind of try to um, teach them the flux in methodology and, and it's, I mean, the, the reviews that we are getting, we end up hiring most of them at some point when they finish, maybe they have to come back and spend another year and they, we hire them and it's been super, super successful in, in because when they come back, at least they know us and we may hire them for flagship or, or the, for the companies that we, we are growing and developing. But I think it's at least from our perspective, these, these are, I mean, depends on the individual and what I want, what they want to do next. And, and some of them have clear mindset of going to the industry or going to a big company like Ginkgo or going to a startup company at a much earlier stage. Uh, yes, that's great. Uh, I see that Jody and uh, David have uh, their hand raised. I will just, my takeaway is, Tony, you call for action the leaders. The leaders can remove barriers and talk together, university, national labs, and uh, industry in order to remove the barriers and create momentum. I like what Jess is saying. Let's the company be led by scientists. Just I will I will make note of that uh, for for big industry. Uh, Jody, uh, you raise your hand, and then uh, David from the NSA. Yes, I, I wanted to follow up on the discussion of um, uh, graduate internships. Um, graduate internships are growing more and more in the chemical engineering discipline, not so much as um, I see in the chemistry discipline. Um, and my, my group has a very strong tradition of graduate students doing internships right in the middle of their thesis. So I have three students right now at um, Dow, Lamb, and Tesla, and then they've also interned at like Ascend and other Palmer type places. Um, there's a lot of myths about graduate student internships um, one is that the students, um, it will take them longer to graduate. That is not true. They come back totally trained, more efficient with their time. They're, they don't graduate any, any later than they would have already. They're just more professional. Um, and it's such a great experience um, for these students because it is essential to workforce development. Um, the company gets a look at the student, the student gets a look at the company, almost always they're offered a job um, as soon as they graduate. Uh, and it can be in a completely different related field. It doesn't have to be what they trained in my lab in. So it gives them that extra edge or angle to pivot right out of graduate school. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think, I think it's a fantastic thing and we need to be doing more of it. Um, I think there, I've seen two barriers. One is faculty, think their students are not gonna graduate on time. The students are gonna walk away from the PhD or their project, that's never the case. Then there's another um, myth on the other side. Um, to be honest, a lot, of, a lot of our students here are international. Um, many companies do not wanna take international students for internships. 
Um, but most universities have the mechanism to do this where there's they register for the internship as a class and there's no um, there's no visa problems. And so once you realize that you could take any graduate student um, as an internship, whether they're domestic or international, it's really helpful for the international students because they get that first toehold into um, American industry and then we can retain them in the workforce. Um, thanks, for, thanks for sharing, Jody. I, I want to make space. We have a few minutes. I know. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and, and I'd like David and then Karen. Uh, David, you had your, thank you, Jody. Hi, David. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you, Gerard. Good afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much for hosting this session and thanks to all the speakers. This was really great. Uh, and I really um, uh, identify with the comments that uh, Tony just made uh, in this little conversation about how do we better interface the student training experience with, with industry? Uh, what Tony said, we experience a lot in, in chemistry. We actually, as you probably know, have a mechanism called intern at NSF, which allows a PI to get a supplement to send that student to industry. And it's, it's highly underused. It's quite, you know, and, and the NSF would pay for that internship. And the reason I think is, is very much what, what Tony gave uh, and at least in chemistry, uh, it's, there's a, it's a labor intensive enterprise and people really want to make sure their students are, are on the right scientific uh, path to both their graduation and to moving the project forward for the entire team. So I think, you know, making partnerships that are in the interest of both the, uh, the academic lab and the industry is great. And among those mechanisms, we have Goalie where there's a problem that the uh, academic lab is working on that the industry really cares about. And it's highly undersubscribed. And that really, you know, that can bring things more into the PI's wheelhouse. So I, if we can get somehow get more, drum up more interest in the community for that mechanism, that would be helpful. Also the mechanism that Tony mentioned, uh, the industry university uh, uh, collaborative research centers, again, undersubscribed. And that's a, where, a, a mechanism for industry to really have skin in the game. Uh, so I'm I am open to ideas on how to sort of uh, light a fire under the community on both sides of the equation for these mechanisms, or talk about other mechanisms. And just one plug for new mechanisms would be things like institutes, such as the AI institutes at NSF, where industry can come in pre-competitively and offer up funds for a theme that they're interested in. We at the National Science Foundation are, are would welcome discussions with you on areas of interest as we think, especially if this new TIP directorate comes our way of which Congress is debating right now, that translation, innovation and partnership directorate, that should open up more of these types of opportunities. So just a few thoughts. Um, we're very interested in this space. Thanks David for the call for action. We take notes, the materials are here up to us to, uh, to, uh, to engage. Um, so thank you, David. Karen. Hi, I had to miss a little bit of, of today's session, um, but one aspect I was wondering about in the part that I attended was it's great on all this innovation happening at these startup companies and these companies that are growing public. What about the big companies that are already there? I mean, we've lost things like DuPont Central Research. Are these big companies that out of the innovation game? I, I don't know, maybe Scott can can also comment on this, but but I wonder is are we saying that innovation is in the hands of these smaller startup companies and these? No, 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 no. Scott, do you? <laughs> it's a great question. It's a great question because I think it's a challenge to the incumbents, right? And the incumbents have to play a role. So I really like what Karen is saying, like what Tony was saying. The leaders need to be there. Scott, can I pick on you on maybe you know a, a hint about this small and medium company, maybe the panelists, right? Uh, is there a role for the big companies to be able to leverage the disruption? Do you see hope or do you think they are a barrier? Uh, maybe I should start with Jess and, uh, and Tony and then Scott, you can chime in or our colleague from, uh, from Merck can also chime in. Any observation, Jess and uh, Ignacio? I, I would say our experience is mixed. You know, as certainly as Ginkgo moves more and more into the human therapeutic space and working with pharma and biotech, there is more of the trend on on outsourcing innovation uh, down into biotechs, where you know you can uh, acquire a pipeline product. Um, I'd say over on the the kind of in, industrial and specialty chemicals area, there are certainly industries that have adopted 
uh, biological engineering or biological production processes very early on. Um, and I would say, you know, there was certainly an initial wave of that self-disruption coming from large companies, but in uh, more and more, it is coming from the startups uh, and, and the startups then being uh, acquired or growing up into the big companies. I, you know, it, I would say other industries are starting in our experience to follow more of the pharma model. So I, I don't know that I have much. Yep. I, I don't know that I have much to add. I, I would say that one one thing that I have seen some experiments with are companies like EMD, which support accelerators or incubators like Evo Nexus, which is a a program right where they they bring in companies and you know that are startups to look at the technologies that are emanating from universities or national labs or whatever as kind of a you know it's. It's very common in the biotech space. It's been less common in the chemical space. Um, look, I think they're all pieces of the mosaic. I think there's a role for large companies, small companies, mid-sized companies, universities, national labs. No, I, we haven't even really talked about the incredible amount of capital that's in the, in the private foundation space to tackle these big societal problems that exist now. So, you know, I think there's a lot of roles for everybody. There's a seat for everybody in the room. Um, but I'll defer to my larger multinational colleagues to weigh in on, on the specific question. So Scott, I'll leave it for you to, or Ignacio to take that on, or Gerard. Oh, Anthony, uh, I actually think it's a continuum and I see it's a space for everybody. Uh, it's not a one size fits all. Con innovation is different in all kinds of different sectors. And uh, what I am seeing is that we're gonna have to do things differently and, and uh, more unique, more partnerships. So like the days of DuPont Central Research that invented amazing things, not super easy to do today in a publicly traded company. So what is easier to do is really fast moving partnerships. We absolutely have to do that type of thing. Well said, Scott. I have to be the bad boy. Scott, yep. you said it well. And I think Karen's question may be worth at the end of our two days to, yep. to reflect on that, okay? Because if the incumbent don't pay, we're not going, we don't have time like Ignacio is saying. So sorry to be the bad boy, it is 3 or 2 p.m. I really want, I don't know about the group, but I mean, an amazing moment of truth to have Ignacio, Jess, and Tony together at a moment where we have some opportunities, the NSF and the government is putting new systems in place up to us to uh, leverage them. And we have a mission in front of us. There are big problems where the chemical enterprise need to raise to the next level. So I leave it to Linda, Scott and Jennifer if they want to have the final world, uh, the final world, not the final world. Excuse my French, right? But thank you so much, Ignacio. Uh, Linda, thank you uh, for uh, getting Jess, Tony, and uh, Ignacio with us. I really appreciate what she has done for us. So thank you, Linda. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Anthony, Jess, and Ignacio for working with uh, me and Gerard in developing this session. Um, you guys have really brought a lot of good insight and perspective um, and got people excited. Um, I think uh, Liana has a few, um, I think, housekeeping. Um, sure, I'm happy to let Scott and Jennifer close out before I uh, touch on the housekeeping. Oh so, oh, so you want uh, Scott and Jen to go up first and then the housekeeping stuff? I, I didn't have any final comments, but I just wanted to remind everyone that we begin at 10 a.m. Eastern time, 7 a.m. for those in California. And uh, we have two great sessions uh, tomorrow and I look forward to uh, your attendance and participation. Thank you. So let me introduce myself. I'm Vijay Swarup, uh, our, uh, Vice President of Research and Development for ExxonMobil, and it's a real pleasure and honor to be here to talk about something that I have a lot of passion for, which is life cycle assessment. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was honored enough to be asked to join this committee, uh, the first discussion I had with the members was, how do we talk about life cycle assessment? And uh, one of the speakers today, Bob Armstrong, who's a dear friend of mine, one of the first discussions I had with him about five years ago was we've got to get our heads around life cycle assessment and we've got to make sure we have a systems and measurements tool to be able to understand what the impact of our various choices are towards decarbonization, towards lower CO2 footprint. So 
what is life cycle assessments and why does where we draw the box, why is that important? So life cycle assessments are a widely but inconsistently used tool to account for the carbon footprint of a product or a process from well to wheels from beginning to end. But even when we say carbon footprint of a product or process, the question begins, where do you begin and where do you end? And that's the where do we draw the box? And that is where a major source of variation uh, between applications of LCA comes. It comes from the choice of the boundary assessment. Is it cradle to gate? Is it cradle to grave? Is it just the, is it just the car? You'll hear people say zero emission vehicles, but where did the fuel that's burning, that's, that's being used by the zero emission vehicle come from? All of those questions need to be contemplated as we're thinking about how we understand the choices we're making in our, um, in our energy system. So consistent standards for drawing this box will contribute to a more accurate and effective accounting, and more importantly, an effective uh, system to do cross comparisons so that we can do system-wide comparisons. This session is gonna frame a discussion around an example of decision-making when performing an LCA and why it's important along product value chains or full energy pathways. And some of the things that the speakers are gonna talk about are what issues are what are the issues preventing LCAs from being useful being and being used across the chemist chemical industry? What resources are needed to facilitate use along product value chains or full energy pathways? What level of detail is needed for reasonable completeness versus ease of ease of use? And are there other industry-wide accounting standards that can be used as a guide for forming or for, for improving LCA practices? such as calories, for instance. We, every time you go to a store, you see what the calories are. So what would that, what's the equivalent for energy? Is it, is, it, is it CO2 per mile? What is it? So we'll get into that as we get into this discussion. I'm really excited to introduce the two speakers who will go in order. The first will be uh, Francis Fedezanin uh, from, uh, from uh, DuPont, but more importantly, he shares the same alma mater as I do. So he's a Purdue grad, oh. so go Boilers. Uh, Francis is a mechanical engineer from Purdue University with an MBA from Delaware. He has 29 years with DuPont, so he obviously was at Purdue a little while after me. Uh, <laughs> but 29 years with DuPont in a variety of technical and marketing roles. He is a real champion for sustainability. He's one of DuPont's life cycle engineers and works with DuPont's engineering polymers customers all around the world in the areas of LCA. He's a member of the ACLCA, the American Center for Life Cycle Assessment, the leading organization for life cycle assessments. He's going to share with us some details about the rising need for industry for LCA data. And then Bob will come up after him. Professor Robert Armstrong uh, directs the MIT Energy Initiative, an institute-wide effort at MIT linking science, technology, and policy to transform the world's energy systems. Bob's been a member of the MIT faculty since 1973. He served as the head of the Department of Chemical Engineering from 96 to 07, and his research is focused on pathways to a lower carbon energy future. How topical. Bob's been elected into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering. He received the Founders Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Field of Chemical Engineering, the Warner K. Lewis Award. Are you tired yet, Bob, or should I keep going? And the Professional Progress Award. Uh, all from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. He's also, he also received the 2006 Bingham Medal from the Society of Rheology. He is super accomplished. He's a great speaker and he's a really good friend of mine. So Bob, welcome is to you. And uh, Francis, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get great. us going. Thank you, uh, Vijay. Um, so Leanna, will you be projecting? That's Brenna. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, great. I see it. Um, thank you. So, um, yeah, first of all, thanks for uh, allowing me to speak uh, to this group this morning. Um, as uh, Vijay mentioned, I am a um, LCA consultant and practitioner within DuPont's mobility and materials business. So, you know, the day in the life of my work is to respond to our customers on carbon footprint requests and conduct LCA studies both internally and externally um, within uh, our business. So I'm here to talk about life cycle assessments or LCAs and how we at DuPont are using LCA data to serve our customers and meet the needs of our markets. I'll also share some trends, opportunities, and challenges we see when we engage our customers on life cycle assessments and provide this sort of carbon footprint information on our products. 
Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, let me just start out. Um, what you see on the screen is an excerpt from an LCA study conducted by Toyota. Uh, this LCA compares Toyota's Mirai fuel cell electric vehicle to a hybrid vehicle and a traditional gasoline car. The visuals on the right are, contrib are contribution graphs making comparative assertions of the vehicle life stages and material constructions to its carbon footprint or global warming potential. We, we refer to that as GWP. The comparison values are unitless and scaled to the gas vehicle set to a value of one. The two graphs at the top shows the different life cycle stages of the vehicle and how it contributes to its GWP. There are some insights that we can draw here. As the mobility industry is evolving in alternative propulsion systems, the use of the use phase or the driving phase of the car, which is shown in blue, is contributing less to the vehicle carbon footprint while the manufacturing and material construction is contributing more to the footprint of an electric vehicle. So how we manufacture the vehicle, choose the materials, design the subsystems and parts is becoming more significant when addressing the sustainability of a car. The graph at the bottom left shows material construction of the three types of vehicles and its contribution to the car's mass. Worth noting is that the electric vehicle construction includes carbon fiber and precious metals. Those unique materials have large GWP values and other, as well as other impact categories. If we look at the graph on the lower right, this shows the GWP contributions of the materials that make up the car. As you can see, the non-metallic materials used for the vehicle for use for vehicle light weighting make up a minority of the car mass, yet is a large portion of the car's carbon footprint. So vehicle manufacturers are seeing the importance of reducing carbon emissions in the production phases, even for the new technology, as complete, completely new materials and new processes may be added. Some can reduce vehicle weight with better efficiency in the driving phase, but the trade-off can also occur in many cases, lightweight materials needing additional production processes, which emit more gases compared to reduction emissions during the driving phase of the car. So as a car manufacturer, what would I be asking my material suppliers? Why are these lightweight materials, which can reduce tailpipe emissions, contributing more to the carbon footprint when I produce the car? From a life cycle perspective, how do I get my supplier base to lower CO2 emissions for these electric cars? If I were a materials manufacturing company such as DuPont, how do I further reduce the carbon footprint of my products down through my value chain? Next slide, please. Yeah, so VJ mentioned it or kind of gave an overview of LCAs. And, and again, for those that are not familiar, as mentioned, LCA is a method to quantify the environmental impacts of a product or process through its life cycle. All products and services have life cycle phases where the materials are consumed, energy is consumed, and where emissions and waste are created. So LCA measures these activities. The slide shows a conceptual view of what an LCA investigates and what it delivers. Much of my work is centered around global warming potential, which in essence is the carbon footprint of the product's life cycle. However, like the Toyota example, LCA is about making comparisons and trade-offs. So there are other environmental impacts that are assessed, as you see here, and compared so that users can make informative decisions and avoid burden shifting, such as investing in programs or products that may reduce the GWP or carbon footprint of the product, but may have an adverse effect on land occupation or human toxicity. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, LCA is a method to evaluate environmental impacts of a product. Its practices are governed by a set of ISO standards, which guides the user, but there are many approaches um, one can take in this analysis. It's, it's common that two LCA practitioners working on the same product or life cycle will, will have different GWP results because the assumptions and methods um, can be different. So it's critical to have a story behind the numbers. Often when we deal with customers, you know, we're very hesitant to just email them a carbon footprint number um, because it lends to a lot of interpretation. So we have to engage with our customers and explain what the meaning or the value is. We, we share our LCA data under confidentiality 
Um, so, so with that, we know our customers are making comparative assessments of our materials versus competition, but we want to make sure we take the time and explain the values and the story behind the values um, when we present the data to the customers. So this slide shows a high, high level schematic of a product system for an LCA. The arrows point to the different inputs and outputs, which are measured and modeled in each of the stages. It also incorporates reuse, recycle, and remanufacture loops if they are present. Um, the data collection takes place of these inputs and characterized and modeled with an LCA software package that contains environmental data on many of the materials and processes. From there, models can be run and compiled to generate the environmental impacts. It's a bit more complicated than that, but at a high level, in essence, that's what I've been doing a lot of lately. Um, we follow ISO guidelines, as Vijay mentioned. It increases credibility, provides a framework for the industry to follow. Uh, LCA is voluntary, voluntarily, vo voluntary. There, there's no legislation that requires companies conduct LCAs, but LCAs are proving, are proving their legitimacy over the past three decades. Um, worth noting is when companies want to make public or marketing claims with their products using LCA data, the study should go through a third party critical review uh, in accordance with the ISO standard. Next slide, please. So just um, some key points to make uh, just within my experience and reflections. You know, uh, it's, it's, holis it's a holistic, rigorous overview LCA on product interactions with the environment. Uh, it's governed by an ISO standards to avoid burden shifting it, intended for comparisons. Um, we use it to assess global warming potential or carbon footprint, as well as other environmental impacts of our products. And again, it's, it's highly interpretive because of the varying approaches. Um, educations and assumptions must come with the numbers. And to BJ's point earlier, um, Yes, there are ISO standards in place. My experience is um, it, 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 there's a lot of interpretation and autonomy on how an LCA analyst can approach a study relative to its products within the company. Um, its application can be in product development, strategic part planning and marketing. Next slide, please. Yep, so at DuPont, how do we use LCAs? Um, one is we establish benchmarks um, relative to the products that we have, foundational data that will be the, um, the groundwork on making future improvements of our processes and products. Uh, identify key contributors. How do our products, um, how do our factories behave, perform relative to environmental performance? Um, we use LCA as a measure of that or at least a way to model that to see any changes. Uh, support our sustainability strategy. Uh, so like many companies, there's a push to go carbon neutral. Uh, LCA is a, a vehicle to, to, to readily assess and provide for the metrics to see how far along um, we are going along on our strategy. Uh, customer requests, um, again, there's just within the last 18 months, a lot of dynamic as our customers are coming to us, particularly in the automotive industry, and say, hey, you know, what's the GWP of your nylon products? What's the GWP of um, your particular acetal resin? Um, so it's, it's a very engaging discussion. Um, and it's a discussion we look forward to to get closer with our customers. And then obviously analyze products and sites consistently. Uh, some LCA studies we do actually try to uh, monitor and detect the perform the environmental performance of certain of our factories, and we'll use it for justification of some capital investments, um, almost as a tool to uh, uh, say, you know, what is the environmental payback associated with putting this equipment in, um, especially for large capital projects. Next slide, please. Yep. So I'll talk a little bit about our markets. DuPont as a whole serves a wide breadth of markets, each with its own approaches to sustainability. Uh, in the mobility and materials business, we provide material solutions through polymer chemistry and manufacturing. Though mobility and automotive is our platform name, we also thrive in these other markets, electrical, industrial, consumer, and renewable energy space. 
Um, so our customers in each of these spaces have been coming to us requesting mostly GWP values so that they can assess their own footprints, uh, compare around materials purchased, uh, used for their products. Uh, and they too also have customers which they respond to. Next slide, please. So, so just some market, market sensing reflections. Um, you know, in the engagements we've had with customers, or I've had with customers the last 12 to 18 months, many of the firms are, are, are developing plans for carbon neutrality. It's in their strategy, um, but they're asking us questions. They're asking us questions around LCAs. Um, material suppliers are actively engaged in LCA practices. So within the, the, the space of DuPont and other firms that supply materials, um, just through our work with the ACLCA, there's a lot of um, knowledge and capabilities that are building within the material manufacturers around LCA uh, so that they can provide and analyze and improve upon the carbon footprints using these methodologies. Uh, our experience is industries leading the use of LCA is primarily driven from the consumer markets, electronics, um, from my experience, apparel, uh, cosmetic packaging, um, my sense is, is, is automotive is lagging, um, but it's just within the last year, it's gotten a little bit more dynamic. Uh, customers are seeking transparency and guarantee of carbon footprint reduction and improvement. So um, there's a lot of discussion around certifiable green products, echo labeling. Uh, some of the discussions we had with customers is just having that transparency. Uh, between firms along the value chain. Um, also, industry-specific standardization of LCA data. Uh, yes, so to VG's point, um, LCA data can be highly interpretive. One study may be different than the others, but some markets that we're engaged with are using some standardization practices. The apparel industry has what's called a Higgs index tool. Um, firms can submit their LCA data uh, which is reviewed and it's given a standard score. Uh, with, within the cosmetic packaging, there's a like uh, a similar type tool that isn't as prevalent, but it seems to be gaining ground um, uh, through uh, one particular customer that, that actually developed the tool for the industry. Uh, ESG performance and echo labeling. Um, again, it points to the need for quantifiable product level environmental performance. And um, the need for this, particularly within the consumer electronics markets that I've experienced, is driving the need to, for, for firms to conduct LCA studies. Uh, so, yeah, I had a discussion with a fellow sustainability practitioner with Define. You know, we said, well, what's different today versus, you know, 10 years, 20 years ago, LCAs have been around for over, th over three decades. Uh, one thing that they noted is that the investor community is now heavily committed um, to sustainability. Um, and and, and th these are um, causing firms to, to, to behave in a different way, knowing that these are the objectives, what's important in regards to their strategy um, regarding the investor community. And then when I talk to particularly automotive, uh, many of the sub tiers are um, actively engaged in LCAs. Um, they, they have formidable sustainability strategies, um, you know, the ability to carbon neutral, but they are still in the planning stage. So they know what they need to do. Um, I think they're just working on the hows more or less on how's the, how are they going to approach it. Um, and again, L LCAs are a vehicle to help that, to point out the hot spots in their process, in their supply chain, to make those sort of decisions. Okay. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about automotive. Um, it, it's, it, it's been a, a more engaging environment with our customers, as I mentioned, these last, these last 18, 12 to 18 months. Um, so for, for them, it, it's more than that. It's now more than just tailpipe emissions. Um, as I showed from the Toyota example, from an LCA perspective, you're looking at the entire product life cycle of the vehicle but also the, the industry itself, itself is evolving to alternative powertrains. 
um, and the driving phase of the vehicle um, um, is, is not as influential in these new technologies as say the material construction uh, or the construction or the production of the vehicle. Uh, increased pressure at the supplier level to perform LCAs as OEMs and tier suppliers actively requesting carbon footprints. I mentioned that. Uh, I mean, as you can see on the left, kind of the schematic of the uh, automotive manufacturing supply chain. Um, we as DuPont and most material suppliers are at the tier three level. But as you can see, there's a trickle down effect to, 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 to use LCA data to improve and provide uh, environmental performance of the products to the next tier up firm or customer. Uh, the other thing is increased recycled content of the vehicle. Um, some of the discussion I had is not necessarily around carbon footprint in terms of the manufacturing of the vehicle, but customers are asking is, we've got a goal on the percent of recycled content in the car. Um, and I can only deduce that, that that in itself will have a direct impact on the carbon footprint. But when it comes to non-metallics, uh, your, your polymers, your performance carbon fiber type products. Um, I get a sense or just in discussions with customers, the questions are being asked is, do you have a recyclable type material? Uh, again, the hybrid, the, 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 the move to hybrid and electric vehicle technologies, um, materials are getting more attention in terms of carbon footprint. Um, so that impacts the material manufacturers. And then on occasion, for a select few um, sub-tiers, tier one and tier, tier two customers that we've engaged with, they now require for any new product programs, R&D programs, they conduct an LCA um, to assess the, the, um, the sustainability performance of either uh, you know, a new, new exhaust system, new interior system. And with that, they're requiring material manufacturers and suppliers to supply them with LCA data. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, I thought I'd just highlight this. Um, it's important to note the influence of LCA results and sharing of LCA data across the value chain for a certain market, uh, depending on how, how willing a firm is willing to participate in the sharing. So uh, this is a value chain of a plastics manufacturer. Depending on the degree of backward or forward integration of that manufacturer uh, will result in what LCA data can be attained and shared to generate the carbon emission values. Why is this important? Well, the first thing is to determine how to improve, you need to know what your base, base level cases of uh, environmental performance is. So. I, I get the impression we're, we're, we're kind of at the beginning now, though some companies might be a little bit ahead of than others of how this manufacturing supply chain, the dynamics of it is, 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 is willing to work and coordinate for the overall product life cycle of, um, uh, of say a material and or a car. Um, our experience in the chemicals and plastics market is, is the monomers and raw materials that make up polymer products is the largest contributor to the carbon footprint of that material. So supplier sharing of data is critical to improve, to make those improvements across the value chain. Um, but often suppliers uh, cannot or are not willing to share the information due to lack of resources. Um, there's confidentiality of information. LCA data can disclose a lot about how a company makes products. Um, it can also disclose uh, you know, the costs associated with making those products. Um, also, some suppliers and firms just have a different strategy altogether. Um, some just, our experience, they're not utilizing LCA, at least at not, not at this time. So there, there's, a, uh, th there's a timeliness around it. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, VJ mentioned about decarbonization. Um, and so I, I thought I highlight about this. It's 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 not necessarily LCA, but it is very much tied to what's called scope three emissions. Um, so as you can see in the diagram, right, uh, the emissions as as established by GHG protocol, a firm has scope one emissions, which are direct emissions within its fence line, 
Scope two, which are emissions associated with indirectly purchasing electricity or energy. And then scope three are the value chain emissions, which is, is mostly supplied by your, your supplier of the raw material and or service. Um, so what are we seeing is a, a, a drive by our customers coming to us and saying, can you give us your scope three data? So their scope three data would actually be our scope one data, which would translate to, um, in essence, some of our LCA uh, carbon footprint emissions. Um, so when they ask that, they provide us surveys. They're asking us, uh, you know, what are your future expectations on reducing? Um, and it's almost a trickle down effect because um, as I mentioned, the contribution based on the raw materials is significant enough, enough where we, um, we too have to go to our suppliers. And then as I show in the next slide, please. Yeah, um, this is another excerpt from an LCA study uh, conducted by an epoxy resin manufacturer. Uh, but but it's, 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 it kind of paints a story of um, many chemical polymer type businesses. And um, if you can see by the environmental impacts in the blue, the epoxy backbone contributes heavily to the uh, climate change potential and the water consumption of this particular resin. This is not unlike many of the things that, that we produce within the chemicals and plastics um, manufacturing industry. Uh, that polymer backbone is based upon raw materials. If it's if if the company is not as backward integrated, that 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 must be purchased by suppliers. So in essence, the um, the, the the blue portions of the graph are are kind of your scope three if you're looking at climate change. So um, this is kind of paints the, the the challenges associated with some manufacturers is um, you know if your carbon footprint is heavily dependent on what your suppliers provide, what is, this is the big, and it's the biggest lever, how do you work with your suppliers or folks further down the value chain to, to, to further reduce? Um, as you can see here, electricity, energy, waste, uh, they do contribute, but it's not as big of a lever or what we call a critical X um, regarding the carbon footprint of the product. Um, next slide, please. I do want to talk a little bit about renewable energy credits and the practice that's used with LCA. Uh, another trend we are seeing for, in, in talking to other practitioners, is it's, it's been around for well over five years, is the use of renewable energy credits or purchasing power agreements as firms strive to go carbon neutral. Um, my experience is within the LCA community, it, it's, it's not an across the board practice. Uh, in fact, uh, the chart that you see here was a, um, a survey that uh, we DuPont in, in, in coordination with the American Center of Life Cycle Assessment conducted uh, among 86 LCA practitioners on how real is the practice of using what we call these virtual contractual instruments in LCA practice. Uh, and, and as you can see, um, it's, not a, it's not prevalently used, but 33% um, of the population that we um, we surveyed do actively use them. 44% or 45% believe that it should be incorporated into LCA practices. So the, the question was raised is how do you use a, 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 a virtual form of energy, uh, renewable energy, uh, to represent your product in, in LCA? There's other things, other aspects of the survey that we came about, but one of the challenges was um, just the proper accounting um, in doing such instruments, but also just the lack of understanding uh, of how these instruments are used uh, within the context of an LCA. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, just wanted to uh, end here, I think, highlighting the trends and challenges of LCA data sharing. Uh, again, as we mentioned, it's, um, uh, explaining the, the data, the story that goes along with the data. Um, what we've also see, seen is that customers, many of our customers are still trying to understand how to use the data. Uh, and, and, and don't get me wrong, we've got some very astute customers that have armies of LCA practitioners 
that often educate us. Um, but I've, I've sit in meetings with um, some automotive OEMs um, on their powertrain divisions asking us, how are you using this data, right? What are the types of LCAs that you are using? So I, I just get the sense they, they know what they need to do. They're just trying to figure out how they can use the LCAs to do it. Um, the other aspect is, is confidentiality of the LCA data. Um, unless the, the, the study is not peer reviewed, most of the manufacturers or firms within our market space share LCA data with their customers under confidentiality. Um, that, that can prevent, prevent, present its, its own issues, especially if uh, you know, there's a lot of time involved um, and um, some customers may not be willing to do that. I mentioned renewable energy credits. Um, the other one is renewable energy appropriation. Uh, the practice of, you know, if you install a wind farm, solar farm in your factory, um, some firms I, I, I've seen in some literature are appropriating that renewable energy to specialty products or strategic products within the product line that would gain more value as a sustainable material in the marketplace versus the, the more commodity fossil-based products um, at times might, might adhere to uh, higher costs of those products. Um, the practice of renew of carbon credits um, within LCA. Um, another trend is recycling, uh, and, but also chemical recycling of uh, plastic products and the utilization of LCA. Um, a, a big open space regarding bio-based raw materials used for um, uh, polymer type products uh, and the practice of sequestering the carbon um, to reduce its footprint. Um, also, the, the lack of data from uh, our raw material suppliers. It, it just, again, how far along are they in this progression in understanding uh, the sustainability of their products? And, and, and some customers or some, some suppliers are, are, are not as far along. Yeah, as Vijay mentioned, standardization of LCA data uh, varies, for very, varies from market to market. Um, so again, the interpretation I call causes some churn. And uh, with that churn, it takes some time and understanding to do. Um, LCA use in scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, which I mentioned. And then um, customers are still trying to learn about LCAs. Um, so I, I think many are far along in their journey. Um, others, I would say, are, are, are doing the follower rule versus leader rule and trying to see where the industry is going with the, with the LCA data. And um, I think, yeah, I think that's my last chart. Yep. Yeah. Well, Francis, that was fantastic. And um, <clears throat> leads us back to the title of this talk, which is where do you draw the box? Huh? So there are, uh, but the, that's fantastic. And, and I think you did a, it is not easy to do what you just did because you took a very, it starts, it starts off as such a simple concept, right? It's a material balance. It's the first class you take in chemical engineering, right? In minus yes. out, it, it's a material balance. How hard can this be? And I think as you, as you overlaid your slides, you showed how the complexity comes. So we've got questions in the chat room that I'll go through, but as I get to those, I wanted to ask you one first, which is, so how do you draw the box? How, how do you decide oh. where to draw the box? Well, so it's, it's as a material manufacturer, what we've seen, it's, it's been kind of stand, the standard to use cradle to gate values. Okay. Um, so what does that mean? Um, so really it's, it's, it's the, the extraction of our raw materials all the way, and I tell this to our salespeople, to a DuPont product packaged at the factory gate before shipment. Um, that's where our analysis in because that's what our customers are, are, are asking. Um, and then they conduct their own LCAs. We would love to do end of life, which means continuing our product, our resin, our materials, all the way to the vehicle use, all the way to where the vehicle is recycled. Um, but it goes back to the confidentiality of the data. Uh, if, if customers are willing to share their use and their inputs, their technical inputs to conduct that study. Um, we know that um, companies and firms are actively doing that. Um, but for right now, just to respond to the marketplace, 
Yeah, it's it's more. Yeah, I just need I need you I need you to create those gate values. Yeah, no, that makes sense, Francis. And of course, if you're in a combustion value chain, it's a little bit easier because you know the 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 grave, if you will, is combustion. But for a chemicals yes. or a plastics, uh, it's much harder. Uh, so that was actually one of the questions in the chat room. How do you handle end of life? And I think it depends on the value chain, as you said. Let me ask you another question, though. Um, you if uh, you had a bunch of references there, and I was kind of staring at my screen trying to look at them. So you had Greet, and you had some other things. So do you have a model of models, or how do you how do you integrate all these various inputs into a single model? Um. Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, you know, we use what's called we use Simapro. Um, for those of you that that are uh, LCA practitioners, we are familiar with LCA. It, and within that within that software package, it houses uh, environmental data of many materials um, and, and processes. And then when we do the LCA, we will create custom models. We'll do the model of models. Um, some of our LCAs they contain foreground or, or, or very rich primary data, direct measurement from our factories. Um, and then we combine that with the background data uh, to, to, to create the LCA. Um, and what I didn't mention is they can be very time and resource incentive. So, uh, you know, there's different levels of LCA, high level LCAs, single attribute LCAs that we do. Um, but from time to time to characterize an entire business product line, which a few have done, um, We'll, we'll we'll do what you said. We'll we'll, we'll build those models and models. Um, yeah. So that, that's one of the questions in the in the box here is is the transparency of suppliers um, and marketers on their LCA not an unavoidable issue that at some point it's going to have to be tackled, right? So um, so you know what you know, and quite right. frankly, you know what you don't know, and so you I know what we do. We estimate what we don't know because that's all you can do. Um, but but the, the trend, uh, let me ask you, let me ask this question. So this transparency is important. So um, it will be tackled at one point in time, but do you see a trend to where there's more harmonization or are we still in the entropic stage where things are getting more disorganized and organized? How do you see this evolving right now? Yeah, I do see a trend. I, I, I see more a heavier trend in Europe. Um, but coupled with the trend, I, I, I don't know how else um, this can be done unless there's harmonization. Um, part of me says, when you know, we're looking at suppliers. This customer is very good. They know LCA very well. They're very astute. They're educating us on how to do it. Other customers within the same raw material line, just they're, they're not there yet. Um, and the small, I, 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 I struggle with the smaller companies that don't have the resources to staff LCA capability um, or, or make it a priority. How do you get these suppliers to thrive? And if they supply a strategic material, you know, you, you don't want them to fall by the wayside. But definitely, you know, part of me thinks, you know, as we're working with them, can we partner? Um, how do we work together? Uh, I've seen in some comments by LCA practitioners at other companies saying, hey, you know, this supplier is struggling. We, we decided to purchase renewable energy credits for them so that the products that we obtain do have a, 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 a lower GWP in, in, in spite of the practice of renewable energy credits. But yes, um, we've all got to work because it's all interconnected. As I showed that chart there, and I always look at that chart, it's all connect, interconnected in some manner. And one firm influences the other all the way up to the, the car manufacturer and the person that buys the vehicle. So you, you've got to be, I guess, you got to be at the table willing to show your cards. So that kind of everybody wins the game. I don't know how else, I don't know how else best. No, I, I I totally agree with you. Let me let me go to another topic here, which I think is a segue to what you just said, which is you you've shown the math, you've shown how the accounting works, and of course now we have this new entry called credits or negative emissions. Right. Uh, so how are you incorporating carbon credits or negative emissions into the full life cycle? That's yeah. Yeah, we're incorporating renew renewable energy credits, um, and um, you know we're, we're we're using appropriations based on um, you know key strategic materials or products that we feel will um, because of their sustainability will bring more value to the customer. 
Um, you know, we will use, uh, you know, for our bio-based materials, we'll use the practice of carbon sequestration. But again, within the context of, of ISO, the important thing is to make it all visible and transparent and let the customer know that you're doing this. Uh, not all customers um, in their LSA practice will use renewable energy credits. Uh, some customers say, no, we're, we're not accepting renewable energy credits. Um, and, and that's fine, because again, our data is still our data. Uh, so it's, um, and there's there's some, some contention around it within the LCA community based on the survey that, that we conducted. Um, but I don't see it going away because when we, and part of the survey was, yes, renewable energy credits are a, of strategic importance or virtual purchasing power agreements are of strategic importance to our firm. It's part of our strategy. And then part of me says, well, does LCA need to evolve in, in a way that would incorporate these fairly? Um, but, you know, the, 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 the jury's still out. ACLCA is working very rigorously around this. There's a work group trying to uh, incorporate a method guideline for using virtual purchase power, power agreements in what's called the environmental product declarations, um, which are backed by LCAs. So uh, it, it, I guess it's, I think it's coming. I think, um, uh, and, and I think in order for LCA to be relevant, um, they, we, we just need to have a, um, uh, a position on that. You're doing a great job of leading the moderator because you you end each question with what the next question is. Okay, so are you oh, answering okay. what the next question is? So you're doing fantastic here. You're making it so easy. Okay. So you you so you led you you in your answer. One of the things you talked about. Well, who are the regulatory bodies? Like who who are the LCA police? Uh, and so where do you see that standing right now? So who who are these LCA police, or which regulatory bodies oversee? Yeah. Case? Well, you obviously have ISO, um, and you know they form technical committees, um, which are governed by um, you know, regulatory bodies of governments as well as industry and academia. In Europe, the European Union has been doing a lot of that. Europe has a lot of influence um, around a lot of these governing bodies. Um, some other organizations I'm familiar with is CTAC. In our business, the uh, Plastics Europe, um, they actually openly publish uh, LCA data of generic commodity type plastics. And then in the US, and I don't know any other organization globally, but the American Center of Life Cycle Assessment is a very strong organization. Um, it's, 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 it's not that large, but I think there's some very uh, strong thought leaders there that are, are helping to, to pave the way for industries on LCA practices. It's, it represents many companies from steel, consumers, um, and um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, they publish papers, training, just to um, uh, promote and encourage and educate the use of LCAs within the context of sustainability. There's certifications that you can achieve. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good organization. Again, I've, I've only joined it for the last 18 months, um, just coming aboard as an LCA practitioner. Good. Hey, Leanna, what do we have? Five minutes? How much time do we have? We have about 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. Okay, good. Then I've got a couple more questions. I've got, I've got a bonus question at the end that I'm saving. Okay. Uh, so I was going to go to my bonus question, but I'm going to not. Uh, so I'm going to go back to a couple later in the chat room. Again, building off your previous answers, there were two things that you said in your previous answer. One that led to like who oversees this. And the other is you mentioned renewable energy credits a lot. And the question, which I think is a very good question is, okay, these renewable energy credits actually have a carbon footprint themselves. And so when you when you take a renewable energy credit, are you accounting for the LC, the LCA or the or the CO2 footprint of the renewable technology themselves? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. That's where the accounting comes in. Cause um, I, you know, I, I served on a, a, a work group or at least participated in a work group with the ACLCA around those discussions. And what they found out was um, this is where it's mixed and varied on how the analyst approaches in your methodology. And um, there's really no standard on how, uh, you know, to account for the renewable energy. Um, but you're right, there is an environmental burden associated with it. And I, I think from discussing with other LSA practitioners, they may or may not be aware of it. So I, I almost equate it to say, it's, 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 it's kind of like the wild, wild west. You're using logic 
to the best of your knowledge on what you know about renewable energy credits. Um, but I don't think there's a um, working practice on what's the right way to use renewable energy credit in an LCA. Um, yeah. You know, the biggest thing is just around double counting. And then within the US, there's something regarding the residual grid mix and how that's accounted for as energy purchases are done throughout these states. Um, don't know if that answered your question. Um, I think, well, I think all these questions are very hard to answer, Francis. I think you're doing a great okay. job of, of, of answering what I think are some unanswerable questions. So in the spirit of unanswerable questions, let me go to the next question. Okay. Um, and, that, and that, it is a very good question because um, there's a lot of noise out there and it's really hard. We, you, you talked about it beautifully in terms of, okay, when somebody says their emissions are this or their LCA footprint is this, it's really hard to back calculate because you don't know the assumptions, you don't know what goes behind it, the transparency, and even the transparency of the models. Most of these models are not, they don't show you the code that goes behind right. the model. So you don't actually know what they're doing behind the walls of the, of the MATLAB or the, or the uh, Python or whatever, whatever they're doing. So is there logic to really focusing LCAs on the big drivers? And even though it's not a complete LCA, but kind of 80 20 ing it and you know, thinking about cradle, if you take it cradle to gate, for instance, focusing on the big drivers versus lower impact, you know, lower impact incremental improvements that really look good on paper and may make a part of the value chain feel really good. But if the goal here is to come up with an accounting system, come up with a CO2 system to really address global emissions, you know, climate change, is there something to be said about reaching consensus on how you 80 20 this? So that you're really working on the big ticket items and not getting lost on where a lot of yeah. noise is, but it really doesn't move the needle. Yeah. No, that's actually an excellent question. I think the LCA community, the LCA practitioners in industry would favor that tremendously. Because again, we know we know the quality of the data and, and we know um, the variability. Um, and of the data, we know that it's it, it, it's not so discrete. It's temporal. It varies. It, it's dynamic and it changes. And where I see the gap there is just educating people around the numbers. What we contend with, at least what I contend with, is when we go to a customer and we give them the data sheet of our product, and you know the physical properties such as like a tensile, the the specific gravity, they're all measurable and they're exact, right? Well, maybe they may, they might have a plus or minus tolerance. You can't. If you put a LCA data on there, the assumption is naturally it's in the same context and it isn't, right? So just understanding that um, with the LCA data. So an 80-20 scenario behind the numbers, um, I think for the most part, as I, as I recall conversations with fellow LCA practitioners in steel, in textiles, um, I, yeah, I, 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 I think that would be perfectly acceptable. It's just a matter of educating others that are very um, that that may not understand the interpretation of the numbers so well. And again, those could be business leaders, functional managers, um, at times purchasing managers, um, and just under, understanding the 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 story behind an LCA number. Excellent. All right, two more questions, Francis. The first one I think is a really good topical question for the chemical sector in particular, because <clears throat> you talked about cradle to gate which again, makes perfect sense for chemicals because after the gate, you really don't know what happens to your product. And so it's very hard to understand that. However, <clears throat> there is no doubt that particularly in the chemical industry, the performance of the product varies greatly. So for instance, a, a carbon fiber, which has a very large footprint to make the carbon fiber, but then lightweights the building or lightweights something else and has huge benefits. And, and the other benefit could be that it just lasts longer it lasts 10 times longer or something like that. So how do you how do you credit a product when you're only looking at cradle to gate for the product benefits that it actually provides, which again, if the spirit here, if the goal here is to, to lower overall emissions, how do you right. how do you, particularly in the chemical industry, how do you take that factor into account? Yeah, that's a great question. Cause uh, you know, I'm just being in the automotive industry, we're, we're getting customers to ask us, what are you doing to reduce the, 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 the carbon footprint of your nylon products? Right. And often in our discussions with our, our, our marketing and, and customer engagement, people are saying, well, could you imagine the car without plastics? Just how heavy it would be. 
right? So you're trading one for the other and you're burden shifting, right? You know, the plastics have always been in the vehicle since the 1960s. And it's, it, it's shown that you can reduce carbon footprint of the vehicle. But I get it, you know, we're, from the trends I showed, materials are getting more significant. So um, it's what's called a handprint, right? So what we're doing and a lot of our, 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 our other suppliers are doing is trying to determine what the actual carbon or environmental handprint of our materials are, uh, just through case by case basis in our knowledge, or maybe working with consultant. The, 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 the light weighting benefit of using a plastic part versus the metal part and how much um, gasoline energy that it saves. Um, and, and getting this customer and car manufacturers to see that, even though they may have realized it, um, and then getting them to look at the trade-offs more closely and find out what's more important. Um, yeah, I mean, you can have a, a, a vehicle that has no plastics, but might have a lower GWP because of manufacturer, but it would be heavy or it would, it would not have the performance that you would have with um, using lighter weight materials. And, you know, I think the, um, you know, the car manufacturers, they're aware of that, right? They're, some of them are just not as uh, gung-ho around GWP. That's the reason why they're asking is how much increase the recycling content, right? For some reason, some car manufacturers are saying, if you really increase recycling content, you lower the carbon footprint of your material. So we too are being, look, we too are, being are, are, are being, a, are looking to assess that as well. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you introduced another concept that I won't go down that rabbit hole, but I will introduce it for the broader team here, which is often the most important thing when you're doing an LCA is the relative LCA. So what is it versus the alternative? And you're looking for the pathways that get you to the lower overall LCA, which is, is a series of sub brackets that you have to decide along the way. So um, Francis, great job. Not surprising, given the alma mater that we both share. So we're well done. <laughs> Uh, once again, proving that Purdue does train well. Uh, the bonus question, and I'm going to use it as a segue to our to our next speaker, is there's lots of work going on out there. And you you and I are both in industry, and so we have an industrial view towards uh, towards this challenge and how we're going about solving this problem. However, a big player in the whole LCA space, a major player in the LCA space, dare I say, are the universities, are the academics. Mm -hmm. And there's some really, really fantastic models being built in academia. Um, are you engaged? Does, do, do, are you aware? Do you work with universities to help answer some of the some of the questions and do some of the fundamental modeling that, quite frankly, only universities uh, can do and have the have the uh, you know kind of sort of have the mandate to do? Are you in that space? Do you participate? Yeah. Oh no. Oh, very much so. Right. So um, where I see, uh, you know. Uh, I would also say, you know, the, we, we, we relied on the university for the cut, cutting edge methodologies that will evolve LCA techniques. Um, so we work with uh, academia through external consultants. Some, many of our, few of our external consultants are based out of academia. And, um, but yeah, we work closely with them. We work closely with them through ACLCA. Um, they're, they are a great resource for educating um, LCA practitioners in industry um, and uh, help, helping us to stay in what I would call stay in check uh, around the methodologies and the, the, the objectivity associated with um, using LCA in industry. Um, but yes, um, you know, we, we deal with them quite a bit. Yes, or we work with them. I'm sorry, we work with them. Excellent. That's great, Francis, because you're about to transition to one of them right now. Okay, great. so let me let me introduce our, our next speaker. I, I already told you about Bob and his incredibly distinguished career. Uh, Bob is uh, Bob is up at MIT, um, and uh, Bob's going to talk to us about his perspectives on LCA and where you draw the box. So over to you, Bob. You're on mute. So again, I'm I'm off mute now. Uh, so thank you, VJ, um, and that was a great talk, uh, Francis. Um, really enjoyed that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some work we've done at MIT developing uh, a an LCA tool. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I hope that shows up for everybody. Um, in, in doing this, and I'll, I'll add as a disclaimer at the beginning, I'm, I'm not a Purdue graduate um, at, at any point in my career. Um, Georgia Tech and Wisconsin, and a career at MIT. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, 
a systems-wide LCA, uh, ultimately, which we develop in the context of, of how do we understand uh, alternatives and make wise decisions of, about changes in the energy system to, to, to drive the energy transition uh, to, to the net zero that, that we aspire to. So I, I'm, I'm gonna start with, with a slide that everybody knows, um, but, but uh, just to remind you wh why, why we're driven in this and, and what uh, makes us get up in the morning and, and charge at this. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, we see rapid growth in, in energy uh, demand globally, particularly driven by population growth and, and emerging markets, developing economy countries. Um, and uh, associated with that, um, uh, we have to get to net zero, uh, not just in one country or two countries, but but globally. And uh, that means uh, we needed to, to execute a dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions while we're providing uh, more energy to the world. Uh, the the uh, EIA just, I think two weeks ago, uh, had their International Energy Outlook uh, published and noted that uh, without significant new policy, we're gonna see 25% increase uh, in emissions by, by mid-century. So uh, that will be headed the wrong way. So how do you how do you inform that decision making, uh, but both at a government level and and also individual uh, company uh, thinking? So let me uh, then frame what we're trying to allow a a, a rational thinking uh, about is is the increasing overlap between the different subsectors in, in energy uh, as we drive decarbonization forward. Um, in, in the early days of, of decarbonizing the power sector, uh, the, the deployment of, of wind resources, solar resources, um, we've driven down costs uh, for those resources uh, through deployment, uh, made great headway in decarbonizing power. But, but as we make progress there, we, we increasingly see the need to, to understand the overlap between the power subsector and other parts uh, of the energy sector, particularly industrial, transportation, and, and building use. Um, I illustrate some of the important overlaps that, that uh, have popped up and are already quite, uh, quite obvious in the system, uh, rooftop, PV as that has spread uh, in, in developing countries, particularly developed countries, particularly uh, we, we see, you know, buildings becoming uh, power generators as, as well as power consumers. Um, you see an overlap between buildings and transportation as EVs become more, more prevalent uh, charging uh, at the residential uh, level. Um, industry use of hydrogen is something I think many of us are focused on uh, these days. That hydrogen can, of course, go to many different uses. Transportation is one that uh, Francis talked about. I'll talk a, a little bit about that as, as well. Um, and then hydrogen production, of course, if we're going to do that electrolytically, uh, that will interface closely with the power sector. And so there's a, a big opportunity for uh, intersection understanding uh, there. So this is a kind of picture that, that drives a lot of the work we're doing at MIT on LCA analysis. Um, how, how do we approach the understanding of the emissions from different pathways uh, that then get put together into an energy system? Uh, and how are those affected by not just what we're doing in one particular application, uh, but, but at overlaps between these different parts of the energy sector. Oops. So th this is a graphic looking at some of the problems we'd like to understand. Uh, since a as we get in an increasing number of alternative technologies that could produce uh, uh, energy, uh, and the options for using that energy for a given service, for example, for, for transportation or mobility, 
um, what 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 are the relative merits in terms of emissions of those different pathways? So I, I'll illustrate the kinds of things you might want to compare uh, in in this slide, where on the far left are different uh, energy resources you, you might start with. On the far right are different uh, uh, mobility applications uh, that might be the ultimate uh, use goal for those um, energy resources. So on the right, uh, just to illustrate, the, there, there's a prototype for a, a spark ignition engine, internal combustion engine, uh, a plug-in uh, vehicle battery electric or plug-in hybrid. Um, there, there's heavy-duty trucking. Um, uh, there's hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, and, and natural gas uh, fuel vehicles. Uh, on the far left, uh, oil is the predominant way we're fueling uh, transportation today. Um, and we can move that resource through to, to, the, to the pump to fuel a vehicle. Uh, we can use biomass, coal as a starting product, wind, solar, uh, and natural gas. The interesting part of this is as I go left to right through this graph, you'll notice uh, the little gray arrows on top of, of the different um, icons. And those represent the emissions, carbon emissions associated with uh, that step in the, in the, the value chain here. Uh, so there's, there's emissions associated with uh, producing oil uh, in the movement of that oil by pipeline, say, to, to a processing facility, a, a refinery, uh, refining possibly with a CCS or, or without, uh, then piping and trans, transportation of that uh, refined product to the pump and, and then to the vehicle. Um, I, I could get to the pump other ways. In, in fact, today, uh, most, most of what you buy at a, a gas station has ethanol uh, blended in. Um, that comes from biomass. Uh, in the U.S., primarily corn. Um, so there's a carbon footprint associated with producing uh, that biomass resource uh, for moving it uh, to, to a refinery uh, to make ethanol uh, or biodiesel, and, and then moving that to the pump uh, to be um, par part of the, the fuel for the vehicle. And, and, and there are these others. I'm not going to go into all of these. Um, uh, but but wind and solar options allow you to go through transmission directly to uh, the pump is a charging station. This one could be at home, it uh, could be uh, in a at, at your place of work or or somewhere else. Um, and, and each each one of these icons has an emissions associated with it. And and we're interested in in what's the aggregate across a pathway uh, for mobility. Um, and, and how do we choose uh, among those? Uh, to, to do this, uh, that's the, the kind of thinking that's driven us to develop what we call the Sustainable Energy Systems Analysis and Modeling Environment, um, so-called SESAME is, is, is the acronym. We, I don't think we had to go too far out of the way to get that acronym. Um, it, it, is, it is to be a, an open source software, I think it's, it's discussion uh, uh, in, included previously. I think an important part of these LCA analyses is transparency. And, and one way to provide transparency is to ensure that the methodology you use um, is open source. So anybody can dive in and look at the various modules that we have uh, in, in this analysis and, um, and uh, provide comments. Um, uh, argue with specific methods uh, and and so on. And we're 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 wide open to that. that and, I, and I'll say th these have all been published. Uh, what I'm what I'm going to show. So Sesame is, is a is a platform uh, which allows you to to assess and compare uh, technology op options. Um, it it allows you to perform technology and system scenario analysis. So we, we'll see in just a moment how you can take a variety of technologies and string them together into a, 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 an energy pathway. Uh, you can take a set of those pathways and string them together in, into a, an energy system. 
Um, we can use this then to explore implications of market and policy dynamics, uh, and, and we'll take a take a look at an example there um, uh, later in the talk. Uh, we can look at cross-sector comparisons, as I was illustrating in the previous slide, um, and, and look at impacts um, of using standard versus best practices uh, in how we, how we uh, produce uh, products and services of, of different kinds. So the next slide has been not so that you read everything, but to give you uh, a layout of, of how we've constructed Sesame. I think one of the really unique features of, of Sesame is the modular framework uh, that's illustrated here. And the modular framework allows you to swap in and out modules with as much specificity at, at, as you want. And so as we learn more, we can swap in new modules. You, 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 you can, there's a lot of interchangeable parts that you can, uh, can take advantage of. But the basic um, flow is the same as, as what I showed on the, the transportation slide. Uh, we start on the far left with upstream uh, resources, uh, whether those are, are renewable resources, uh, biomass of, of lots of different kinds, whether it's um, a solar uh, photovoltaics of, of different kind, whether it's silicon-based or uh, thin film uh, technologies, concentrated solar power, uh, wind. Um, we currently have, I think, in, in Sesame, maybe 17 different standard wind turbine types uh for for use uh in, in the analyses and and so on with, with fossil energy resources um uh, ranging over the the usual categories um there um we, we we need to take that upstream resource that's been produced and move it to a processing step there so there's a midstream piece uh where for gas for example you might have a separation stage you might compress the gas part phase uh um and then pipe that to uh, processing steps. Uh, so there, there's a wide variety of midstream uh, steps, depending on, on, on what the upstream resource is and how you're gonna process it. Now processing it includes um, a lot of different uh, processes for generating power, uh, power and heat, uh, including nuclear. Um, there are different industrial processes, um, I think 21 refinery types that we have now, but you can plug in your own. And, and, and I'll add that these boxes on processing, uh, th there are links to Aspen. So if you wanna dive in and do more uh, detailed modeling uh, for some aspect of this you want, uh, that's, that's always available uh, to a user of Sesame. Um, so, Lots of different uh, processes that depend on the resource and, and the ultimate end use. Now we add in a fourth vector here, uh, CCUS, which uh, has an optional character. Right now, CCUS is, not, CCUS is not widely used. Going forward, we expect CCUS to be increasingly important in the system. Certainly the National Academy studies and others have shown that pointed out that uh, we're gonna to need to have serious negative emissions uh, deployed by mid-century uh, if we have any hope of getting to, uh, to our climate goals. And, and so there are a variety of different uh, separation technologies that, that are included um, there and, and utilization um, options for, for the CO2 you, you capture. And then finally take, take the the result of the process, either with or without CCUS, uh, move that to the end user uh, to be used as electricity or heat or some liquid product, gasoline, diesel, ethanol, and, and, and so on, um, or, or to buildings uh, for, for use uh, there as thermal lighting and so on. Uh, so, so that's the map for Sesame. And I think that's really what makes it so valuable and unique uh, is, it, is that it's a highly configurable uh, platform for doing analyses of, of LCA. Um, I'm showing examples here in the energy uh, sector, but, but it can clearly be deployed um, more broadly than that. I'm gonna, interesting, Ms. Francis was talking, um, I saw a lot of similarities in what we have to say, so I'll try to emphasize 
uh, different things. Um, an obvious um, observation here is, is, is that we, we, we are thinking about similar problems and, and uh, uh, think similarly about, about a lot of this. Now, this is a study we, we did uh, looking at emissions uh, for different vehicle uh, powertrain combinations. We did as, as part of uh, the energy initiative at, at MIT's uh, Mobility of the Future study. Um, and we compared um, five different vehicle types. We, we used Toyotas and uh, Hondas. So we, we could get for these five different vehicle types, uh, we could get uh, uh, vehicles of the same type. These are all mid-sized vehicles, either Clarities or, or Camrys uh, with interior volumes of about 115 uh, cubic feet. And as Francis pointed out, um, the emissions from internal combustion engines or hybrid electric or plug-in hybrid or battery electric or fuel cell electric vehicles, the emissions come from different uh, parts or different parts of the value chain here. The black piece at the top here on the far left is, is what most people think about in terms of emissions from vehicles. That's the emission from fuel consumption. Um, so for internal combustion engines, that's quite large. Uh, for hybrid electrics, it, it, it's smaller, uh, but we're still consuming uh, gasoline uh, or diesel. Uh, for plug-in hybrids, uh, less yet, as, as we're relying more on the batteries. For battery electric and fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, no emissions associated with actually consuming the fuel. But for those vehicles, uh, the far two right ones, um, that there is substantial emissions associated with fuel production. Uh, and you'll see that it's largest for hydrogen. And, and I'll say that in, in this particular uh, bar chart, the hydrogen is assumed to be made from steam methane reforming, no CCS. And, and of course, you don't have to do it that way. And I'll, and I'll show some comparisons of, of what happens to the emissions uh, comparison as you change the production uh, pathway for hydrogen. Um, you, you'll also notice that each of these has a green piece. Uh, Francis went in, into a lot more detail into that, but the green piece is vehicle production, including uh, manufacturing the batteries. And, and it's the batteries that give rise to the increased uh, footprint in manufacturing out to BEV slightly smaller again in, in the production of, of the fuel cell and, and the hydrogen storage uh, capability. So that, that compares uh, those five types. Uh, I, I mentioned the hydrogen is made from uh, steam methane reforming, reforming no CCS. I should also add that we assume that the emissions from electricity is US grid average in this. So when you charge the vehicle, um, you're charging with uh, grid average electricity. And, and that, that doesn't have to be the case either. And, and in fact, um, we're gonna look in, in the next couple of slides at, at, at some of the finer grain explorations you can do uh, about the coupling between the power sector um, and transportation in, in order to understand the, the emissions uh, implications. One such uh, um, deep dive you could do uh, would, would be to look at what's the, the greenhouse gas emissions profile uh, on a more regional basis. Uh, this is still fairly coarse, so, so we can have a decent conversation here, but, but we, you, you can take this down to a sub-county level if, if you want uh, in the US. But here we look at, at um, what, what's the relative emissions between a battery electric vehicle and a hybrid electric uh, vehicle. Um, across the U.S. At, and, and, and you'll notice that in, in a region like the Northwest part of the U.S., uh, where there's a lot of the electricity is produced from hydro, um, the ratio is much better uh, than the U.S. Um, as a whole be, because the footprint for that hydroelectric power is, is quite small. Um, in states that rely on coal-fired generation uh, to a large extent, uh, say the, the, the Midwestern states, um, Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, um, the emissions from 
battery electrics as compared to hybrid electric are, are worse. Uh, that ratio is greater than one. And, and you see a mix of, of um, ratios as you look around the, uh, the country. Um, it, it, it's also interesting to look at, at temporal uh, impacts. For, for example, what difference does it make to the emissions of my vehicle when I charge it um, e each day? And that turns out to depend on where you are in the country as, as, as well as what time of, of, of day uh, you're looking at. And, and I illustrate that it's picked two different states uh, as an example here. On the far left is California. And, and as I think everybody knows, uh, California's got a great solar resource. Um, the result is that, and, and the solar resource is obviously greatest uh, in the middle of the day. Uh, so if you look in this uh, middle uh, panel on the left side, uh, you'll see the percent of total generation from solar is greatest midday, no surprise. Uh, the implication of that at, in the little bar graph in the center, bottom center, is, is that you're better off charging a battery electric vehicle uh, midday in California. In, in New York, uh, the flip is true. Uh, and that's true because in California, a, a lot of the peak demand is met from natural gas in, in the middle of the day. That goes away at night. And the result is that if you look at the middle panel again, the percent of generation from nuclear, you know, so zero emissions there, is greatest in the late evening overnight hours. And so in New York, uh, you're better off charging your electric vehicle, re, your electric vehicle um, overnight. Um, that that's a picture now. If if you migrate this out to 2050, uh, this all changes with with time in, in a more macro sense. So so nothing static here, but with Sesame you can you can move out into the to the future and look at how these charging uh, patterns would change a, a, as you go forward. Um, I, I mentioned a, a minute ago that with the carbon footprint of the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, uh, what that footprint look, looks like depends on how you make the hydrogen. Um, and uh, I, I, we assume there that uh, it was made with steam methane reforming, no, uh, no carbon capture. In this graph, that is the dashed blue line um, here. And, and we show the, the carbon footprint of that um, technology going out to, to 2050. Um, what drives that down? Uh, what drives that down is, is improving efficiency of the vehicle uh, and, and improving efficiency in, in, the, uh, in, in the SMR process itself. Um, interestingly, that is, has a lower carbon frit, footprint today uh, th than the, um, th than the um, ICE, I guess that, that's not surprising, excuse me, but, but it has a lower carbon footprint uh, than the hydrogen vehicle that's fueled by hydrogen made from electrolysis using grid averaged, elect, uh, grid averaged emissions. You can see that's the worst of all today because the grid is, is not all that clean, but as the grid decarbonizes uh, going out to 2050, um, you see that becomes, uh, becomes much better and, and comparable uh, to the SMR picture. Uh, better yet is if you use SMR plus CCS, uh, that's the dotted line down here, uh, which is better than battery electric today, and they're comparable uh, when you get out to, to 2050. Now, best of all would be electrolysis uh, fueled by renewable uh, resources, uh, and, and, and that's the lowest of all of these um, uh, over the entire span of this study. So the, the, the method matters for making the fuel um, and, and the state of decarbonization of different parts of a system uh, also matter uh, as we go out into the future. I, I mentioned in, in some of the things you could do with Sesame um, uh, at the beginning of the talk that you could look at some of the policy uh, implications of, of 
pathways. Um, we, we, we did back in, uh, in, in uh, September a year ago, we, we took a look, quick look at, at implications of uh, Gavin Newsom's executive order to ban sales of, of new gasoline cars by 2035. Thought that would be interesting to see what the emissions reductions impacts of that would be and, and what other systems implications that might have. So we looked at um, the, 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 the following model. We, we, we started with, uh, as, as a base case, uh, EIA's energy, uh, annual energy outlook from which uh, we have projections of uh, sales of different vehicle types. Uh, and, and it's a business as usual scenario. So you don't see dramatic growth in alternative fuel vehicle sales here. The green is battery electric vehicles. Um, the, the orange is, is uh, hybrid electric uh, and so on. But dominant sales are, are internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, with gasoline. Um, the fleet changes. You see, see the, the fleet size is growing um, uh, as we go out to 2050. Uh, the fleet mix um, is somewhat damped from the sales figures because people hold on uh, to their vehicles uh, average 15 years. Um, fuel use, uh, we do this in terawatt hours to compare with the high electricity case. Uh, fuel use uh, goes down with time. All these vehicle types are getting more efficient um, uh, going forward and emissions decreases um, for, for all of these vehicle types uh, going forward. Uh, the more interesting part is, is what happens in, in the ban. Um, we, we made a simple assumption just to do this analysis. Uh, you, can, you can easily change how you, how you think the ramp down would occur. But we did a linear ramp down in, in uh, ICE sales uh, going out to 2035 and, and assumed that those would be replaced, those sales would be replaced with uh, battery electric vehicles. So the, the, the green block here. Um, so that's a pretty straightforward um, uh, sales chart. Um, the fleet uh, change is of course, again, damped because people hold on uh, to their vehicles for uh, a, a fairly long period of time. So that out in 2035, for example, you still have more than half of the fleet uh, is internal combustion engines. Uh, so as you ramp up charging facilities, you still have to maintain uh, a, a large system for fueling uh, the, the older vehicles. Uh, fuel use is, is shown here. Again, it's damped. Uh, you see the, the electricity use uh, growing, uh, and it becomes the dominant but not exclusive uh, fueling piece out in, in 2050. Um, and, and then finally, emissions uh, damped, uh, but, but decreases uh, dramatically. You get a 50% drop by 2035 and about 85% by 2050. Of versus uh, 2019, um, it, it, it is interesting. It, it, if if you have these these results, you can ask questions though about, for example, the fuel use. Um, the, the the need is going to be for about 160 terawatt hours of new fleet power demand by 2050. That's about 80 percent of all generation in California today. And so I think that poses system questions for for policymakers and and for businesses who want to supply into these markets. Um, how is that electricity, uh, green electricity, uh, going to be uh, supplied? Also, a large number of batteries, obviously, that that are going to be involved. Um, let let me look next at at, at that. So, hey, look, Bob, I'm got gonna, about Five more minutes. Uh, yep. Three to five more minutes. Uh, I'm getting there. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. So, so look at at. Um, I'm going to skip the the uh, base case here, and 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 look at the case of, of a ban, uh, which as, as the sales of of um, uh, internal combustion engines ramp, ramps down uh, linearly and EV sales ramps up, then you get a linear increase in. Lithium-ion battery sales. Uh, you can see cumulative uh, 
distribution of, of those lithium ion batteries in the fleet, um, which becomes sizable by, by 2035, lithium ion battery sales is about nine X higher uh, than in 2019 or about 160 uh, gigawatt hours. It, it, it's also interesting to look at what happens to those lithium ion batteries as, as people turn over their, their vehicles. Uh, that is damped again because people hold on to vehicles so you don't start to see sizable increases in lithium ion batteries that need to be either recycled or go into second life applications. Uh, but you can see the cumulative uh, number of those batteries that need to be uh, dealt with in, in a life cycle analysis. Um, I, I'm gonna skip this piece since I just have a few minutes left and, and, and wrap up with, with two, two comments about the platform. One, one is, is that uh, Sesame is, is a, as a modular system and with an open interface allows you to pull in many different uh, uh, data sets. You can pull in your own proprietary data sets. Uh, you can link and integrate to internal LCA or TEA uh, models. Uh, you can link to an integrated assessment models. Um, so at, at MIT, we use the, uh, the, the joint programs EPA model, which allows you to look at, at, at the climate science and policy on a macro level and, and look at the, those economic uh, uh, implications. You can, you can bring in capacity expansion models. So you can look in a, in a specific area like the power sector, how you might build out uh, systems in different parts of, of the world or different parts of, of the country. Uh, given the regional resources uh, in those different areas. So, so finally, to, to end, uh, here are some key takeaways. Um, what one is that I think to understand how the energy systems evolving is going to allow, uh, requires to have this kind of analytical method and platform to, to explore the options for emissions reduction and, and to, to identify, identify the business opportunities. Uh, in providing those. Um, as I just showed, the, the multi-platform approach allows you to do a lot of integration. Um, I, I should have said, I didn't, that in addition to the fact that the modules are open source, all of the data sets that we use are publicly available. Although you can put your own proprietary data set in if you want. Um, so allows you to do the kind of scenario analysis you might wanna do as a, as a regional uh, or, or a countrywide uh, planner. Um, and, and then I think this allows to do a very rational way, a uh, uh, rational approach to how we meet climate change jo uh, goals locally uh, matched to regional resources. Um, I, I show the user interface at, at the right. I, I can't resist since the, the idea of um, uh, RPPs and, and uh, renewable credits came up in Francis's talk, th th this is a look at what happens. This was in a California energy system study. Uh, this is a look at what happens to natural gas plants uh, when you pull in more and more uh, solar and wind. Uh, it's not an argument you shouldn't be pulling in more solar and wind, but it, it's the same. You don't get an emissions reduction that matches the, uh, the, the power you're bringing on uh, from solar and wind because the gas resources you have are, are used much more, um, much more inefficiently. Uh, this looks at the, the hours of, of, of a natural gas, I think it's a combined cycle plant if I'm right. It's a, no, it's a natural gas, uh, it's a, no, it's an NGCC plant. So it, it is not running steady uh, over time, over a full year. Uh, and you can see the orange dots are the emissions from that plant at different stages of loading uh, and as it's stopping and, and starting. Um, we, and this comes from, uh, Sesame has in it the, the entire power fleet in California and, and the whole country as a matter of fact, and allows you to do this. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Bob, that was, uh, that was great. And again, it just, Again, go back to the theme of this meeting, which is where do you draw the box and how do you get this to be standardized? And I think the, the two talks uh, 
it certainly defined the problem. Uh, but more more importantly to me, it, there's optimism behind this because there's a lot of good work going on here. And, and the two talks do actually, in my opinion, uh, do dovetail. So a couple of questions in the chat box, Bob, that uh, that I'll get to, and then I'll ask a couple as well. But um, you know, you, you talked a lot about the, the comparisons of the cars, which I think is really good. Of course, the batteries become one of the issues. You talked about where is all the lithium going to come from, where all the batteries going to come from. But of course, on the other end of that is what happens to the battery when you're done. And so uh, similar to the question that Francis got, what do you do about the end of life for a, uh, for a battery vehicle? How do you guys, how, how is that in, in, in incorporated into the model? So, so we have not put that into Sesame yet. We go through the end of use of the vehicle uh, that, that can easily be put in. Um, I, I think a big question right now is whether you would use those batteries. Some of those batteries you may use as second life um, uh, for, for grid storage, for example. That's something we're, we're looking at in the future storage study. Uh, we're just wrapping up. Uh, or, or you might use those batteries, recycle those so you can reclaim the, the lithium or cobalt or other uh, pr precious materials uh, in those. And there are quite a few businesses that are spring it up to do to do just that. Um, so so we have the the manufacturing uh, pathway for the vehicles um, in in Sesame now and, and we we will add the end of life piece to it uh, as well so the recycling and, and reuse um, options. So Bob, this is an evergreen yeah. platform as you said. Yeah. Um, you can build on it right now it's largely US. Um, it, it is largely U.S., although we, we, we have significant work in, in Europe uh, with, with the IEA, uh, and we have uh, significant work in, um, in India uh, looking at the energy system there, particularly the industrial manufacturing uh, sector in India. So, so those are, are um, I think, exciting uh, growth areas in, in the platform. The, the basic modules, though, um, I, I think are reusable across those different areas. What's different is the, is the mix of resources that you can bring to the table. So for example, we, we have used um, the IBM pairs database uh, to look at some, uh, some regions around the world where, where they have very good solar wind resource data um, so that you, you can look at the, um, the pathways for solar and, and wind in different parts of the world in anywhere in the world uh, so I, I think that's easily done the, the bigger challenge in in and something we're working on with germany and norway for example is is how do you um, understand the regional state or or countrywide policies and resources uh, for deployment and um, so that, that that's i think an interesting coupling problem uh, across Europe at the moment. Bob, you didn't talk a lot about money, techno-economics. Um, wh what's the status of kind of taking these LCAs and then obviously you have the CO2 impact, but there's also a cost impact, which ultimately leads you to a dollar per ton CO2 or some sort of cost on carbon. Wh where, where are you guys in that evolution? Uh, we have done that. So, so we have, a, th th this is just not just an LCA tool, as, as you pointed out, but it's also a TEA tool um, so, so that it allows you to look at the, uh, the cost of different pathways uh, that you might take for reducing emissions uh, in the energy sector. That, that, that's become increasingly important, right? As, as we look to meet these net zero goals at minimum cost uh, and, and what that's gonna cost depends on, on where you are in, in the world. Right. So what what resources you have, for example. So that that's an important, important piece. Thanks for thanks for bringing that so up. The, the theme in these talks, Bob, is two parts. Right. Where do you draw the box and where do you get the data? So Francis did a really good job of saying where they get the data from, because they're they're obviously a large company. They have a manufacturing footprint. They actually have actual numbers, a company like ours. We know what our footprint is in our upstream and our downstream. And so you can kind of kind of use actual data. So for a university, where, where are you getting, where are you getting the data? Yeah, so so at, as, as I mentioned, all, all the data we put into Sesame, uh, the open source version is publicly available, available, right? So all these data sets uh, uh, are open for inspection. 
Uh, a lot of these data sources are government. Uh, EPA, for example, uh, we use a lot of their emissions uh, data sets. Um, the, the, the specific data depend on the specific process or, or technology. Um, I, I can supply. I, I don't have it with me. I, I was anticipating a question like this, so I, I dug up one of our papers on, on Sesame, but there I have a table with 64 different database sources related to different parts of, of Sesame. I'm happy to share that um, with, with, with the group. We could maybe you can make that a pop quiz for later on, Bob. I guess you know you, can, uh, you do that. But but you know you guys you guys are awesome. You answer your questions and you kind of lead me right to the next question. And of course the next question is, you've got this good database, you've got these great publications. But of course Francis answered the same question, which was, how do you who's gonna who's gonna be the judge? Like how, how who's gonna be the the overseer of this? So so are policymakers involved? Are you? Are you trying to, you mentioned the EPA, you mentioned um, some of the other governing bodies. How do you see this playing out? Yeah, so so we, we put it out as an open source tool uh, because we want everybody to have access to it. And we think that it will allow policymakers um, to, to make comparisons in a way that's transparent um, to, to the public. So in, anybody that wants to use this, uh, what they come up with from Sesame, it is easily verifiable how it was obtained. And, and, and you can have an open debate about whether uh, that should be done differently or not. And, and we can put in revised uh, modules or models uh, to do that. Um, we're, we're in the process of, of letting uh, congressional staffers test drive this, uh, for example. So we, we had a congressional staff seminar um, not so long ago where we, uh, broke, broke the group down into regions, depending on where they were from, to let them do a test drive on New England's uh, re regional power and transportation markets, or the Southeast, or or Texas, for example, and 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 play with different options you might take to understand what the emissions reductions uh, achievable from that would be, and and. I think that they found that interesting. So what, what we're trying to do is get it in the hands uh, of people who, who are making decisions uh, so that they can try it out. Uh, I, I think it's important to do that, not just on the, the government side, uh, whether it's a regional or, or federal government, for example, but, but also uh, that businesses uh, ha have a good look at this and try it out to see what, what their business opportunities are. Uh, I, I know Exxon's familiar with with this. We, we've also worked with a variety of other industrial companies um, in, in the U.S. and, and abroad uh, to try it out uh, in, in their market regions um, to see what pathways they might want to pursue. And I mentioned a little earlier, we're, we're working with the IEA on, on how to take this tool and use it to, to help with country-specific uh, analyses uh, so that we understand how best to to help different regions uh, design their pathways. So one of the one of the benefits of this tool is you're gonna you're gonna uncover insights as you as you do this. And so, as 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 you've run the tool and uh, under different scenarios, have you under have you uncovered any investment in infrastructure or any technology gaps that are either um, underestimated or overestimated? Building off of one of the questions that Francis got, is this telling us where the eighty and where the twenty is? And is it helping oh. guide, you know, where we should really be focusing? Yeah, so, so uh, I think in one of my first slides, I, I, I noted that what, what I showed for, for the current Sesame suite of modules, we cover 90% of, of U.S. energy emissions, right? So, so that's a good part of, of the total emissions. And that lets you see uh, where, where you can get the biggest uh, improvement in emissions for the for the investment or for the policies uh, that, that that you engage in. Um, yeah, so, so I, I mean, I, I think there, there are just lots of ways you, you can go with this um, in in testing out pathways, right? So one, I'll, I'll give a specific example with hydrogen. So one of the cases we've looked at is um, opportunity space in 
Texas, which is a large hydrogen, uh, large natural gas user for industrial processes. Uh, a lot of emissions associated with that. Um, what would be implications of swapping out that natural gas uh, with hydrogen? Um, and what we did there was to look at the coupling between the electricity sector in Texas and the industrial sector uh, and look at the test case where I'm going to produce hydrogen electrolytically uh, fr from the grid in Texas. I'm going to take that hydrogen and either send it vector it straight to industry for use in, in process heat or, or I vector it to storage. Uh, we, we did above ground storage, cavern storage is obviously a cheaper way to do this. Um, and, and then when we need the hydrogen, you can pull it out for industry or you can pull it out for, for use in, in makeup energy for power production. Um, what, what's interesting in that analysis, it, over the full range of displacements, uh, if I go from 10% displacement of gas with natural gas with hydrogen, all the way to 100% displacement, the, the the system cost of electricity goes down um, the more hydrogen you add in the system. Um, and, and we found that very interesting. And, and it's a result of the coupling uh, of sectors. So something you wouldn't get if you look at the power sector with hydrogen alone or the industry sector alone. But, but the, the result of getting better asset utilization from electrolyzers and from intermittent, intermittent renewable resources is, is what drives that overall uh, reduction. So I, I think that's a sort of coupling that, that you can tease out with, uh, with Sesame to, to, to find uh, where you can get big, big uh, impacts. That's great, Bob. Coupling, another subset of where do you draw the box? Right. So, so with that, listen, Bob, Francis, thanks. We're going to open it up now to the general uh, discussion. I must say that Liana is quite the director behind the scenes. So she's pointing me to all this. So I really appreciate Liana guiding me through the first time I've ever done this and appreciate the patience of everyone as I've tried to, to moderate this. But now we're up to into the open uh, discussion. Correct, Liana? Okay. Yes, absolutely. And as Jennifer said earlier, it'd be great if we could think about how to um, turn this into a potential BCST activity. So the virtual floor, the boxes are open. Scott, Scott. go ahead. Scott. Great, so I, I, I had to come late, but I caught the tail end of Francis's. Uh, great job, Francis, thank you, uh, Bob. Uh, fantastic job. Uh, I wanted to hear your guys' comments. Uh, obviously, you're approaching it from a little bit different perspective. I, I'm seeing that Europe is really moving ahead and, and going to full carbon disclosure. They're putting it into the Green New Deal. And I wanted to get your perspective on this whole concept. And, it's almost like truth and labeling around foods and packaging, right? Where you have to list calories and things like that. Do you, do you see that if governments kind of put together some standards that that would help? Because I, I, like as Francis said, it's, it's kind of the wild, wild west. And I just want to get your perspectives. Are, are you seeing differences between the regions and, you know, maybe some guidance on what we might need in the United States? I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, so I, I think Europe is is a great case study in, in what could possibly go wrong, right? So, so you have all the right ambitions and all the right um, uh, goals for for the future, but 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 unless you recognize that the system still needs to deliver services to to, to consumers, whether those are individuals wanting electricity for their homes or or industries who need. Uh, both power and heat for, for heavy industries, Germany in, in particular, um, th th then you can run into, um, I, I'll, I'll say there are unexpected consequences. I, I think they could have been expected. Um, so so in, in Germany, what, what, what they're finding actually in Europe more generally is wind resources have been lower than uh, typical this year. So the energy generation from wind is, is low. Um, and, and the result has, has been extra coal combustion um, in, in Europe, uh, Germany in, in particular. 
there's a severe natural gas shortage uh, in Europe, I think you're familiar with. Uh, and, and so that's causing uh, emissions uh, headaches, but, but, but it's also causing supply chain problems for industry uh, as they try to meet their, their product needs for customers. Right, so I, that, that's where I think having a platform that lets you go across the whole pathway, put all those pathways together to see what the whole system uh, looks like and then perturb it, right? And, and see what happens if I have less or more wind uh, or less or more solar uh, th than I expected, uh, how do you make up that difference? That's the sort of study we, we've done in great detail in California uh, where we have lots of good data on, on I, I illustrated in, in that one picture of a user interface, uh, look, looking at stops and starts and the partial loading and so on, what, what happens there. But, but in, in the spirit of things could be worse, um, that's what's happening in, in Europe. Yeah, so it, like I'll, I'll add and I'll ask Francis to comment on it like i i do think that this if if the world moves to full carbon disclosure it actually creates an advantage for, like france is a heavily nuclear so their uh you know their calorie counts for their products made in france so a german or a french cheese could be wildly different than wisconsin cheese if they actually started putting carbon content on on labeling right there you go scott now we've covered cheese which is something i never yeah. thought yeah, we yeah. Never cover, yeah, but yeah. well, the, you got to get in the ag business. But but I'll I'll, I'll say that um, France is has, has this large nuclear fleet, but but they plan to phase it out, right? Or phase down. They plan to go from their current seventy five to eighty percent nuclear down to fifty percent, right? Which is not working well for Germany. Gerard, you had your uh... thank you. Uh, first terrific talk, really uh, eye opening, and actually, if I may. Uh, brings me confidence that the tools for being able to measure and assess uh, LCA, is, they are there, okay? So my question is more, I'm trying to, uh, it, it's more a comment for the board and uh, please uh, Francis and Professor Armstrong feel, feel, good, feel free to comment, which is um, how can we bring it to the chemistry side? So I'm just trying to say, I see a lot on the energy side, got that, that's important, that's chemistry, but I'm looking also at the chemistry, whether it's a new nylon, whether it's a new detergent, whether, as we heard yesterday, where synthetic biology is going. So just trying to make sure we don't forget the chemistry by going back to too much of energy. Uh, I will propose to the board that standardization can be helpful. <laughs> But my mind will be on behalf of our enterprise is, are the choices that are being made in where the research goes, the strategic choices by the industry, the infrastructure investments, hopefully NSF, Biden, you are going to help us here, are put into the right, the, 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 the highest you know, rate of return for what we try to do, which is to you know, fix the problem of the planet. And I'd like to this discussion to continue to open because we can standardize and there is some value of it and there is a lot of headaches that could be avoided. Uh, I have to say for me, drawing the box, you can't draw the box. You have to look from cradle to grave. Okay, I'm in the business of selling <laughs> detergents and I will tell you the washing machine, the, the temperature by which you use you know, your detergents, whether you do an auto dishwasher or and dish has a huge, humongous you know, impact onto the LCA from our vantage point, right? So the key thing for us is, is, the, is are the investments put into the right bucket, considering the insight that we start to have from LCA cradle to grave? If we feel it is good, then we can move to the next level, let's standardize, but let's make sure we don't feel that in five years we forgot to identify this bucket that could have a bigger buck for the planet and for the chemical enterprise. So that's a bit my comment. Uh, and I don't know how to answer this one. Uh, you know, my business is on biodegradation. I know that if I do biodegradation material, okay, there will be some trade-off at the upstream, but so be it. We can have, you know, a discussion with the stakeholders that it's still worth doing. I would not like biodegradation scientific research to stop because we say, ah, oh, we are going to create more CO2. So I'm a bit 
that may be confusing, but I just want to make sure, you know, uh, as a board, we want to make sure that we feel good that the investment by Congress, by the universities are in the right pot. And we are not just driven by some rules that have been written in, you know, in uh, carbon credits or things like that. That's a really good comment, Gerard. And thank you for bringing us back to the primary purpose of this discussion, which is what should our body be doing with this information? So I think Bob and Francis did a fantastic job of kind of describing the state of the science, the state of the technology. But as you said, Gerard, you know, there's a there's a perspective that you have from your, you know, I being a large energy company, we have a different perspective. And, and at the end of the day, you have policymakers in Washington that that have an objective of lowering the emissions of a country, but I'm not always convinced that they have all the data needed and all of the analysis needed to know that what they're doing is actually moving in the right direction. And I think Bob's example of the California vehicle mandate uh, illustrates um, how policy and systems and analysis can actually uh, go together. So, so Jen, you've got your hand up. I'm finally figuring out what this little gold hand thing is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had a, a thought actually coming out of the discussion um, after Francis's talk and, you, you know, in thinking about um, end of life challenges and, and impacts, you mentioned that the, the unknowns are unknown. And I wonder if there's space to bring people together to think about, well, what are those, what are those future unknowns? Can we, can we start, you know, Yesterday, we we're talking about horizon scan. Like, are there, for example, horizon scanning approaches that could help illuminate what some of those might be? You know, that, that 50 years ago, we weren't thinking you know, so much about greenhouse gases, and 20 years ago, we weren't thinking about microplastics and, and PFAS. And so, what's the thing that we're not thinking about right now that 20, 30 years from now is going to be a huge part of that end of life cost in the life cycle assessment? And are there ways to bring people together to maybe? you know, start start seeing where those things might crop up. You know, is there evidence out there? Is there knowledge out there that could be used to make predictions about those things? Okay, Liana, how do we bring this, how do we land this airplane? I can, I, I can offer an observation on, on the last question, just to, to say that I, I think one of the, I mean, one of our design goals for Sesame was to have a highly configurable tool, right? So we, we don't know what needs to be in there yet. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that Francis has done fantastic work on that would be uh, very helpful to, to an overall analysis that you could plug into a tool like Sesame. Uh, to get that. So I, I think the configurability is is important, uh, given that we don't know <laughs> what's going to happen down the road at, and be able to pop modules in and out um, a, as you go, right? Yeah, I think, so. I think I was just saying about like what, you know, are there ways to, to think about bring, bring people together with expertise that might not be talking to each other to be able to predict what some of these challenges might be in the future. And maybe that's a, that's a big, huge lift, but it's, it's a, a question I've been thinking about as we've, said, as we've you know, been through these discussions. Yeah, maybe Jen, I could comment just from some of the things I see um, in engagement with our customers. Uh, car manufacturers, uh, the ones that we've engaged with, the, the, you know, they're, they're looking at it closely from a recycling perspective, right? At the end of the life of a vehicle, what parts are, are recyclable? They would know, but what do we need to do to make, to increase the recyclability of the vehicle? Break it down. And from a plastics perspective, you know, a lot of those parts are plastics that have been compounded with other plastics that are integrated with me metallic components. And then you've got a, a system in place, say a battery system that incorporates these multi-material parts using sophisticated manufacturing operations. And now you've got a battery composite that's like, okay, what, what do we do with this, right? So OEMs are looking at, you know, how do you break this apart? How do you simplify it? But I, I don't think it's too different than say, you know, the electronics business is doing the same with highly integrated multi-material components in their products. And 
and I do, I do see pockets of oh, this car manufacturers doing this, and, and you can see it in, in published news. Um, I don't know if they're talking to each other, and that's, that raises a really good question, or if there's associations, I think of SAE, uh, are there forums where, where they, 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 they look at this stuff while holding hands? Right. Um, there's common technological platforms in these markets that share the same same product attributes. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of this is kind of I wouldn't say is it's an infancy, but we're learning. And are are they, they are they there yet in order to do the the sharing, or is you know are there opportunities to enable this sharing and and, and have those sort of forums. And, and, and talk deeply and technologically around that. Um, so yeah, I, um, you know, I, I equate it back, and this is maybe a bad example, is how, how they developed the, 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 the vaccine for the virus, right? You got companies together and just, for lack of a better word, science the crap out of it, right? And, 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 and how do you get that sort of critical mass and motivation technologically within these companies to, to, to do, the, do the similar thing and in one of cases, how do you make a vehicle completely recyclable? So, I, I'll add that. Uh, I mean, those I agree with everything you said, Francis. Those are great comments. Um, I'll, I'll add that I think another way to scan this for p potential problems uh, down the road is to look at the scale issues. I think that's something we we often forget about. I, you know, fossil fuels weren't much of a problem if, if back in in the pre-industrial days, right? They weren't using very much or, or none. Um, CO2 on its own, uh, old combustion lectures, uh, you would say you get CO2 and water out of combusting a hydrocarbon, what could possibly go wrong, right? That's already in the atmosphere scale, right? So I, so I, I think uh, these system analyses let you look at, um, as you, as you post postulate alternative technologies, what, what what would those scale up to? You know, for example, uh, in the simple example I gave for the EVs, uh, 2,700 gigawatt hours of, of lithium-ion batteries in the fleet in California, right, in 2050. Um, what what could what problems could come from that, right? Uh, yeah, so I, I I think that's a a very useful piece of this. Of course, there's the 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 so. Anything at too large a scale might cause a problem, uh, but but there are some some chemicals that even at very small scales can be a problem, and that's a, that's a different uh, different sort of analysis. Okay, John. <clears throat> All right, this is fascinating. Fascinating talks and discussion. I'll admit uh, this is, these are not my areas, but I think about. Um, things in terms of thermodynamics a lot, especially in big environmental systems. And I'm just curious, again, it's not my area, have there been sort of thermodynamic principles applied to this LCA analysis? It seems like a lot of this is actually entropy driven, right? In terms of order and disorder going up and down sort of the chains. Um, it, it makes sense in terms of a CO2 perspective uh, to, to use that in terms of global warming, but overall, you know, it's, it's really an energy question, right? Sort of this free energy question and how that sort of created, right? And then applied to, 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 to create order, right? With products and how to take that apart. And then at some point, you know, it's probably a bare minimum, right? Of sort of heat given off in this whole process with a certain amount of energy that we need uh, to, to sort of survive, right? The quality of life and what that might be in terms of, you know, a global minimum just for the transfer of, of, of uh, processes up and down the, the life cycle analysis for, for all things that we do. I just, I'm just curious. Well, the, I mean, certainly the entropic consideration are deeply buried in, in the, right. the technology pathways, right? So, so you, you, you can't do a modeling of one of those uh, technology steps and, and pathways without, without considering that. Um, it, a particular problem, of course, is, is that as you, as you get to, to lower and lower useful energy in, in heat, right? So very low grade heat. Um, then you end up just discharging that. Um, but, but these analyses let you try to minimize that, certainly. That's fascinating. Yeah. 
Francis. Oh, sorry, Gerard. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Francis. I mean to scare you there. Looking at the wrong square. Gerard. <laughs> Thank you, VJ. And uh, I'm continuing about for the board, right? What could be the things yeah. that could be actionable? Or we will not like not to do and then feel sorry in five years. Number one, uh, I pick on uh, what Scott and others are saying. In Europe, there is clearly a very, very uh, proactive approach, as you know. It could be good to say what kind of research or investments. And again, I'm trying to move from energy, if I may, or solid <laughs> buildings into more the chemistry side, although they are overlapping. But do we foresee some research that Europe will stimulate? And that we in the US, we should listen to and see whether we can compete, whether we should play there. So that's just a kind of gap analysis. I think Europe will inspire us. We may not like what they are doing, but I think they are going to change the area of research. And I see that from an industry standpoint. Okay, Europe is expecting from the industry to be bolder on changing materials to new ones. So that could be uh, one uh, one of the, uh, the aspects. The other one is, I see transpiring some trade-offs. We are worried about trade-offs. So I say mine, a biodegradable material versus a low emission. It looks like it's a trade-off. I think without boiling the ocean, is there the, what will be the top three trade-offs that will be worth doing a workshop? So as maybe we don't end up with black and white, you are biodegradable, you are bad because <laughs> you increase the emission or you find something that has a low emission, but guess what? You create microplastic, right? So this is maybe one area to focus the science and the experience to say how to deal with these trade-offs. Probably it's not a choice, but it, it could help the Congress, it could get the investment, it could help the research to go into the right way, rather than doing this bipolar, it's bad or it's good. And I think that will be two. So two thoughts for the board. That's... Excellent. Thanks, Gerard. Karen. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I really enjoyed the talks this morning, really illuminating. Francis, I particularly enjoyed that slide to just show with the different vehicles and, and how much emission associated with the fuel use versus making the vehicle and and it, it you know as we move forward we have to be so careful that we're not creating problems that are going to be our future you know you see with these wind turbines that there we're just having graveyards of wind turbines and it's going to be our new plastics problem so how do we you know, it seems like these tools of LCA really, we have to find wider ways of employing them to really think about the changes that we're making as we move forward. And, and I don't know how the board can become a player in that area, but I think it's critical because we don't wanna be creating the next problem by just trying to solve the CO2 one. That's a great comment. Of course, you know, I, I Scott and I had a little bit to do with getting this thing on the agenda. so. I'll admit my my bias here, but uh, the premise when we talked to Jeremy about this uh, to, to to get this thing on the agenda was I think I think the board I think this particular body can play a huge role because I think just just this body putting together the case for action and the implications of where you draw the box not where do you draw the box which was the topic today but the implications of where you draw the box and why you need to be thoughtful about where you draw the box. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do, and we didn't talk about this today, but there's this huge behavioral component to climate change that we often don't talk about. And I draw the analogies to food all the time. That once, once you walked into a pizza place in Manhattan and it had the calories per slice, you, you didn't eat pizza. Well, a I ate pizza, as you can see, but most people did not uh, eat pizza. And so there, there's, a, there's a data-driven way to do policy and we're all scientists on this on this call, and so we would prefer policy to be data driven. Uh, but right now, it's not always data driven. And um, you know, I, I've been a pretty big advocate of of trying to get people to understand the role of the LCA, the role of a of a transparent, uniform methodology. I I think I'm still learning. You know, I'm the rookie on this team still, so I'm still learning what this board can do. But I think this board. Uh, and certainly, you know, the National Academies in general, putting out a position paper that says, this is why it matters. This is why where you draw the box matters. Uh, and getting that in front of people that will read this thing, 
I, I think I'm obviously biased, so I put that out there to begin with, okay? But but that's that's why I wanted to get this in front of this team, because I think if this team gets behind it and we put together a readable paper, okay, because that's the other challenge here. This is very complicated, as you saw. But but at the same time, it's complicated yet it's really simple. And I look at the food industry that how in the world can every Twinkie be 280 calories? I mean, how did they do it? Think think of the database that was needed for food. And, and yet it was done. So it's not that this can't be done. It hasn't been done. And I think, you know, what we were hoping by getting it in front of this body is that we could be the catalyst for convergence. Because right now we are still, somebody used entropy earlier, right? We, we are right now in divergence. And therefore people talk right past each other and, and Gavin Newsom can have his law that he thinks he's doing the right thing but he doesn't really understand until Bob shows him the charts. Uh, Francis can go to go to a car company and say, you think you're doing the right thing, but let me actually tell you what the unintended consequences of what you're doing are. And I think if this body can publish something that says, this is what the state of the science is, this is the implications of having divergence versus convergence, and can, can the National Academies along with NSF and some others, can, can they help drive convergence because somebody's got to step up and drive convergence and i don't know if that's the role of this board but there's a void and uh i think scott and i certainly have the energy and the passion to help with this uh but but hopefully the board can get behind it so i guess i guess i'm secretly yeah. voting we should be doing that but uh yeah but anyway that was the point here so I, BJ, I, I just, BJ and scott this is where i still have some heartburns i understand the calories i'm from a business where I have seen the perverse effect of converging metrics. It looks good, it looks simple, it makes the life easy, but it has unintended consequences. So I think we will, I would say a paper that says, here are the gaps or the things that needs to happen in order to be able to make progress could be one way. The other way is to try to drive convergence. But I'm just saying, you know, the calorie metrics, I get it, but I'm always worried in my business when there is one metric, everybody try to beat the metric and we forgot what are the real problems that needs to be solved. No, that, that's right, George. Let me just say, I wasn't driving towards a metric. I was trying to drive towards a, how do you get the number? Go back to the theme here. Where do you draw the box? Because right now that is the problem, okay? Everybody's reporting a number but there's no way to understand the, the the interaction between the numbers. Sorry, Scott, I cut you off. You were gonna... yeah, yeah. So I love the calorie. This is actually even more dynamic because Twinkies twenty years ago were two hundred calories, and Twinkies today are two hundred calories. What's what's also added to this is that all companies, like so, like Duponts, we've pledged to go to one hundred percent renewable energy. So that will be phased in every year. So those calorie counts will be changing every, it's going to be a dynamic calorie counting. And then what I'm also super afraid of is greenwashing. And we see examples of this, like even for example, some elements of carbon credits, like actually going to uh, not burning down or not cutting down a forest in Brazil. Hey, that's a carbon credit. So I can buy that. I, I'm not saying I do that, but I'm saying it happens. <laughs> And they go, well, that force was already there, dude. Like, it's not that we net took any carbon dioxide out. You're just counting for not doing a bad thing. Not doing a bad thing is not necessarily the same thing as doing a good thing. And so I do think there is a lot of science that has to go. It's wild, wild west. And it's going to be even wilder over the next few years. And I, I really do believe science is so critical for this. I... I uh... A lot of ideas I want to try to pull together. I think, and Vijay, you use the term behavior, and I think that's really key. So ultimately, as a new board member, I guess my question is, have we ever in the past generated um, like a white paper or a, a, a letter that helps guide the use of language? Because that seems to be the, the challenging part here. What I got from Francis's talk is that you, if you replace one material in a process or you say we're not going to use this very rare element or we're not going to use any organic solvents that it's still not okay to say it's a sustainable process if you don't actually understand all the implications and so what i got is is that this is so complex that maybe communicating this to a broader audience would require quite some skill and so 
I think if I'm understanding your points, VJ, and Karen's really important point about, you know, a knee-jerk reaction might lead us to some unintended worse problem. It, it, should the focus of this board then be maybe not so much the science necessarily, but um, describing like a process for using correct terminology and for thinking about how interconnected these problems are and have, has this board ever done that or, or is it typically documents or reports that are just focused on science and data? And I guess then to kind of bring back um, something that Jen mentioned, you know, maybe this requires bringing some social scientists on board that can help us navigate you know, how you get people to behave in a certain way, which is often not data driven at all. Maggie, can you comment on that? I can, uh, in that um, I think I'd really like to focus our discussion on, on, how, on how the academies can play and how an academy's product could play a role in this issue. Um, so you as the BCST, and I'm going to get into a lot of uh, bureaucratic rules and academies policies here, but you as the BCST are a convening body. You cannot produce a product with the National Academies brand, but you can, like getting back to the white paper idea from Amy, develop a white paper about what a, an academy's product in this space might look like. Um, and then we as staff, maybe working with board members, have to shop it around to interested stakeholders because our activities need to be funded, uh, to put it quite bluntly. Um, but we, but it also ensures that someone's interested in the product. If they're paying for it, they want to hear our advice, right? And then we convene a separate body that is constituted for that task. And that's where you get like, uh, we can do workshops or we can do consensus studies. And that way the academy is ensuring that the people on that committee, because you might not be the best mix of people um, to be looking at this task, like some subset of you might be. Um, and then that's a separate product that's kind of convened under the BCST. I don't know if that helps clarify things. Um, so um, white papers, kind of um, exploring the, the scientific and policy issues in this space um, are totally allowable. And like, that's what we love to use our board members for, but kind of a product with consensus recommendations have to be a separately convened activity. And there are all sorts of institutional checks and balances for that. I realize we're down to a minute, I guess. Karen, you had your hand up. Do you want to make a quick comment? And then somehow we'll try to figure how we conclude this. Okay. No, I was just going to say, in terms of the LCA analysis, that, you know, I think it's so important. But then how do you get people to listen in terms of, you know, if you just think, consider the plastic bags issue and how LCA analysis was done on that issue and shown that, you know, plastic bags are not this horrible commodity, but everyone's banned plastic bags. Um, so I just wanted to, to put that in, in the conversation. Excellent. Good. So um, I guess to be continued, Liana, is that what we do with this? I mean, I think this was, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Francis, for just a job well done. Thanks for the great discussion. Uh, thanks for dealing with me as I tried to navigate my first one. So thank you for for uh, dealing with my uh, lack of uh, emceeing ability. But uh, I, I guess, Liana, we, we continue the discussion as a board later on today or something like that. Is that what happens? Well, we can absolutely have further conversations on this topic in the future. Um, but to start, we'll have the sustainability and security and battery technology session at 145. And I believe it's the same length. So. Okay. So we adjourn until then? Yes. Okay, again, Bob, Francis, thanks so much for your time and your expertise. Right, thanks for having me. Okay, see you guys. Um, thank you. This session is focused on sustainability and security in battery technology. With the rise of electrified transportation, there is an ever increasing demand for lithium ion batteries, which you heard about a little bit from Bob Armstrong in the last section session on life cycle analysis. Um, with this demand, the, um, the need for strategic materials that make up some of those batteries, such as cobalt, nickel, and lithium, is um, becoming more apparent. These metals are not so abundant within the United States, so we are dependent on other countries for sourcing and often manufacturing. Could the supply chain shortages that we are experiencing now hit lithium ion batteries? 
Might our economy experience disruptions such as the current microchip shortage that is uh, disrupting the automotive industry? One such route, um, one such route around this problem is recycling or recovering the materials and batteries, but is this a feasible option? And could other battery chemistries address these problems? Could new innovations in battery design um, solve these future issues? So on the topic, we are delighted to have two highly accomplished scientists who are doing research on the cutting edge of sustainable energy. Joining us today, to provide the board with their viewpoints on the field. Their remarks will jumpstart a board discussion about opportunities for BCST to make an impact in advancing battery technology in the United States. I'll introduce our first speaker, and then um, with our second speaker, Amy, will, um, our co-chair Amy uh, Prieto will um, introduce um, them, Shirley Meng. So our first speaker is Dr. Gleb Yushin. Gleb is a professor and a Mifflin Hood Chair in the School of Material Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech. His transformative work in developing materials for next generation rechargeable batteries has led to numerous high impact publications, presentations, and patents. He also serves as an editor-in-chief editor of the journal Materials Today and is a co-founder and chief technology officer of Sila Nanotechnologies, an advanced battery materials company that began as a Georgia Tech startup and is now valued at over $3 billion. We're excited to have him here today and look forward to hearing his perspectives. His presentation is entitled, entitled Conversion Electrode Chemistry as the Future of Lithium Ion Batteries. Glove, the floor is yours. Shadi, thank you so much for the nice introduction. I'm going to, sh to share the screen and hopefully it works fine. Um, and then I'm going to go to presentation mode. Um, do you hear me well? Uh, yeah. On the phone. Uh, so I think I can proceed. So I'm going to focus today on uh, conversion type electric chemistries for the future of lithium ion. And so I think I want to start my talk emphasizing that there have been only four commercially successful rechargeable batteries uh, chemistries in history. Uh, start, starting from uh, lead acid batteries, then moving to nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, and eventually to um, Nobel award winning uh, intercalation type lithium ion chemistries. And each of these innovations um, accompanied um, by this movement of new materials enabled lighter batteries, so batteries with higher specific energy, as well as uh, um, energy dense batteries, so uh, smaller batteries uh, and uh, batteries with a higher uh, energy density. And now I think we are living in very special time because we see the emergence of the uh, conversion type lithium ion batteries that can you know, double or triple uh, energy density characteristics, but also making the batteries substantially uh, more affordable, uh, substantially cheaper. And so for those of you who are maybe not familiar with lithium ion battery operations, I want to briefly review it. Um, so typically when you assemble the batteries, you have a cathode uh, stored in lithium ion. And then during charge, you move lithium ions from the cathode host to the anode host. And when you allow the batteries to be discharged and do some useful work, like power my laptop or something else, uh, the lithium comes back to the cathode. It really likes the cathode much better. And so typically, if you have a higher capacity anodes and, and, and cathodes, you can store more lithium in uh, active materials. You'll have high capacity at the battery level. And so conventional intercalation type lithium ion uh, have several different structures, but it's kind of similar overall. You have layered lithium cobalt oxide that powers all laptops, all electronic devices pretty much. Then uh, you have olivine uh, lithium iron phosphate commonly that has a different structure and, uh, and that provides much higher power density, but at the expense of uh, lower energy. So commonly used for lower NGVs, uh, hybrid electric vehicles, power tools, and on grid. Then you have layered uh, NCM or NCA cathode materials when some of the cobalt is replaced by more abundant uh, cobalt, uh, sorry, nickel, uh, as well as other metals, uh, manganese, aluminum, magnesium, and others. Uh, and these are commonly used in electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, as well as e-bikes. And then you also have uh, spinel structures in LCO or LCO for the, for the anode. Um, and so the difference between those is uh, based on the difference in the charge storage mechanisms. Um, so there are 
So there is an interpolation type lithium ion where lithium is stored in the interstitials in the crystal structure. So when lithium is inserted or intercalated, it doesn't change chemical bonding. It doesn't change significantly the volume of the material. And these kind of chemistries, intercalation type chemistries can be very reversible. Then you have a new type of chemistry, so-called conversion type chemistry very broadly, that can store much more lithium per unit weight or volume of the material. However, it has dramatic volume changes, much larger volume changes. And in addition, it is accompanied by breaking and restoration of, of chemical bonds. So those uh, chemistries are much harder to, to stabilize. Um, one, uh, another parameter to look at uh, uh, economy is to look at the prices of lithium ion battery cells. And initially, since introduction about 30 years ago, the prices have been reducing quite dramatically. But in the last decade, the price reduction has uh, slowed down. And we see that for the pure intercalation type lithium ion batteries, the prices stabilize are going to stabilize around $100 per kilowatt hour. It's much harder to move substantially um, below that. And you can also observe that um, if you look at the energy density of such cells, that there is similar plateau and energy density that can be attained. So we see that um, after 30 years of innovation, uh, we see stabilizing prices and, and minimum performance improvements. But fortunately, if you move to conversion type chemistries, there is, there is another bump you can move to significantly higher energy density, specific energy, as well as uh, uh, cost reduction. Another issue with conversion, con conventional uh, intercalation type lithium ion is that uh, for the, uh, especially for electric transportation, also for uh, electronic devices, we rely on nickel and cobalt in the cathode uh, structures. And so the amount of cobalt is particularly limited and it's concentrated mostly in Africa. So resources are very scarce. It's not only that the resources are of cobalt are outside US, we just don't have enough. Um, and so we expect because of the kind of mismatch in supply and demand and you know, much stronger demand in electric vehicles, uh, that you know, there might be supply shortage of cobalt uh, very soon. And so the prices already started to increase. Um, and so this might be a problem um, unless we move away from, from cobalt uh, in majority of applications. Nickel is easy, we have just more nickel overall, but we also need more nickel uh, for lithium ion batteries uh, for those that comprise uh, NCM or NCA cathodes. Um, and so, you know, we do expect shortages and we see already now uh, that the price keep rising, um, but much more substantial shortages should be expected like within a decade. So by 2030, 2035, that's why we expect the prices to, to start climbing up quite substantially. And that's certainly undesirable. Um, Another issue is that you know, there's a price pressure and the market is expanding so rapidly. So you know, some countries kind of, um, some companies uh, shortcut uh, on personal safety. Uh, there's also misuse of child labor, lots of reports in Washington Post, in other newspapers all around the world. So we have to move away from, uh, from these practices. Uh, so there should be other ways to reduce cost of free mine batteries um, without inducing pollution, without endangering uh, people. And so unfortunately for us, um, you can estimate uh, theoretical energy density of lithium-ion batteries by considering their building blocks. So if you consider uh, lithium-ion battery, it consists of the current collector, so aluminum foil for the cathode typically, separator, anode, and you know, a copper foil for the anodes. And you can assume certain thicknesses of the anodes and cathodes uh, that are more realistic um, for given uh, kind of electrolyte conductivity. Uh, you can estimate certain thicknesses of this, all these components and calculate uh, or estimate energy density of this building block. Uh, and you can see that if you move to um, conversion type chemistries, um, for example, silicon, you know, metal fluorides or others, um, you can achieve about two, vice, uh, two X improvements in volumetric energy density. Uh, so it means that you need to build you know, half the number of cells, let's say for a typical EVs of the same size. And so uh, what is even more exciting is that you can improve specific energy or gravimetric uh, energy density by up to three times. So not only is this important for, let's say, you know, electric planes, uh, flying taxis and so forth, it is also important for electric trucks that have a, a maximum weight allowed on, on, let's say, US highways. Um, and so these chemistries become really important. And fortunately for us, uh, this conversion chemistries in the cathodes uh, is very abundant. So, you know, those um, materials that I believe to be uh, at the far front of the conversion chemistries, like iron, sulfur, copper, and their reserves are massive. So 
especially iron and, and sulfur, and they typically uh, offer very low prices and very broad availability all around the world, including the US. Now, uh, we can do some price predictions um, of lithium ion battery costs, depending on chemistries and depending how the world is, uh, is changing. And so there are multiple components uh, in the cost structure. There is uh, electrode production uh, here, electrode assembling, cell finishing. There's also profit sales uh, and RD costs, certainly. Um, and, and certainly, um, there are multiple contributors uh, to each of those, uh, which may be more detailed discussed in this paper, this publication. Uh, but you can also see that um, nowadays, uh, the cost of manufacturing can be quite substantial uh, compared to the cost of active and inactive materials. Um, but you notice that if you have a high energy density cells, uh, they typically have a lower manufacturing cost and lower overall cost because you simply need to produce fewer cells that require you know, a small amount of inactive materials, uh, you know, fewer production facilities and so forth. And so moving to high energy density uh, chemistries, including silicon anode chemistries, will enable a further performance reduction. And in addition, there is just natural, maybe gradual reduction in manufacturing costs that we can expect. And there is, a, you know, we can see trends and you can see how it is expected to proceed in the future. But what is very promising is that um, essentially within a decade and probably actually much, much sooner, the cost of uh, uh, EV uh, lithium-ion batteries with silicon-based anode materials uh, will be below $75 uh, per kilowatt hour. And I think my, my assumptions are very conservative. It could be below that. And if you move to new chemistry um, um, in the future, you will see that, uh, first of all, you see the observation that the cost of the cathode materials um, become the dominant factor for conventional chemistry, for conventional cathode chemistry. And so the move to uh, conversion type cathodes can reduce the cost, the battery type cost or cell cost uh, to below $40 per kilowatt hour, maybe even $30 per kilowatt hour within, uh, within two decades, uh, which, is, which is super exciting. Um, uh, so in this, for example, case, um, the, the battery cost for the Model S uh, would be less than the engine cost for, for Toyota, uh, for Toyota Corolla. <laughs> um, so um, silicon is the most critical milestone in, in my personal view. Uh, it offers about 10 times higher gravimetric capacity compared to graphite. It offers about three times higher volumetric capacity compared to graphite. Uh, in the cell level, uh, it probably give you, can give you up over 40% uh, energy boost. Uh, another important consideration, silicon is widely available commodity precursor. So there's as much silicon in earth crust as all other metals and semi-metals combined. However, it is very challenging to use. So um, people studied uh, silicon for now several decades. Um, the early issues that people observed was polymerization of large particles because of the very large volume changes, uh, very significant stresses that take place within these uh, large particles uh, that may exceed the fracture toughness of the material uh, and that may lead to, to polymerization. And so another challenge and maybe even uh, more severe, significant swelling of the anode material. So silicon swells by over 300% when we fully radiate it. And this volume changes induce some mechanical issues uh, with the battery cells but also electrochemical challenges. Um, so as you know, electrolytes and lithium ion batteries, they're electrochemically unstable on the anode. So typically when you have conventional intercalation type graphite anode that has a small volume changes, uh, this electrolyte decomposition forms a stable solid electrolyte interface layer. So it decomposes from this ACI that stops further electrolyte decomposition. But with silicon, the volume changes are significant in each cycle. So the ACI tends to degrade, uh, consuming lithium, increasing resistance, uh, inducing all sorts of side effects and also uh, swelling, swelling the cell. However, uh, so what we, when I joined your tech, I started to focus uh, my efforts on understanding degradation mechanisms and, and how to overcome those. And certainly if you go to nanostructure with silicon, you pretty much overcome all the mechanical degradations. Um, you can even simply use uh, small silicon nanoparticles. We also learned that formation of composite particles uh, when you have some sort of matrix or uh, microstructure that hosts uh, silicon nanoparticles uh, can prevent volume changes at the particle level. So you could potentially uh, prevent swelling at the cell level. But most importantly, if you have some sort of partial structures when you uh, minimize the volume changes of the particles, and allow some uh, internal swelling, so silicon swelling within this internal pores, you can uh, 
uh, achieve very stable uh, solid electrolyte interface ACI. And so um, when <laughs> I realized that you know, all these challenges could be overcome, uh, we started the company with two amazing co-founders, um, Jean Berdyshevsky and Alex Jacobs with entrepreneurial experience. Uh, Jean was the seventh employee at Tesla. Uh, Alex uh, joined Tesla as well very early on. Uh, both of them uh, have um, a lot of experience with hardware technologies. And, and so we gradually grew the team from the small space in the duck, duck room in the Georgia Tech Technology Incubator to now close to 300 people uh, working together to commercialize some of these chemistries. We currently occupy three buildings in Alameda, California. So we moved away from, from Georgia State, actually from Georgia Tech uh, to the Silicon Valley, uh, um, about um, now occupying about 100,000 uh, square feet. So our vision from the very start was uh, to develop this drop in replacement technology. So we want to replace materials without changing anything else in the human battery factories. And so uh, for the end product, we uh, developed this silicon-based material that has a minimal uh, volume changes and also comparable size to, to graphite at the particle level. And it was very critical for us that we want to develop manufacturing techniques that will be economical at global scale. So it means that low-cost commodity precursors, uh, meaning you know, large volumetric reactors. Um, and so this is, uh, was, was our vision from the start and we adhere to it uh, very closely, uh, even though uh, it also came with additional challenges. But in overall, I think conversion type chemistry is challenging for multiple reasons. And one way I like to visualize it is that in electronic devices, uh, kind of only electrons move and atoms pretty much stay put. Uh, in lithium ion batteries, right, um, you have, you know, crystal structures they put, but lithium ions move back and forth and it becomes more challenging to stabilize it compared to the movement of electrons in electronic devices. Now in conversion type chemistries, literally every single atom moves, both in lithium, both lithium atoms and, and the atoms of the host materials. So, and if you lose uh, kind of uh, any of these um, motions to a side reaction, if one of the like, thousand, even you know, 2,000, 5,000 uh, atoms uh, change its, its way, uh, the batteries become uh, undesirably unstable, not stable enough. So we had to take multiple steps from very different industries to produce composites to make sure this motion is fully reversible. Another challenge was early on that small experimental uh, variations can, can hide the signal. So if you have multiple steps taken from very different industries, if you have small variations in each step, and if your trends are very small, you kind of cannot see the signal. So we had to kind of develop and produce uh, in-house, um, you know, very high precision reactors uh, early on uh, when we were developing this technology. And finally, we also learned that the hard way that we had to kind of develop our own metrology, our own sensors in order to innovate uh, at sufficient speed. And so this is two examples of the cell performance for those of you who are fans of lithium ion batteries and the same technology. And this is old data because this is what I have permission to share uh, with a broad audience. Uh, this is silicon matched with a high voltage LCO. So the voltage uh, goes all the way to 4.4 volts. Uh, the aerial loading is pretty high. It's above four volts, uh, milliamp four, sorry, four milliampere hour per centimeter square. So you know, thick electrodes. Um, the first cycle of our current product uh, is 91 to 93% on, on the anode side. Um, and the capacity of the current product is uh, from 1500 to 2000 milliampere hour per gram, about five to six times higher compared to graphite. Those reported here in full cells um, was about I think 1100 uh, on the anode uh, level. And so you could achieve over thousands of stable cycles uh, in these you know, uh, high performance uh, consumer cells. Uh, this is uh, data again, uh, relatively old data for, but, but uh, younger. Uh, for, for automotive cells. So this is NCM811 uh, matched with silicon anodes without any relegation. Similarly, the anode material offers this you know, high columbic efficiency, almost as, as high as, as graphite, maybe slightly lower. Uh, again, five times, uh, six times higher uh, gravimetric capacity. The voltage range is smaller. So typically for automotive and CM cells, you don't go above 4.25, 4.2 volts. Uh, the loading is highest typically though, up to six milliampere hour per centimeter square. And you know, our materials in large automotive cells, so like kind of a laptop size cell, um, offer about 15 minutes charging time. So not only energy density can be higher, but it can also charge your vehicles uh, much faster. 
and operate it in a very broad temperature range. Low temperatures, you can charge it. Low temperatures, you can charge it. Much higher temperatures, and so forth. Now, some of our particles, so we can produce particles that are very spherical uh, because we can control synthesis uh, from the ground up. Um, and so these uh, spherical particles also enable us to have very low tortuosity, so you can have very low, uh, very fast charge and discharge rates. On the individual particle level, the charge can be extremely fast and can be in a few, few minutes. Um, but in the electrode level, typically it's limited to 10 to 15 minutes uh, at the current state. So our first product is um, uh, silicon-based anode powder. So it's the same powder that you uh, currently use. You just replace graphite powder with this powder. It uh, gives about 20% uh, or more uh, improvement in the energy density uh, uh, at the cell level. But it works today. It's fully compatible with lithium ion battery factories, large or small, new and old, which is very nice. Um, and so another important consideration is that if you improve energy density at the cell level, so by producing the same number of cells, you suddenly can serve you know, more customers. So for example, if you have a gigafactory um, and now you move to these new chemistries, now you have 1.2 gigawatt hour output per year without any additional uh, increase in the overhead cost or the capital uh, expenses. So you have a reduced depreciation per watt hour that you produce. You also have a reduced CO2 emission because it takes so much kind of energy uh, and CO2 to produce the cells. So if you have cells that have a high energy density, you automatically reduce CO2 emission. So moving from graphite to, to silicon uh, has this, uh, lots of advantages. We were lucky enough and fortunate to build strong partnerships. Uh, we have two publicly announced, uh, which are uh, with Mercedes-Benz and BMW. So they're going to build these amazing cars, beautiful cars. Uh, with uh, the best technology and the best batteries in the market. Uh, so they're going to be the first to introduce our tech to the automotive world. Um, so I'm moving now my talk to discuss uh, the conversion of cathode materials. Um, as I mentioned, the, the cathodes occupy majority of the weight in the batteries. Um, and you know, in the future, will contribute to majority of the cost. Um, and so there are multiple challenges. They also experience some volume changes, maybe not as much as silicon, but still substantial. Uh, but the biggest challenge is all the side reactions between the cathode materials, conversion that cathode materials and electrolytes. Uh, typically you have all this dissolution of the conversion that cathode materials at some stage of charge or discharge. And uh, the soft products also migrate on the anode, increase resistance, reduce capacity and so forth. And overall, I would say silicon is challenging, uh, conversion type cathodes are more challenging. <laughs> Uh, but fortunately, some of the uh, methodologies that can be used uh, for the production of silicon can also be used qualitatively to overcome some of the challenges with conversion of cathode materials, such as formation of composites, crucial structures, and so forth. So there are generally multiple pathways people visualize to stabilize these chemistries. There are some innovations in cell design, there are some innovations in electrolytes, but also innovations in active particle design. So I'm going to focus mostly on those and then maybe I'll touch a little bit on, on electrolyte. So there are several contenders uh, for the kind of the most promising, the lowest cost uh, cathode materials. Um, one of them is sulfur. And so it can be produced as a pure sulfur state or as a lithiated sulfur or lithium sulfide. So my personal opinion uh, that lithium sulfide rather than sulfur is likely going to be the choice of materials um, because it's much easier to produce uh, batteries in a fully um, uh, discharge state, uh, it's safer. Uh, also, lithium sulfide has a much higher thermal stability, so you can do all these coatings, nanostructuring, and so forth much more easily on, on the lithium sulfide. And, you know, this nanostructuring will likely be needed um, and protection as well. But what is important is that the synthesis of these materials has to be inexpensive, has to be precise. Uh, you can't have excess of pores on an axis because it will reduce uh, energy density, it will reduce volumetric capacity, and it's not very high. Uh, um, you know, because the voltage is lower for, for sulfur, you, you cannot have this uh, too many, um, uh, too, too much of a dead weight or, or dead volume. Um, and another advantage is that, you know, people now consider the move to dry electrode processing and dry electrode processing would be particularly advantageous uh, for lithium sulfide um, because of the reactivity in contact with, with moisture. Um, and so we, we started working on, on sulfur, lithium sulfide batteries uh, again, almost, almost a decade ago. Um, you know, one way you can produce uh, um, lightweight uh, lithium sulfate cathodes is by uh, solution-based processing. So essentially, you can dissolve lithium sulfate in, in many alcohols, in ethanol and methanol, uh, and you can precipitate it on different, um, different uh, surfaces. 
And you can also use protective coatings such as carbon, uh, carbon coatings or coatings with other materials. And you can achieve decent stability. Um, and the problem is that uh, even though lithium sulfate has smaller volume changes compared to silicon, it still has these volume changes. And so if you have some sort of protective shell that doesn't change volume during lithiation or delithiation, uh, it induces some stresses and the shell eventually fails and breaks apart. And so once it fails, then you have uh, the solution of the uh, sulfur or lithium sulfide material and during cycling. And one way to overcome it is to create composites when you kind of embed lithium sulfate in some sort of uh, host structures. And then you can think about different levels of hierarchy in this uh, co-shell architecture. And so, uh, and we demonstrated a long time ago that you can produce these particles by multiple pathways uh, relatively inexpensively. So in this example, you just have a solution of lithium sulfate in alcohol, um, in ethanol, for example, methanol, and then you dissolve uh, some of the polymers in the same uh, in the same solvent, and then you simply evaporate the solvent. Uh, um, you can just simply <laughs> evaporate on the planar surface, and uh, you can produce particles, you can produce fibers. Um, and once you do that, you can uh, carbonize it. You can go to high temperatures because lithium sulfide is, uh, is thermally stable. And you know, one of the nice ways about this approach is that um, once you start precipitating lithium sulfide particles and the polymer coating kind of prevents further growth of the grains. Uh, so you can control the size of the lithium sulfide if you want to, to control it. And typically you have to um, because, uh, because of the to minimize uh, average stresses, but also because lithium sulfide is not very conductive material. Um, and so you have, you have these uh, structures, you have architectures, you can achieve very high uh, purity of the material of the uh, components. Um, and if you look at you know, TEM, SEM, you can see that if you deposit uniform coatings, uh, you will uh, see, for example, in this case, this lithium sulfate nanocrystals of you know, pretty uniform uh, 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 distribution and sizes uniformly distributed within, this, uh, within these composites. And you can achieve very good stability uh, even at high temperatures. Typically, if you have commercial cells go to even 35, 45 C, you see faster degradation. But if you have nice prote uh, kind of protection of the, of, the, of the active material against the solution, you can achieve very distant uh, stability. And in fact, even, even the charge discharge hysteresis can be quite small, uh, which is perceived to be a really problem for many conversion type capital materials. But it apparently, it doesn't necessarily come from the material itself. Uh, uh, the material itself also has a history, but much smaller. It also comes from the altered dissolution products that increases the um, resistance of the, of the cells of lithium ion batteries. In addition to carbon, there are plenty of other, maybe more efficient materials that can be can be used to prevent the solution, um, can minimize uh, the solution of the polysulfides and electrolytes and their formation during cycling. Uh, one of these is layered uh, oxides, including lithium titanium oxide. Initially, we, we tried to create this uh, kind of shell structures on the surface of lithium sulfide, um, and you know found that it was very difficult to have a perfect, a perfect coating. Uh, Solution-based methods for the kind of shell formation are not as precise as uh, as um, you know, vapor deposition methods. So it's difficult to create a perfect shell. But surprisingly, uh, we found that even if you don't have a perfect shell, somehow the solution of polysulfides gets dramatically reduced. And in the end, they even just mixed, uh, mixed this um, lithium titanium oxide with uh, um, lithium sulfide and found that you can even by mixing reduce the solution. And so what we realized in collaboration with Oleg Borodin that uh, some of these materials, including uh, lithium titanium oxide, it cuts essentially um, one chain polysulfides to a much shorter chain polysulfides that have much lower solubility in electrolytes. Uh, so you can create this uh, kind of functional or smart coatings um, uh, or smart nanostructures. And so as a result, you can uh, stabilize, you can improve stability at different temperatures and different rates, even if you don't have a perfect, perfect coatings. Uh, another material that is very interesting, but also very challenging uh, is uh, metal fluorides. So when you um, lithiate metal fluoride, for example, iron fluoride, iron difluoride or iron three fluoride, you produce these composites when you have a mixture of lithium fluoride and, and metals. And typically the metal, metals don't like lithium fluorides uh, nearby. So they tend to cluster uh, over, over time uh, during cycling, increasing uh, kind of mass transfer resistance, increasing the resistance of the cell uh, to quite significant levels. In addition, there are always some dissolution. Initially, we thought mostly metals, but we also realized that not only metals dissolve, lithium fluoride also dissolves during cycling. And overall, just very high reactivity with electrolytes, uh, which, is, which is problematic. 
Um, and so, you know, my view on this chemistry is similar to the lithium sulfide. So, you know, if you want to utilize it, you probably have to produce it in the cool and heated stage. Uh, so a mixture of composites, lithium fluoride metal composites compared to just pure metal fluorides. Uh, similar, you would have to have you know, a structure and you have to have a shell protection uh, for improved stability. Iron is probably the most likely candidate for, uh, for the metal fluoride chemistries. It's very abundant, it has very high capacity, especially metal three fluoride. Um, and you can also harvest um, kind of the precursor of these materials using uh, waste of metallurgical uh, industry producing enough material for uh, millions of, of electric vehicles. So which is, which is very nice. Uh, so you have effectively zero cost input materials. Um, and so, you know, one way to overcome the challenges we found that this, you know, is use this nanostructure in one way, for example, is to simply embed, um, we demonstrated in this old paper, um, you know, iron fluoride uh, particles, metal fluoride particles within this porous carbon um, framework. And we use this, uh, for example, for simply precipitation of the precursor uh, um, into this, into the pores. Um, and so, uh, and we could achieve very good stability if uh, you form, a, if, if you use, Certain electrolytes. <laughs> if you use certain electrolytes that form a very stable uh, or more stable SCI on the surface with, with metal particles, because certainly the surface area of these particles is very high. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you also minimize the solution because everything is embedded within this uh, carbon structure and you don't rely on conductivity of metals uh, or, or interconnected uh, metals because carbon provides this access to electrons uh, needed for like, the chemical reaction. And so there are multiple pathways to produce similar structures. Uh, so this is, for example, the use for the production of fibers. You can produce spherical particles by the same way. In this case, uh, you uh, simply produce fibers by uh, using precursors for the polymers or precursors for carbon and precursors for the metal fluorides and produce very uniform uh, fibers com comprising nanoparticles of iron fluoride uh, embedded in this case in the carbon structure. It doesn't have to be carbon, uh, but in this case it's carbon. And so, you know, again, you can achieve a uh, relatively uniform distribution of the particles and, and relatively good stability for hundreds of cycles uh, in this case, uh, and, you know, much higher capacity. So as you remember, as you might remember, the kind of gravimetric capacity of intercalation type cathodes is in the order of from 150 to around 200, 190 milliampere hour per gram. So here you have much higher capacity that could be attained uh, in the future. However, the challenging <laughs> challenges still persist. So liquid electrolytes typically work, uh, you know, kind of work at, at room temperature. However, if you go to high temperatures and typically lithium ion batteries have to be cycled at high temperature as well. Uh, and one of the safety tests is actually charging the cell to high voltage and storing it at like, you know, 80 C, 90 C for several days, and making sure that the electrolyte doesn't decompose, doesn't form too much gases, making sure that the uh, cells don't degrade, don't explode. <laughs> so it becomes much more problematic because, um, of much faster reactions between uh, much faster side reaction between liquid electrolyte and active material uh, if it's unprotected. And so, or for example, in this case, uh, you know, at room temperature, this cell behaved quite well, uh, but at high temperature, even at 50 C, and degradation was, was so much faster than we expected. And so, there are two ways to overcome it is either figure out how to you know, produce particles that are fully protected um, by ways of nanostructure and coating formations and so forth or maybe utilize uh, certain electrolytes, including uh, solid electrolytes, potentially polymer electrolytes, or ceramic electrolytes, that would minimize or greatly reduce the side reactions of the solution of lithium fluoride, the solution of iron into electrolyte uh, during cycling. And so um, yeah, I know that um, Shirley is going to cover uh, solid electrolyte cells, but I'm going to cover a little bit too. So one of the ways uh, to produce more a conventional way to produce uh, all solid state lithium ion batteries um, or lithium batteries uh, is to produce you know, membranes, uh, solid state membranes, and, and you know, uh, kind of bone meal active material with solid electrolyte and compress it, sinter it in the cathodes and put it together and sinter the whole stack. And the problem is that this is you know, relatively expensive. Um, in addition, you know, thin membranes are difficult to handle, thick membranes uh, reduce energy density. In addition, all these uh, solid electrolytes, not all, but many of solid electrolytes uh, that the people consider are much heavier compared to liquid electrolytes. So it adds weight uh, to the cell. And so we were driven about like much lower cost manufacturing, ideally fully compatible with lithium ion batteries and, and to produce all solid state cells. Um, and so, you know, we thought about uh, these techniques when we use much lower melting point um, um, 
um, solid electrolytes, maybe melting point below 300 C, that can be simply melt and filtrated into the stack or into the cylindrical cells using conventional techniques so that we can produce slurries in a conventional way, maybe use more thermally stable polymers uh, and more thermally stable separators, make a stack infiltrated with electrolyte at high temperatures, elevated temperatures, cool it down so it operates effectively at room temperature. And what we found was that many kind of uh, low melt melting point electrolytes, um, uh, solid electrolytes, have also low weight, <laughs> low density. Some of them have low density, lower density compared to even uh, liquid electrolytes, which is, which is remarkable. And so we um, demonstrated in this more recent paper proof of concept based on two low melting point electrolytes. One was anti perovskites, uh, and another one was uh, lithium borohydride based. And I'm particularly excited about lithium borohydride because it's again very low density and very high conductivity. So we used several types of conventional, uh, well, common materials are more common in, in battery research. NCM cathodes, we also used uh, with some preliminary studies on lithium sulfate cathodes, conversion type cathodes, and two types of graph uh, two types of anode material, uh, graphite uh, and LTO, lithium titanium oxide. And so we found that we could achieve perfect weighting of, of both electrolytes and active materials. However, if you want to achieve perfect weighting in the electrode, you also need to make sure that your electrolyte weights on the carbon additives on the polymer binder. And so, you know, <laughs> this was much more challenging. And so in the end, we decided that we will simply use uh, atomic layer deposition for the proof of concept studies to make sure that we have a uniform um, and very good weighting. And so we achieved that. And so you can, you can melt infiltrate and achieve very good weighting in the electrodes. And again, very similar to what you can achieve with, you know, conventional liquid electrolytes. Um, and you can have, you know, thin, thin separator layer. You can have all solid state batteries. Um, and you know, because of the low melting point, another advantage is that you kind of don't have side reactions. If you go to high melting, high, high thermal, uh, sorry, high uh, thermal treatments, to go to high temperatures, if you want to sinter something, prevent, uh, kind of reduce remaining pores, you typically induce some side reactions. So limited by that, sometimes you have to use very high pressures uh, to, uh, for this technology. But if you have low melting point materials, uh, because of low temperatures, there is no side reaction. So uh, you can utilize variety of uh, cathode chemistries and anode chemistries uh, and you will be fine. Um, and so we could, we made full cells um, by this approach. They were not like perfectly stable. Uh, initially I thought it's going to be amazing uh, and it's, it's much harder than I thought. Um, because one thing we kind of didn't fully predict was that even if you overcome, you know, um, we predict a little bit, but not fully predict. <laughs> even if you overcome some of the, you know, the solutions, Another way to, to gate cells is simply mechanical degradation. And so any type of materials, they you know, a little bit expand and a little bit contract during cycling, even intercalation type uh, cathode materials. Um, and so the stresses uh, at the interface between solid state electrolytes that have much harder time accommodating volume changes and even small volume changes compared to liquid electrolytes become much more problematic. So we, over time, we observe cracks formation and elimination at the interface between uh, NCM cathodes and solid electrolytes. On the other hand, the, the cathodes themselves, they remain very stable, which is nice, right? So you can prevent, you can prevent um, kind of pulverization of the cathode materials and anode materials. Uh, however, you have to figure out how to accommodate stresses at the interface between solid state electrolyte and, and active materials. And so the, if you go to higher charging voltage, right? The, uh, there is a much larger volume expansion contraction in NCM. If you use graphite compared to LTO, LTO has very small volume changes, so it's perfectly stable. Graphite has much larger volume changes. Also, the interface, graphite is pretty much inert material, so maintaining very stable interface uh, free from cracks is much more, much harder. Um, and so um, we also got some you know, preliminary data on, on lithium sulfide and, and share that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, so, you know, even though the con conversion that cathode materials have much larger volume changes, but you can produce uh, these materials in fully located state, fully expanded state. So if you have NCM, if you extract lithium, it doesn't shrink necessarily. Sometimes it expands and then shrinks. So, but if you have uh, lithium sulfide or conversion to chemistries, it's only kind of shrinks uh, during the lithiation. So you can overcome some of these uh, stresses. And so we demonstrated, again, pretty stable performance, uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of stable cycles in this chemistry. Uh, we still have to improve loading, utilization of active materials and so forth. But I think overall it's, it's very promising. Um, 
And in summary, I think I want to emphasize that intercalation type batteries, uh, lithium ion batteries, and reaching their performance uh, lim limits, it is also supply limitations and cost limitations, and conversion type chemistries, for example, silicon coupled with lithium sulfide or metal fluoride or metal lithium fluoride may overcome such limitations and, and our, allow us to, to have much lower costs. Um, silicon anodes proven to be commercially uh, viable and scale up is in progress, which is very exciting. Um, and you know, in principle, you can utilize solid state technologies to help overcome some of the challenges with conversion type chemistries. Thank you so much. Of course, I want to thank my students uh, working on these projects and also collaborators from National Labs and Georgia Tech, Tianzhu, uh, Alex Alexeyev, um, and uh, Oleg Borodin from Army Research Lab. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. I also have to disclose formally the conflict of interest because uh, Georgia Tech and myself are stockholders in the company. Uh, and so thank you. Thank you, Glav. That was such an engaging presentation. And um, the, the work you show um, begins to um, uh, give us hope that there's life beyond the intercalation cathode um, in current lithium ion batteries. Um, so now we have, uh, now we have um, some brief time for our questions. Um, for those of you, you can um, type your question into the chat or you can use the raise hand feature. Um, and I see Shelly has a question and so we'll do Shelly's question and then Scott. Um, when it comes to uh, sort of solid state um, uh, um, el electrolytes, um, we start, you know, talking about new applications in terms of aerospace. And um, are, are you going to have issues there um, with um, with being able to to sort of operate um, at fast enough sort of charge discharge rates um, in some of those applications, or um, is that really not a concern? I mean, it's always a concern. <laughs> concern. Um, you know, there is always a you know kind of um, multiple contributions to resistance. Some of the solid electrolytes are pretty conductive, uh, and I think the conductivity can be further improved. Lithium borohydrate is, is very conductive, and one of the kind of advantages of kind of combining, you know, solid state with conversion type cathode is that you know the solid state electrolytes they have troubles being stable on the at low potential and at the same time at the high potential. So if you can you know, reduce some of its limitations, so for example, if you only use conversion type cathodes that don't have to go to very high voltages, you can have a much more stable, much more larger range of solid electrolytes that you can, you can use. And so the conductivity, that two components of the you know, contributions to resistance in the cells, is certainly you know, bulk conductivity of electrolyte uh, is, you know, is, is important consideration, but also um, the, the charge transfer resistance, so the resistance of the interface between the active material and, and the solid state. And so, um, and so the, <laughs> you have to do a lot of engineering. You can certainly, when you have kind of good retin, typically the resistance is lower, but it doesn't have to be lower. It depends on the kind of reactions of the interface and chemistry of the interface. Uh, in addition, as you rightfully mentioned, you know, in space, probably temperature is lower and probably you have to heat it up. You have to heat it up to go to high temperature and then enable much faster charging. Uh, but on the positive side, you know, the car, you can stop the car. If it goes on fire, you can stop the car and leave the car in 10 minutes, right? Space, not necessarily you can, you can land from space in 10 minutes. So right. safety is, is, is much higher, uh, of a much higher importance. Thanks, Gleb. We're next going to turn to a question from Scott. Thank, thanks, Gleb. Uh, uh, wonderful to see that there is a, a, a great future. So uh, I work at DuPont, and we spend a lot of time working with OEMs on battery design. So I wanted to, uh, and mostly uh, related to thermal management. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts on the robustness of a temperature profile. So like cars go from minus 40 C in Minnesota to 40 C in Texas. So, you know, spanning 80 C. So I wanted to hear about the robustness of the technology uh, with regard to temperature, both in use as well as charging. So charging temperature is really critical in managing. That's right. That's right. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a very good comment. Uh, and so, I would say in the near term, maybe, maybe even longer term, in this case, you know, liquid electrolytes may have a better shot. I mean, liquid electrolytes can operate the car at minus 70 C, just remarkable, um, you know, and then so from minus 70 to plus 70, just very broad range. And so it's much easier to utilize compared to solid electrolytes in this you know, very broad temperature range. 
it's certainly, you know, silicon is also advantageous because the capacity is higher. Um, and so you can make thinner anodes. And so, you know, the diffusion time is proportional to square diffusion distance. So you can do much faster charging or the same charging at much lower temperatures. So lots of advantages uh, of moving from graphite to silicon. Um, yeah, I don't know if I fully answered the question. Thank you. Um, let's move on to a question from Amy. Yeah, thank you, Gleb, for um, highlighting the span of fundamental research to commercialization. Can you comment on the challenges and the timeline required to go from an innovation in a lab, an exciting result to something actually being commercial ready and what you think the challenges are there? Yeah, I think the, big, <laughs> the biggest cha challenge is like a lack of you know, proper expectations. It takes 10 years. I mean, even for an intercalation type lithium ion battery produced by Sony, it took 10 years. And US companies just simply reduced, you know, refused to they refused to invest for such a long time. So when they did invest and they did come up with intercalation type lithium ion batteries, which is used now every day, uh, which enable us to go to visualize renewables uh, much more effectively, right? So without this long-term investments, it's really, really hard. So for us, for example, we limited ourselves to designing materials which are drop in, in the sense that you don't need to change the ways that lithium ion batteries are made. And still, it took us 10 years. Like still, right, it took us 10 years, it's very really hard. And so, you know, especially, you know, when the battery companies are abroad, it doesn't help because you have to like iterate very, very often, right? So you have to have very close collaborations between, you know, in this case, battery producers and us who, who supply materials. And again, everything took at least like twice as long as, as I initially expected. And so if you are you know, VC funded or funded by, by investors who, who look for the kind of much shorter term uh, um, gains, it, it, is, it is very hard. Um, and so we were lucky to attract investors who have much longer horizon, who can invest for like 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, but this is not common. This is, I would say, uncommon. Um, yeah. 10 years, that's, that's amazing. That's about as long as it takes someone to get tenure or full professorship. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll do a, a question from Gerard next. Very good. Hey, congratulations. This is a very, very a tough adventure you take and a valuable one, Gleb. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not uh, an expert on battery. I'm coming from the industry, but there are two themes where I would like to, uh, whether you need help or whether you feel you are on top of it. Number mm -hmm. one is quality control, because mm -hmm. I look at your projects and like you say, there is a surprise coming at every step of your experiment. So one of the big questions will be, what are the surprises when you go through a real supply chain? Right, uh, sil silicon or lithium. Is there any surprises that will happen when you are in the real life? And do you have a plan to test for failure? You see what I mean? So as you can get as many surprises upstream rather than downstream. And the second thing, how do we think about first principle multi-scale modeling? And the reason I say that is, you know, I mean, if we go public with your investors. We need to make sure that the science is sufficiently robust to be able to prepare for uh, for surprises. So, uh, is it part of your radar, Gleb, or is it something where you? Yeah, like absolutely. It? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's like you know, it's challenge. It's also advantage for us. <laughs> so we did invest very heavily into science, into fundamentals, um, and in quality control. We we, we are kind of proud uh, to say that you know we we have the, we have the one of the strictest quality standards in the industry, um, and so you know. When, when your kind of system is very robust against variation, on one hand um, is, is good, right? It's good for you. On the other hand, it's also bad because your competitors can, can copy it. So in our case, it's very hard to reproduce our materials. So you know, it's hard for the competitors to look at our particles and, and reproduce them. On the other hand, we do have to maintain the strictest quality control in production, uh, and it's very important for us. And as you rightfully mentioned, it's not only for the our kind of suppliers, but also suppliers, our kind of customers, making sure they don't <laughs> they don't screw up, they don't change you know electrolyte compositions, and especially working with their you know smaller companies. So initially, when we entered the the market, uh, so our devices are now in fitness trackers uh, and other small devices. You know, we have to work with their small manufacturers, and they have very different standards for quality compared to large manufacturers. And so we have to make sure that they don't have too much more. We have to literally measure everything for them 
don't have too much moisture and electrolytes. Don't do anything stupid. Don't like mix materials, you know, clean the mixers when they mix the cathode and anode in the same batch. So lots of anecdotes, you know, why things can, can go wrong. But on, on the other hand, if you go to automotive suppliers, they, has, they have amazing, very high quality standards and they're very conservative. Conservative is, is bad, right? Because they can't innovate enough, but on the other hand, it's very good in terms of safety. And so, you know, by qualifying our materials in you know, some of the largest producers of lithium ion batteries and supplying to some of the kind of most conservative, not I mean, they're innovative and conservative at the same time, German manufacturing, uh, manufacturers of cars, right? Uh, you kind of, it, it, it takes a lot of time, you know, honestly, just to qualify material for electric vehicle, <laughs> so it takes seven years. Even if it's conventional material, it doesn't matter if it's new material, conventional, it takes seven years to qualify, right? So like, how can you come up with new invention and think about commercializing it in, in four years if it just qualification takes seven years? Um, and they do lots of you know, safety testing, they do lots of safety testing, they do so, lots of safety testing at the cell production facilities, they do a lot of safety testing at the car manufacturing facilities. Because mm. you know, all recalls, you know, any single recall can kill a company. <laughs> so uh, okay. it is it's very critical. Uh, well, it sounds like a, it sounds like a very important challenge for future innovation and in, uh, to address. So, um, Glad, thank you for your um, excellent talk, and I thank um, uh, everyone for their engaging questions. Um, I'm next going to hand it over to uh, Amy, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Glavin. I think your talk leads really beautifully into what I'm guessing. Professor Meng is going to present. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Shirley Meng is the Zabel Endowed Chair in Energy Technologies and Professor of Material Science and Nanoengineering at the University of California, San Diego. She is the founding director of the Sustainable Power and Energy Center and the inaugural director of the Materials Discovery and Design Institute. She's also the editor in chief of the MRS journal, Energy and Sustainability. Um, Shirley's won many awards, so I'm just gonna highlight two. Uh, she was awarded the NSF Career Award in 2011 and was a finalist for the Blavatnik National Award in 2018. She is also a fellow of the Electrochemical Society and very active in the Electrochemical Society, really highlighting advances in research, but also um, promoting young people. Um, Shirley's really changed how the battery community thinks about operando characterization methods for batteries, which are, are critical. I think what you heard in Glove's talk is that batteries are very dynamic devices. And so innovating new ways to um, study and characterize batteries and in particular degradation processes are absolutely critical. And so that's why I'm really excited about Shirley's presentation today. The title of her presentation is Lithium Metal Battery and Solid State Batteries, um, and she'll highlight opportunities and challenges. So Shirley, thank you in advance for your time, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Amy, for the kind of introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I think after GLAB's presentation, uh, we can dive directly into the detailed discussions. So uh, my perspective uh, is a little bit different from what the lab has presented, uh, uh, very materials focused. I think, uh, like Amy said, uh, my passion is really on the operando characterization. And I actually utilize uh, greatly the facilities or the uh, cutting edge tools that uh, uh, Department of Energy um, have built over the last many decades. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, before I dive deeper into the um, operando tools for the deep scientific understanding, I do want to remind everyone that uh, humanity has been working on batteries for over 200 years. Uh, Sir Alexandra Volta is the one who invented the Volta pile. Even today, when I'm doing uh, outreach with high school students, I still use his system. Um, and uh, the French scientist uh, um, who invented the lead acid batteries, I think uh, over 150 years old, but the lead acid batteries still occupies half of the world revenues of battery sales. Let's not forget about that. We still use lead acid batteries widely uh, uh, in the world, and it's 99.9% .9 on maybe in the 
United States is 99.9% recycled, um, but in some places in the, uh, in the world, the recycling is not perfect yet. Uh, nickel metal hydride battery by Dr. Oshinsky, American inventors, uh, who has uh, actually my first car per year is the function on lithium, uh, sorry, nickel metal hydride batteries. And in 1976, uh, Professor Wei Tinghan, uh, who's a member of the academy, uh, so is Dr. John Goodenough. 76, uh, Wei Tinghan reported the use of lithium metal and the titanium disulfide uh, as an electrochemical device. Um, after that, uh, Professor Goodenough saw the paper while he was working on superconductors when he met the materials called the lithium cobalt oxide. He thought, okay, maybe this will be really good lithium intercalation materials. Um, together with Yoshino, um, Akira Yoshino, they won the Nobel Prize for 2019. Uh, why we want to show you this roadmap of the battery history is because as a professor, when I teach my students, uh, you know, after Nobel Prize is won, how can I motivate them to work harder, right? So the history told us every time when we invent a new batteries, we did not completely replace the old ones. We simply unlock new applications. New applications, some of them we may never have imagined. Um, I mean, in my grandmother's um, generation, I think it's harder for them to imagine we're driving uh, with a car with 3000 batteries uh, on the bottom of my seats, right? So think about the future. If we do invent new types of batteries, how could we enable robotics, IOTs, flying cars? I don't like to use the word drones. It sounds very weapon-like, but if we talk about the flying cars, I think people who live in LA and New York are very happy to hear that. And the uh, one of the most significant uh, impactful sector for CO2 reduction is the electrification of uh, semi-truck and the long haul uh, you know, uh, shipping industry. And ultimately, of course, everyone is looking for the gigawatt hour or terawatt hour solution for deploying as much as solar and wind possible at very, very low cost. So I would imagine there will be another Nobel Prize will be given whoever who actually solve the holy grail um, energy storage problem for renewables. So I hope a lot of the young scientists and the upcoming students still consider this as a very, very promising and exciting career pathway. Um, and one of the things I have to apologize on behalf of my community is that we use the word watt hour. <laughs> it's 3,600 watt second because one hour is 3,600 seconds. And everybody in the chemistry community are so familiar with the word joule and one watt second is one joule. So in fact, uh, one watt hour is a very big number. When we talk about the gigawatt hour, we're actually talking about uh, uh, terawatt joule. So this is uh, so important for us to align our units so that the chemists and the battery people and the physicists that we can actually communicate well with each other. Because when there's like three magnitude order differences uh, in the units, uh, we will have trouble when we uh, dive deeper into technical details. Um, lithium ion or lithium metal batteries are fundamentally different, but they also share this common uh, uh, platform where you have the current collector, electrodes, uh, interface, and then electrolyte, and another interface, and the cathode materials, and another current collector. So it is a complex living system and how, why I say it's a living system, it's like a human body because when I actually shine x-ray, when I do the experiment in the uh, advanced photon source in Argonne National Lab, I can see exactly how the device are alive when I'm operating it. What you're seeing it is the x-ray diffraction peak of all the particles inside the castle. You see it moves because the volume change, you see it uh, one become two because the phase transformation. And this process surprisingly is completely reversible. When I discharge the battery, it comes back. So that's what it means. It's a it's live living system. And during the whole process, if we work with liquid electrolyte now, you know the first box is lithium ion batteries with liquid electrolyte, because the liquid 
the ions can transport from anode to cathode, and we call this the crosstalk. Anything generated on the cathode can travel to the anode and vice versa. And this crosstalk effect is very profound for the degradation of the uh, batteries for long-term cycling. And the reason people move towards highly concentrated electrolyte or solid electrolyte is because we want to prevent as much as crosstalk as possible. So one day we will have a battery last as long as the solar panel, like 30 years or even 40 years. The second important concept, while you're seeing this volume change, right? I want to remind everyone who's an engineer, right? For inorganic materials to go through this type of volume changes, it's like the airplanes taking off and landing. Like every time you take off and land, the atmosphere pressure changes, right? In the high altitude, you have very low pressure. So the body of the airplane goes through this kind of repeated process, landing and um, uh, taking off. In the battery, we have the fatigue, electrochemical fatigue of the materials. And that is the one of the uh, degradation mechanisms we're seeing in the batteries. And um, one another important factors that differentiate the batteries so much from, um, you know, let's say fuel cells and other open system is that a battery is a truly thermodynamically closed system. Uh, with this kind of closed system, if you want long-term cycling, the Coulombic efficiency needs to reach 3, 9 or above. Um, and if you stare at your phone, right, what does closed system mean is that the matters cannot go out and replenish. Um, think about the fuel cells. You have the tanks outside, even, you know, internal combustion engine, you have a tank outside. The device is only a conversion device. However, for a battery, the storage and the conversion are done in the same device in a closed system. So that's why the efficiency requirement is so high. And when I talk to uh, people who work in the fuel cell areas, you know, of course they can tolerate the 60%, 70% energy efficiencies because it's an open system. Open system always can tolerate more inefficiencies. Right. So um, the third important take home message is really this concept of SEI. Uh, many of us have the experience driving the electric cars uh, with lithium based batteries. We can park our car in the airport for one month and then you come back, the battery is still operates very well. If you drive with the uh, nickel metal hydride or lead acid batteries, you won't have this luxury because there's no stable SEI for those batteries. The self-discharge rate is very high. So having a solid electrolyte interface, particularly on the anode side, that will be electronically insulating and ionically conductive, that shuts down the self-discharge reactions. And this SEI, to me, is the major differentiator for the life and safety of the battery technologies. And so many top scientists in the world, um, you know, including Asia, Europe, and uh, uh, North America, a lot of us spend our career trying to understand uh, you know, at atomic level, what is the uh, uh, composition, what is the uh, distribution of this SEI. And uh, uh, when we uh, do the battery research, at least in my group, we have the tagline saying from atom to system, We'd like to take a uh, bottom-up approach where we design things at the atomic level, understand things at the atomic level, and design uh, eventually move towards the uh, uh, cell and then the system level optimization. So what the battery field have achieved in the last 30 years is indeed quite amazing. Uh, I think GLAB showed uh, uh, looking forward in the next few decades, what could happen. And my slides have been very focusing on what happened in the last 30 years, at least for this part, because what I think uh, important to point out is that uh, uh, engineering uh, is actually really, really important. You know, with engineering, we were able to triple the energy density in the fixed volume cells, 18650 cells. Uh, we were able to reduce the cost by 10 times. We were able to, able to extend the lifetime. And this are all thanks to the advanced diagnosis and the characterizations that we have uh, carried out for understanding uh, matters at atomic and molecular level. 
So this graph uh, that made by Argonne National Lab, uh, JC the in the phase one, very nicely demonstrated that, uh, you know, including what uh, uh, Gleb have mentioned, uh, you know, the future technologies can bring us two to three times in uh, energy density. Um, and uh, in order for us to achieve the similar accomplishment that lithium ion battery have enjoyed, we really need to focus on the fundamental understanding. And now we also have an important task for the recycling of the batteries because uh, obviously the world is going to have terawatt hour units of batteries and recycling of lithium ion have to start now. Uh, if we're, I can remind you the lead acid batteries did not start recycling only after Second World War, which is long overdue <laughs> because it was actually uh, deployed to the world uh, in the uh, uh, late 19th centuries. Uh, but lithium ion batteries now, 30 years later, is really the time for us to carefully think about the recycling science. And it cannot be done the same way as lead acid battery. It has to be done completely differently. Okay. So um, I will take the next few minutes to walk you through the Battery 500 Consortium work. It's a flagship program by Department of Energy uh, to enable lithium metal batteries. Um, I think the lithium battery, ba metal batteries today is entirely different from the lithium metal batteries uh, back in the 1970s because the cathode materials at that time has no lithium in it. But now we have all these cathode materials that with lithium. So if we enable lithium metal batteries now, ideally you do not need any lithium metal on the negative electro side. You can have anode free, but uh, uh, in the uh, reality, it's really difficult to achieve um, uh, completely anode free. So we use a very thin seed layer of the lithium metals here. And uh, the electrolyte is completely different from what we use in the uh, lithium ion system. So the goal is to go for higher energy density. Uh, of course, I show you the uh, performance data first, but I'm a scientist, so I'm most interested in understanding why, you know, back in 2017, we the performance was so poor. I mean, anytime we cycle these two amp hour cell, by the way, this is a 20 layer, multi-layer cells, not a laboratory scale. You cannot do this kind of um, work in the academic institution. It has to be a collaborative effort between us and the national lab. Um, and from 2017 to 2018, we completely switch out to the electrolyte, which makes sense because the previous electrolyte was designed for graphite anode. Now we have to use lithium metal. So we find a compatible electrolyte. And then the second major progress from 2018 to 2020 is what I want to tell you what happened. Uh, you know, without switching the electrolyte, we only learned how to operate the cells. Uh, and there's a reason why. And I want to make a clear disclaimer here that, uh, uh, you know, you will see uh, QuantumScape is already a pub, pub, uh, public company. Uh, solid energy SES will go for public very soon. Uh, I'm sure they enjoyed our open uh, communication about the science, but we have no connections with any of the commercial uh, entities. So um, right now, I think uh, uh, the uh, uh, cell is operated under certain pressure. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about why as a material scientist, we are very excited to see that uh, the pressure control in the batteries actually become a very important uh, factor uh, to consider. So lithium metal anode, when you do electrochemical deposition, depends on what electrolyte you use. You can develop this kind of whiskers morphology, or you can develop this kind of large chunky um, metal grains. Of course, by intuition, you can imagine we want this kind of um, metal, like dense metal to be deposited because the Columbic efficiencies for these kind of dense metal will be much more uh, uh, reversible compared to the whiskers type. However, how to achieve that with a thousand cycles? Here is the question, right? Because if you recall in the semiconductor industry when the damascene process was invented to deposit the copper in the deep trench, they only need to deposit once. 
However, in our lithium metal deposition, we not only need to deposit, we have to strip it back. We have to send this lithium back to the cathode and deposit again and send it back again. So it's a really long process, right? If you look at the achievement of the electrolyte uh, advancement, that, that moved us from the low 90s to close to 99.5% efficiency. Now, the second thing we really start to think about the lithium metal, sodium metal, all these reactive metals, they're very soft. So can we think about ways to tune in the mechanical properties to ensure this lithium deposition and the stripping are both reversible and dense? So the first challenge back in the 2017 is that we have so few tools that actually allow us to observe lithium metal without contamination of air and the water and CO2. Lithium at the room temperature react with everything, react with water, react with CO2, react even with nitrogen at the room temperature, okay? So when we do the focused iron being cut, you can actually see if you do use room temperature process, even your iron being, the guardian iron being will alloy with lithium. So you just get a huge mess if you do the characterization. And the only way to get around with it is either you switch out your iron beam to xenon or argon. If you don't have that kind of money, because those machines cost $2 million, if you don't have that kind of, you can use a cheap cryo stage method to cool down the stage and significantly suppress the reaction of lithium with um, other matters, because lithium itself does not go through phase transformation until minus 186 degrees Celsius. So um, at a liquid nitrogen temperature, it's OK. Once we have this tool, we also develop a similar tool in the transmission electron microscope. And this tool now allow us to look at how the distribution of the interface and the lithium metal is. And you can see this lithium metal almost liquid-like. They are distributed inside, cap encapsulated by this uh, SEI layer. And uh, the different morphology give you different quantities of the lithium that is encapsulated inside the SEI. And this kind of uh, uh, advanced characterization tool typically is, you know, when we, First, the seed use of this tool is to imaging Zika virus, right? Ebola virus is in the biofield, but the battery field very happily we adopted the uh, advancement in the cryogenic imaging because it's not just the low temperature. What you see here, the imaging with this kind of resolution is done by only a few electrons per Armstrong square. So the detector is extremely sensitive and that's why we can actually capture this kind of phenomena that previously we cannot see. But the disadvantage of TEM is always like the blind person touching the elephant, right? Because you only zoom in a small area of the uh, matter. So what you want is a global information about exactly how much lithium is trapped in the SEI. So with that, uh, we invented this called the titration gas chromatography. So you utilize the reactivities of these lithium and metals. And uh, when you titrate it with solvent, uh, the right solvent, one of the gas, particularly hydrogen, you know, we know that there's a lot of uh, prior knowledge accumulated about the hydrogen quantification because we had to spend a, you know, a lot of time on hydrogen uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, but now we utilize this method to quantify what is the dead lithium trapped in the battery. And uh, you, with the uh, proper calibration curve, we can measure all different kinds of electrolytes. What is their impact on the Coulombic efficiency? And we found that actually the different electrolytes that people use, we have electrolyte from Army Research Lab, from General Motors. We found that the SEI amount, is there's not a lot of difference, but the trapped lithium amount is so vastly different. It's because of that microstructure picture I showed you uh, a few graphs ago. You know, if you have this kind of microstructure, you will have a large amount of lithium trapped inside the SEI. But if you have this kind of large granular lithium, you can have very, very high Coulombic efficiencies. Uh, not only we found this uh, interesting phenomena, I think we also went on to 
build what we call the pressure controlled uh, load cells to study the impact of mechanical pressure on soft metals like lithium foil. And the result is quite surprising because um, lithium metal, bulk lithium metal does not plastically deform until five megapascal. What we're seeing is very sensitive at a low pressure such as 300 to 400 kilopascal a magnitude less than what we would imagine that lithium metal will be impacted by the mechanical properties, right? So that's a big surprise for me and my students, but this phenomenon is repeatedly seen in all the different current density when we test this uh, hypothesis. And uh, we can also use cryo uh, SEM to look at the uh, uh, morphology. And what we found is that the densification seems to occur around the 400 kilopascal. And this densification will be further revealed if you do the cross-section card. You know, uh, it's actually the first time I'm seeing this really beautiful coroner lithium metal depositions um, in, on the copper substrate. And uh, obviously something happened uh, at nucleation of the lithium, because we know the bulk lithium does not plastically deform until five megapascal. So there must be some interesting mechanical properties that are associated with the electrochemically deposited lithium when it first gets nucleated on the copper substrate. The lower the pressure is, the more porous your lithium metal will become. So um, the key here is that keep the pressure on, keep the pressure on, during the cycling um, and the, the dynamic pressure control is very difficult, I understand, because uh, you know the thickness is going to change, right? So how do you maintain the pressure while the thickness is changing um, is not an easy task. In the laboratory small scale cells, we can accomplish that. But in the large scale automotive cells, how to achieve that is a big question, right? So um, that, leave us to this uh, publication actually just came out yesterday uh, from Nature Energy. Uh, the simulation work that uh, done with my colleague in Idaho National Lab shows actually the nucleus of the lithium metal behave fundamentally different from the bulk lithium metal. And this is again, you know, where we see the beautiful phenomena that happen in the nanomaterials. Uh, people always say nano is strong. But I think for reactive metal, what we see here is that the densification of these lithium metals can occur at a very low pressure, actually. Uh, so during this uh, exercise, I think we prove that using the pressure knob is a very important uh, fact that we have to think about. Um, but you know, the external pressure, um, I think a lot of engineers just think it's uh, so not elegant. So you have to what? You have to cycle your batteries when you actually keep monitoring the pressure. So uh, I think that um, what we see is what we see, right? Whether the engineers can eventually implement this in the large scale cells is a different question. However, I do want to mention that uh, uh, in UCSD, my group is the uh, original inventor of uh, liquefied gas electrolyte. So in our group, we spun out the South Eight Technologies uh, company, also for full disclosure, uh, you know, it's out from my research group, but this is a cylindrical cell. So what my students use is those uh, fluorinated uh, gas molecules, the ones that used for refrigeration. He was able to dissolve the salts and because this cylindrical cells is self pressurized, so the pressure is generated by the gas molecules themselves when they liquefy. So these lithium metal cells can actually operate at a very, very wide range, minus 60 C to positive 60 C with extremely beautiful uh, morphology of dense lithium deposited at even very, very low temperature. So um, I think that uh, gave you a good sense about how sensitive the lithium metal is towards the pressure mechanical pressure, right? Which is non-existent in the intercalation materials because the intercalation materials are mostly not sensitive towards external pressure. So um, I think I'm moving towards the end of my presentation because uh, uh, Professor Glab Lushing already gave a very good talk about uh, solid state batteries. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, the solid state batteries is also 
could potentially be the drop-in solution uh, because uh, we have succeeded in making very, very thin uh, you know, layer of solid state electrolyte and the very high loading of the cathode. Um, and uh, the prototypes coming from the research labs, uh, you know, uh, we sometimes allow our visitors to cut a battery or two and guarantee there will be no fires, right? These are the kind of uh, uh, batteries that excite people because uh, of course, you know, uh, if we want to put a large scale batteries inside our house, uh, I've driven my Tesla for three years. I never park my car in the garage because I know the liquid electrolyte has issues. <laughs> so the solid state does give you some kind of um, uh, uh, assurance that because the electrolyte itself is not flammable, but this is not the reason me as a scientist was so excited about solid state batteries. We are excited about solid state batteries because uh, you know solid state battery is not liquid. So uh, Gleb mentioned about uh, the importance of not having the void, the empty space in the solid state electrolyte. I totally agree with that. Anytime you have a void because the solid state cannot flow, solid electrolyte is not liquid, they cannot flow and fill the void. So you will create a lot more additional interfaces that you have to take care of. And this is a really problem, um, you know, if we think about how solid state batteries can compete in terms of its performance with liquid. But um, at the same time, I think uh, <clears throat> if you look at the electrochemical um, windows of liquid versus the solid, in solid, we have a lot of choice. We have polymers, we have sulfides, we have oxides. It is really truly exciting to think about the solid state ionics field. Um, it uh, is only the very beginning, but uh, when we have sulfides that is chemically unstable with the NMC cathode, companies like uh, Toyota reported that, well, you can put a layer of buffer layer on the cathode and your performance will significantly improve right away. So from the fundamental understanding perspective is that the solid electrolyte itself is actually electrochemically active. So this is the part I think, uh, uh, you know, com I guess challenge our conventional wisdom because the conventional wisdom is the solid electrolyte does not, uh, not the solid electrolyte, sorry, the electrolyte itself only transport the ion but does not participate in the electrochemical reactions. However, now you can see that uh, uh, the solid electrolyte, the sulfide, if you give it, give it an electronic pathway, it can be electrochemically reversible and very reversible, okay? So the question for electrochemists is that, is the reaction good or bad? If it's good, I will make it happen fast because if you look at the formation of the species at the negative electrode side, is Li2S, Li3P, they are both electronically insulating and ionically conductive. So these are good SEI layers. If they form, it's perfect. On the cathode side, we have a problem because the generation of the sulfur typically is a bad thing because sulfur will lead to very high impedance because sulfur does not conduct lithium very well. So once you understand, really fully understand that the plus and the minus of this interfacial reaction, you can then go and design cells. You know, okay, okay this is just another, another slide to prove my point, right? The negative electrolyte conduct the lithium so well, the positive electrolyte after the formation, the first decomposition, impedance is through the roof. So once you Early understand- Let's have one more minute. Yep. If yep. you understand these phenomena, you can just, uh, minimize the decomposition reactions by removing the carbon uh, black from the cell. So by doing this, we were able to actually enable very thick loading of the cathode uh, of the solid state batteries. Um, Amy, Amy, I think I was given 40 minutes or is that 30 minutes? I think there may be some misunderstanding. Ah, there may be. You Okay, it does 40 minutes. Yes. And then we started a little bit late. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think on my clock is 33 minutes right now. So, okay. Um, 
I will just uh, keep going. All right. So once we solve the um, cathode side of the problem, on the anode side, the lithium metal is a real big problem because the mechanical sensitivities of the lithium metal to the external pressure. But the solid state batteries right now cannot operate very well unless you have external pressure. So all the lithium cells, lithium metal cells will immediately short if you have a pressure larger than five megapascal on the cells. So what happened to the field right now is actually, I think uh, Glab will be very happy to see this because um, the, the use of silicon um, anode is now very, very promising in the uh, solid state batteries. So the reason is that the solid state battery, uh, the algidide based, the sulfide based electrolyte is completely stable with silicon on the negative electro side. The interface is stable. The lithium transport in the silicon is very, very fast. Uh, we can zip through the uh, eight to 10 milliamp hour per uh, centimeter square silicon uh, at a very uh, high critical current density. And what's more exciting for us is that we're seeing again, a very interesting mechanical phenomena where the lithium silicon uh, alloys completely densify uh, in our um, solid state cells. And when you take lithium back to the cathode, you have a dimensionally stable um, silicon anode. And this silicon anode has absolutely no carbon. It's carbon free, 99.9% .9 silicon, only 0.1% binder. And if we talk about the supply chain, I think silicon is the way to go because the graphite is uh, mostly controlled by the Asian suppliers. But silicon is something very, very promising. I think Glab showed so uh, good uh, liquid cell data. And I'm showing you today very promising uh, data on the solid state battery side. So it seems like uh, moving towards uh, you know, silicon or lithium metal anode uh, really is uh, uh, going to happen in the next few years, regardless if you're using liquid electrolyte or solid electrolyte. My last slide. I just want to uh, you know, prepare for today's panel discussion later that I really see a need for US to have a domestic manufacturing all hands on deck. I mean, nobody can be left out not doing things. Uh, we need a workforce. We need the ideas. We need the supply chain of uh, uh, sustainable materials and the transformative manufacturing. And it is really the um, tasks that are so challenging that I don't think any single PI research group will be able to accomplish. So I'll be happy to dive deeper in this discussion later. Um, and uh, yeah, I have been very fortunate to have the pleasure working with both industry and the government labs and uh, really grateful for this opportunity to present today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shirley, for that. That was a great talk. Um, I, why don't we open it up for questions? We can start with targeted questions for Shirley, but then also fold in the board discussion about the topic. So you're welcome to either raise your hand or put the question in the chat. Shelly, why don't I turn it over to you? Thanks, Amy. Uh, Shirley, great presentation um, as usual. Uh, I greatly enjoyed it. Um, you know. I guess I come from a, not from the lithium ion um, battery um, community. And so um, in this sort of aqueous um, redox flow battery community, they've been talking a lot about um, this concept of basically renting the vanadium, um, right? Um, is that there would be companies that would come out and rent um, someone the vanadium to put in their redox flow battery and then come and pick it up and regenerate it. And, um, and so you brought up recycling, um, which I think is really, really important. Um, what kind of, I guess, strategies are, are, are people thinking um, in the lithium ion battery community or the sort of beyond lithium um, ion battery um, community to think about um, how you, <laughs> um, how I guess not so much how you recycle, um, but how you get people to um, recycle and uh, how you get consumers to, to, to buy into that. Yeah, very good question. So I think uh, there's still a debate of who should pay for the recycling. Uh, is that the customer or is that the 
um, you know, the car companies or the battery company, right? So now the battery company and the car company, the line is merging. So um, <laughs> yeah, but I do want to uh, kind of uh, um, say that uh, let's say there is a mandate for from government that you have to recycle um, the um, lithium ion batteries. What we need to do, I think that's um, probably uh, better for the scientists to discuss that. So I, I think that in terms of the current way of re recycling, so uh, the U.S. government does have this resale center where it's uh, uh, kind of uh, changing the way how uh, battery is recycled. So I, I, I think that uh, for the current lithium ion batteries, uh, we have these three choices called the pyro, uh, metallurgical or uh, hydro metallurgical pyro and the hydro you know by the name you can think about it's uh, using a lot of high temperature or high uh, pressure or using some acid you know these method um, you know are already being implemented by companies like Umicore they are very very uh, good at uh, leading the recycling of cobalt lithium cobalt oxide particularly cobalt uh, but uh, Direct recycling is something I think, uh, uh, at least uh, you know, right now is a very uh, popular way of thinking about how lithium ion cells, if it can be safely disassembled, uh, we can actually uh, separate out the electrode materials. And uh, because we know the degradation mechanism, for instance, uh, it's lithium inventory loss in the cathode. So we can actually invent a method to replenish the lithium in the cathode and then recover that cathode is called a direct recycling. So my colleague Zhen Chen spent a lot of time figuring out how to do direct recycling. Um, I think that uh, uh, this way we can reduce the energy consumption and the CO2 carbon footprint. But you know, lithium ion batteries, larger scale recycling, I don't think it will happen until 2025 or 2026 because um, you know, the first generation of the EV uh, I, I think it's probably, yeah, the timing wise is uh, hard to um, imagine it's going to be before um, 2025 or 2026. So it gave us a few years to really uh, debate about who should pay for the recycling. Uh, I do have a Tesla. I have no idea because they don't tell me like at the end of the life, what do we do with the batteries? Um, I asked the, the employee said they don't know. So um, yeah. I think they want to have it back for free, but I don't want to give back for free. I know how much value is in it. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think we have a few years to publicly debate about who should be paying for the recycling cost. Uh, but my preference is, is that the companies who come out with this product, they should be responsible uh, for the materials, circular uh, nature of the materials. Thank you. Jody, thank thank you, um, thank you, Shirley, for your for your talk. Um, I I'm I'm trying to think about re recycling, um, uh, and I think like for I I'm trying to think like in this liquid versus solid battery because it sounds like the future is heading towards all solid battery. It seems like recycling that would be easier because you don't have to deal with solvent handling or you don't have to deal with handling liquid electrolytes. So, I mean, it it, it sounds like it might be easier. Yeah, um, if to Professor Whittingham, I think uh, he always said that you have to get rid of all the toxic salts, which is the PF6. Yeah. So right now in California for lithium ion, we cannot set up a plant for recycling because of the PF6. Uh, I can't get uh, past the EHS for setting up the facility, but for the solid state, we succeed. We can succeed in doing that because the wow. sulfide-based uh, matters are completely dissolving alcohol and actually make the you know I think uh, Professor Yuxin's synthesis process already hinted that it can be completely dissolved in things, um, and then you can use it for other chemical synthesis. So indeed, yeah, solid state gave us great hope that we will be able to have the 100% recyclable batteries. Mm, but the, for the solid state, yeah, I don't know if Glab, you know, 
I think we're talking about 2028, 2029. I'm going to challenge the view that the, the future goes to solid stage. <laughs> we don't yeah, know if we don't have a crystal ball. Uh, but you know, and there might multiple challenges with recycling both solid state and, and conventional batteries. Um, yeah, yeah. The future is solid, but the, the present is fluid. There's no doubt about that. Because oh, maybe we can debate. <laughs> we can debate. Liquid electrolyte now. Yeah, I think we need to figure out how to recycle this liquid electrolyte batteries. That's very, very hard. Let's move to John. Hey, uh, two great talks. Uh, this isn't my area, but I'm interested as an engineer thinking about perhaps like a you know, hundred year horizon for a battery, right? Instead of just one battery or an optimal sort of system. And it sort of seems like, yeah, this, this issue of recyclability is sort of piggyback onto what Jody brought up was, is, is so critical. You know, if you have an okay battery that can be modulated and taken apart and put back together with, with ease, low technology, uh, and you could do that you know, 10,000 times um, and have it be okay. Seems like it might be an interesting way to think about it as well. And I'm curious, have, have there been funding sort of structures for to take batteries apart efficiently and put them back together efficiently, right? So not just the technology for the battery itself, but actually have built in this, this design aspect of to be recycled a thousand times uh, to some degree efficiently. I, I don't know the space and I'm curious if that would be something that you know, funding towards would help, or maybe it's already been done. Mm. Yeah, very good question. I, I think the design for recycling is actually the new buzzword <laughs> in our field. Yeah, in the past, no, I would say that uh, um, a lot of the battery modules, um, I mean, we receive like the BMW and uh, Nissan's old pack for secondary use on the grid. Uh, that's at one time, this is one of the most popular ways of thinking about the you know, second use life of the batteries is when it retires from the uh, cars, it can come to the grid for the operation. And I look at those modules, I was thinking, man, I don't want to be the one who take them apart. Yeah, it's very, very right. bold together and not easy to disassemble. I don't think that people were thinking about uh, you know, how you can be so modular that you will switch out to bad cells and then replenish new ones. And uh, yeah, so I think that's definitely an area that uh, we should, uh, you know, brainstorm and think about it. But at the moment, I think a lot of the battery, they can, they can build the modular better now. I think that today's package pack and the, compared to the past, the probably it's quite different. I don't know what, if uh, the lab wants to add in because as far as I know, there was no, you know, kind of easy solutions for how to recycle the batteries for a thousand times yet. Yeah, all, all, all fair comments. I would also maybe kind of expand the discussion. There are like three ways you can um, think about sustainability in, in supply chain for very, for very human batteries. One is certainly recycling and lead acid batteries are being recycled close to 100% of those because lead is dangerous because there's not enough lead um, available. Um, but you know there are still three pathways for lithium ion. One, you can design batteries right that have a very long uh, cycle life, very long uh, calendar life that would outlast um, you know the the life of electric vehicles. You can also utilize um, you know very abundant materials that have low cost. You can utilize like iron. You can utilize sulfur in the construction. So you can still kind of recycle those. Um, but I think the the market pressure would be significantly reduced uh, for these technologies. Uh, so I don't want to kind of discard uh, other other opportunities, um, but even even if like along the cycle life cells, they have to be <laughs> designed slightly differently. Yes, you can like potentially revive um, some of the kind of um, cells if depending on the degradation mechanism. So if there is like electrolyte starvation, if there is a you know lack of loss of lithium, uh, you can maybe inject electrolyte, you can inject lithium, but this is not straightforward, and the cells have to be designed this way. Uh, if you think about like very long cycle life cells that can be used in, in secondary markets, you also have to think about how they degrade. So sometimes cells degrade not very peacefully. So they, the degradation goes down, um, you know, peacefully for the you know, initial like 20% degradation, 30% degradation, and then there's a cold nose dive. Uh, so when degradation happens very rapidly, uh, so those <laughs> we certainly want to avoid. We don't want to use them in a grid. 
uh, if, because they induce potential dangers, because they, they, uh, it becomes not economical essentially uh, to visualize those. So those have to be uh, thought in advance. Um, and so I think lots of people are thinking about all different directions. Um, mm -hmm. Anup, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you. Um, so great talks, by the way, learned a lot. Um, and so it seems like, you know, Gleb, that there are a lot of fundamental challenges. I think both uh, Shirley and you mentioned, and you mentioned a number of times that there is a lot of pressure, you know, you're getting a lot of venture capital money, but then there is always the time pressure to deliver, deliver. So I'm asking the other extreme. I mean, th this is the future, right, of transportation. As a country, are we making enough investment in fundamental research? I'm glad to see that DOE is, you know, just one office, but you know, VTO has a pretty, you know, a small budget. Shirley, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, their funding. Uh, what, what's your opinion compared to, you know, globally, uh, what other countries are doing? Mm -hmm. And other governments? Well, I, can, I, I can maybe start, and Shirley can finish, and we can do the other way around. I think, you know, you know, US does invest a lot, but <laughs> certainly not enough. And you're asking professors to tell you, like, of course, we, we tell you, like, you know, there's not enough investments compared to other countries, compared to Asia. This is clearly the case. But I would say, you know, the science cannot live in isolation. Like, you cannot produce, you know, a lot of students that have nowhere to go after, after they graduate, right? They have to have jobs. So they have to have, you have to, you know, kind of move the whole supply chain. Otherwise, you know, who, who would go to become scientists, battery scientists, if they once they graduate, there's nowhere to go except abroad. People don't typically like going abroad. So I think bringing supply chain is much more pressing issue. In addition, I think bringing supply chain brings all the other side benefits, right? So implement all these innovations. You have to like work closely. You have to understand the details, you know, of the industrial processes, right? To understand deeply, not what you think the industry needs, but what it actually needs. Uh, understand all these limitations. And so without local supply chain, you know, without local discussions, it's very challenging, right? You have to like, to implement any innovations, you have to work sometimes as one company. So there should be a lot of trust, a lot of movements, a lot of open discussions. It's so much easier to do it when the company is local, you know? And I would also say maybe in terms of investment, it is important to invest more in research in, in R&D, but, you know, diversify all investments. You, you can't give all the money to one office in the government and tell them, to, you know, to choose whatever they think is the best because everybody have their own biases, right? I think the best is to distribute the funds in among different offices, different offices in, in DOE, different offices in DOD, in NASA, in all those organizations. So they would, you know, uh, eventually, you know, <laughs> it is a competition who would, who would make best, uh, best investments. Um, yeah, Shirley, I thought your last slide was very effective at showing the range. It's not just academic yeah. research all the way to large scale. There, there's a critical middle piece there that I think we might be missing. So I, I think uh, I will add on what Gleb just shared. So think about uh, Europe and Asia as the two um, competitive landscape that we're thinking about. So in Europe, for instance, for the battery, uh, you know, the German battery research center is $500 million investment. <laughs> and the Faraday's Institute is something like a 260 million pounds investment, right? So what happened in Europe is that their funding source is single, but it's very big, right? And in Asia, on the other hand, is that the government will subsidize the company. I mean, they have incentives to, you know, encourage the supply chain to occur. So unfortunately, in the United States, we have neither. But what we do have is a very, very innovative ecosystem. I mean, other countries don't have what we have as the VC environment, right? We have no, like the students, a lot of them really fearless, right? They want to do startup companies just like a Glab have done. <laughs> yeah, I, I always thought it's a super courageous to, you know, think about building your own companies and things like that. And the people here, so encouraging this kind of risk-taking, you know, not, afraid to fail and of course you know uh, encourage unicorn companies so us has a very unique culture uh, but uh, like amy said i think what's really missing is this the second death valley where you have to scale from the prototyping stuff to the actual manufacturing um, part that investment piece i think uh, we, we're still debating right for example if domestic manufacturing should come back to united states 
you know, this answer is not clear yet. One of the reason is why, because battery is a low profit margin business. I mean, if we're talking about the vaccination vaccines, right? The, the, there's no profit margin, should, should not have profit margin, but we have to do it. So I think we need to look at this energy critical energy technology more like the vaccination. It's not a choice. You have to strategically, we have to do this. Right. So mm -hmm. if corporates have to look at uh, uh, where they put their money on, uh, I really think that, uh, you know, once the new type of batteries is invented, that we will have unimaginable application come out. Right. I think the profit will come. But if you only think about what's the lithium ion chemistry right now, you know, what the Asian uh, countries have done with their gigawatt factories, profit margin is less than 10%. Honestly speaking, I think uh, it's really low profit margin. However, you know, I think uh, um, right now the EV industry is taking off. And then I think the grid storage, if we think about it, every household is going to have a electron refrigerator in the future because we need the resilience towards climate crisis, then the customer will come. So I, I think this is really at the uh, inflation point where you know, the National Academy should have strong influence on you know, how we think about um, you know, investment in terms of funding. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question, Anna. Um, actually, I like your answer, but I can I build on it a little bit? Um, <laughs> you know, the profit margins are indeed low, but in all mature industries, the profit margins are low. Like in the car companies, in airplane companies, the profit margins are even smaller. Airline companies have zero profit margins. <laughs> so, you know, on profit margins alone is not necessarily kind of the only thing to consider. In addition, when the industry is local and you can innovate, you can actually improve your profit margin quite substantially, right? You have to produce, let's say, you, conventional production of lithium ion battery cells give you 10% profit margins. If you can figure out how to produce twice as many cells, uh, then your profit margin will, will definitely improve, right? Um, yeah. It's all about innovations. And to innovate, you have to have something local. You have to learn <laughs> and teach others, right? Um, Gerard. Thank you, uh, Gérard Bayeri from Procter & Gamble. So I may propose a third way, and it's maybe more for the board because they have attended the conversation yesterday. So uh, Professor Mang and Galeb, Gleb, excuse us if we speak a bit in codes. Uh, we are talking about unicorns and uh, startups, and we are talking about incumbent industry. So I'm just thinking this way. Who owns the battery market? I do believe that it's legitimate to say, why would we not have in the US um, a manufacturing scale so as we can be control, uh, in control of our destiny? Looks like that it's a fair debate. I mean, we cannot decide here, but let's take this hypothesis. C coming from Procter & Gamble, I asked the question from Gleb. I mean, absolutely amazed by, really uh, confident about the work that the two of you are doing on the science. Now I'm looking at an industrialization and I'm saying, hmm, the quality assurance, the surprise will come from the supply chain. Now you can say it's up to the incumbent to deal with that and provide the right specification and they should pay for recycling. I think it's a bit, you know, <laughs> I pass the button to someone else to deal with it. But I want to, to reflect on uh, what Ignacio Martinez shared with us yesterday, uh, the board. It was not a startup, but what they said is they built at the end of the day, they built the science for five years, thanks to investments, which were not the typical VC. It could be the VC, but they built the science, the first principle modeling, uh, the manufacturing congruent with the raw material congruent with you know, the final product, which is the vaccine in the case of Moderna. Now, one can say the vaccine is easier than what we are dealing with the battery. And I will, by the way, sympathize with that. But I'm just wondering whether there is another business model innovation. Now, what's the role of the National Academy of Science? I don't know. But I will submit we might be stronger by building, how to say, a platform, not just one product, which is a solid state battery that can do that. But it seems that what you have developed, the two of you and others, is a platform which can have various applications. Okay, it has a business model. How can we replace the battery today so as you know we can have the cost and we can have the supply sufficiency? But it seems to me to be more richness. So I come back a bit. I'm a bit preaching here. Don't be in love with your solution. Don't just be in love with the specific problems. 
And that's what a bit what we heard yesterday. And we certainly in Procter & Gamble, we resonate to that, right? We build platforms. And these platforms after that have 10 years and 20 years of existence. But the point I'm making, and that's where I'm a bit worried, okay? Uh, and, and don't be defensive is when you go into real life with a new supply chain, new raw material coming from the US, call it silicon, there is plenty of silicon, and you have to do that, surprises will happen. So building the foundation, helping you, the two of you, to be able to build this foundation, which is no more than what you need to know, build a model, build some pilot test, you know, some commercialization, that's maybe where, where we need to think about you know, whether we can provide some help. I have a silence because I know that <laughs> that's related right. to what we say. But yesterday we had this discussion, right? How can we help the US chemical enterprise to disruption? What we see here is a disruption, right? And is it a unicorn playing the lottery? Is it the incumbent industry who will have to pay everything to make sure everything is good quality? Who is this incumbent industry? So I think the business model is probably one of the conversations we have to, to make. Uh, I mean, absolutely. And I think quality is like one of the earliest investors uh, or companies working on, on green, green technology failed because they didn't understand deeply the business case. They didn't have a good business model. So if you don't have a good business model, even if you have amazing scientists, even if you have amazing investors, it just doesn't work, right? The, the business has to make sense economically. Um, and so the ecosystem is definitely will be helpful. <laughs> And the business model, Gleb, maybe there is a first generation. The two of you have clearly a first generation. Sorry, I love the first slide you presented, uh, Professor Chmang, where you present the story and you hope that there will be six generation of Nobel Prizes. Mm -hmm. That yes. inspired me a lot. I'm not a kid, I'm not going back to school, and I'm an organic chemist. I'm not an inorganic chemist. It's wrong with me. But what I'm saying, you know, there may be various businesses that you could create out of your I'm um, joint platform. And yeah. the, the, the business model is good, Gleb, and I think that's great, but sometimes we just look at the business model for a product and we mm -hmm. are maybe missing there are different businesses. So therefore there is a kind of business model that is not just dependent on one product, replacing the current battery, but can go beyond it. Yeah, so Gerard, the reason is the silence because you got me really thinking. <laughs> so um, really, I think your uh, way of uh, thinking about this is very similar as when, you know, semiconductor industry become mature, they have a foundry, right? The foundry has other people come with ideas and they have a roadmap for many possibilities of different types of products serving different applications. So I think that's a great idea. You know, um, there's has been discussions among us, um, you know, the uh, people who work in the labs and the, the academic institutions. Uh, but yeah, I would really love to hear from your perspective, when we have this kind of foundry models, right? Um, who should be the ones running it? Should it be the private industry or should it be the national labs? I mean, definitely won't be the university, but we will provide all the workforces for this type of efforts. But, you know, it's really oh, yeah, yeah. clear. Yeah. So what fascinated me, what fascinated me and then I stopped uh, is yesterday what we heard from flagship pioneering it's the joint investments of incumbents, incumbents and disruptors on the science and maybe others coming together, which is not usually the way we think about it with a startup, right? You can have incumbents funding a startup with maybe they are one day buying it back or getting shared, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really different. So they are really uh, you know, putting more players, including the players who will be disrupted into the party. Uh, sorry, I stopped here, but we can share with you obviously. I, I mean, this conversation, um, this conversation brings me back to thinking about Semitech, which is this um, consortium that was um, uh, advancing the needs of the United States semiconductor industry. Why could, you know, why not have something like that for, for batteries? And, um, and I, I, uh, I was, uh, as an undergrad, I did research in semiconductors because I thought I was going to do semiconductors, and then that kind of collapsed right around the time I was graduating. So, so here, here I am now. But um, I, I mean, that environment at that time was very engaging, dynamic. Um, it felt the same way Silicon Valley, Valley felt at that at that time in my life. And why can't we have that here for batteries? Um, yeah, there is a question of 
who who runs this thing, right? But Semitech um, was um, is very successful. Um, but I I bring up the devil's advocate, like the other side of it, which um, Shirley Gleb um, can comment on, um, maybe Shelley as well. But um, last week I was uh, sitting on the review panel for J. Caesar, which is this big um, DOE battery hub. And um, we were listening to uh, the evolution of J. Caesar, how in the beginning, and I apologize if I portray this incorrectly, it's what I perceived when I heard it, but in the beginning, it sounded like this, this big battery hub was getting a lot of industry engagement. Um, so it's not necessarily a consortium, but you could see maybe that was a direction it was headed. But there was a disconnect between what the companies wanted versus the groundbreaking fundamental research because the research may give you fantastic performance and it cycles 10 times. Or you might give something that cycles a thousand times but doesn't have the numbers that industry wants. And so I think there's a lot of friction between um, kind of the fundamental boots on the ground research that academics are doing versus what industry wants. They want something they wanna invest in right now. And um, that's not always something that uh, um, that that can happen. And so what happened was with Jay Caesar, um, it sounded like when in their second round for renewal, they pivoted towards more fundamental research because they had to decide which path do we take. Um, anyway, so I, I guess can you can you comment about the friction between you know those really risky new battery chemistries and what industry wants and how to reconcile that? But uh, I'll go first add, yeah, because uh, I, I think uh, compared to Glab's experience, I think he had a lot of support to the CELA nanotechnologies uh, in terms yeah. of support from the government. Uh, I mean, not uh, maybe not enough, but uh, quite a substantial. For, for me, I think uh, I have really you know, worked both with the basic energy sciences division and also the EERE energy efficiency uh, uh, side. Uh, I think what I see is really that uh, um, your interpretation, uh, Jody, uh, is completely on the spot. What happened, right? When we when it first started, the industry was so excited. They were so excited that J. Caesar will, you know, form this consortium where you know we will do things to uh, enable you know better batteries. That you know a lot of the uh, industry parties that engaged in the, and then I. I believe it's because that a lot of these work were perceived not fundamental because there's already a commercial device out there. So this is another thing maybe the industry leaders can make comments. Um, I think it's not true, right? If you have a commercial product, it even means that we need to do more fundamental science to enable future generation of the product. So that, that's, I would say, is the, what happened when we are perceived as using taxpayers' money, we're supposed to do fundamental science, but because there's already a battery product, you're not doing fundamental science. You're doing things that to apply. You're, you're right on, so I think, right this, I think this should be a mindset change, a uh, very strong mindset change. And so, um, like you know, one way to overcome it is you know other other governments that do, um, or maybe some states, some state governments do. Essentially, they provide matching funds to industry-funded research. Let's say because the industry knows how to make money, the industry knows better what you know what they need uh, to innovate, right? To improve the product quality, performance, and cost and, and value. Um, and so you know, matching the cost uh, of industrial investment is, it should be very really advantageous because at the moment, go to any university or national labs. If the product, if the project is sponsored by industry, even if local industry, right, in the same state, you typically pay the highest overhead. <laughs> and you have to deal with all this um, in administration that very often, don't want to make general statement, but very often see any commercial activities, entrepreneurship as something inappropriate for scientists, for pure scientists, right, for pure teachers. It takes away from this precious time <laughs> for them to do fundamental science and teach. And so this is very difficult, right? It should be again changing attitude is, is probably you know what is what is needed the most. Um, mm -hmm. 
I see Gerard uh, has his hand raised again. Is that a, a, a new question or? Um, well, it was, a res it was a response to uh, Shirley asking, what does the industry expert think? So I just wanted to offer, and I'm not an expert in battery, mm -hmm. but what I think the tension you have is if you ask the industry, the incumbents, what they want, they are going to tell you what they want with their view of the world about where batteries should be used. If you take the view, you have a platform and how many advantage, better, cheaper, more storage per table? I don't know. I mean, I'm not understanding, but <laughs> your vision that you can really democratize at a breakthrough disruptive cost could give this platform more influence for the industry not to say, what do you want? Now you have something that can be better for you. The losers are those who do not want to disrupt some of their products to adapt to this one, right? So I don't know whether that fits, but I'm again saying, thinking about different exploitations that could be better and cheaper than what exists can help this platform to have a more influential power to the industry. Because if you ask the industry what they want, they are going to see to tell you what they want from their vantage point, and that may be a barrier. So just a thought. I mean, there, there will always be like losers and winners, right? You know, when industry change happens, right, there is always half of the companies that die, right, because they don't make proper bets. Uh, but you know, the, the government shouldn't be able to. You know, the government also doesn't have a crystal ball, right? Like nobody has a crystal ball where to invest. Um, and so I think diversification. <laughs> Uh, is, is important uh, and some decisions will have to be will likely to do bad um, our um, next question from john it, maybe just more of a comment um the current sort of academic model that we sort of go through from postdoc up to tenure there's a period in there that we are extremely low risk and in a lot of cases it feels like it's even not really looked favorably upon to sort of make some of these connections or take some of these risks with industrial connections or industrial funding or being vulnerable in that space because we can't really make mistakes. And I don't know if it's that way everywhere. I don't, uh, but I just, you know, that's just not maybe in this field, but in a lot of engineering. And it seems like that's an area where we could, I don't know, maybe close some of these gaps um, if that culture sort of changed. It's just more of a comment than really, than really anything. So. But I feel that, you know, really, this isn't my area, but I feel this conversation in parallel. So I will also maybe take this opportunity to announce that uh, uh, from February 2022, I will become the chief scientist for energy storage for Argonne National Lab and the uh, wow. University of Chicago as a professor. So uh, all the conversation uh, you have today is extremely helpful for me when I start a new job next year. The, the official news will come out next week. So, um, you know, that's why I, I already uh, approved the, the news release so I can tell you guys, <laughs> I'm so glad I'm here in this panel. So let's please do keep in touch uh, and particularly the industry leaders and the, you know, the faculty members. I think we really, uh, can work together to in, you know, encourage the mindset and then to make some meaningful changes in the next few years. Uh, because obviously the previous model had some drawback that we have to uh, fix. Yeah. How incredible, okay. congratulations. Thank you. Sounds like we got you at just the right time. <laughs> yeah, the timing is just perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I see um, Amy has her hand raised, so she can congratulate you and then have a comment yeah. or question. <laughs> yeah, no, many congratulations, really. That's exciting. I think, you know, I kind of want to tie um, Jody's observation, which, you know, Shelly, you should correct me, but I, I was also a reviewer for JCs in the early days, and now I should disclose I'm on the advisory board. But my, I want to tie together Jody's comment, you used the word friction, which I think is a very good one. And then Lev's comment on, you know, it took a lot longer than I thought it would, 10 years to commercialize something. And then I want to tie to Shirley's um, work in terms of just some of these challenges with batteries, you can't engineer your way out of. You have to fundamentally understand what the problems are. And so, you know, I think there's some quote from Thomas Edison about batteries making even a decent person a liar. And I 
I am concerned by some of the rhetoric in the news um, that I think many people in the battery community feel like they need to use to attract funding and attract attention. And then and that can lead to, I think, um, raising expectations for results in a way that's not possible to meet. And so how do we, what are your thoughts about how we as a community might more effectively convey, you know, the desperate need for better batteries, the need for high quality work, but also the patience, the resources and the time required. I mean, do you think there's a way that we need to change how we communicate that? And, and is there something maybe that our board could do to enable um, you know, better ways to think about balancing those competing interests? Yeah, I think like one of the observations I have is that the pop culture created these unrealistic expectations. All success is like instant. You invent something and bow you have like a major breakthroughs. In reality, it's like thousands of small innovations <laughs> and it takes so much longer time. Um, so I think perception can be changed. I don't know, maybe we can invite, uh, you know, pop culture influencers, you know, um, people who host talk shows, people who write scripts for movies, for books, you know, visit universities, visit national labs, talk to scientists, talk to, um, you know, engineers, talk to uh, staff, talk to students, and hear about the stories, hear about the dreams, create something beautiful, you know, out of it. Because we do need the voices of, of scientists and dreamers, especially like those dreamers who have like more grounded in reality, we wanted these voices to be amplified. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> anything that works uh, it should, should be implemented. Um, yeah, I think, uh, Amy, I know what you mean. Uh, the um, hype sometimes, you know, I think uh, in the battery field, we actually always have somebody like uh, Professor Stan Whittingham, who is always the person who, you know, like whenever somebody makes some big claims and he will, you know, cautious everyone to be careful and then, you know, be more, um, you know, uh, don't jump on right, do some uh, research and uh, think about it. So, I mean, my take on this is always that uh, uh, self-proclaimed things should always be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, nowadays, the battery industry is so um, uh, matured, I would say we have uh, third party validation uh, um, facilities in both the national lab and the private industry. And in the academic field, we do have those very highly uh, appreciated uh, journals where they have the checklist and then they have, yeah. So I, I think it really takes the entire community to stay vigilant about what we promise to the public. We must. Uh, under promise and over deliver, right? If everybody follow this rule, I think we will be safe. And the, the reverse will be a disaster. That's what always uh, Professor Whittingham have mentored me. Like, you know, you never want to over promise and under deliver. Uh, I think only Elon Musk can get away with that when the timeline came and he couldn't deliver, but most of us don't survive the, 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 the over promise uh, strategy. So yeah, I, I would say yeah, the, um, I also thought the Glabs company will go, uh, you know, much earlier. It was really incredible to actually the journey he took, uh, you know, it's really 10 years. Uh, I still remember that when- yeah, We were very quiet. We didn't, you know, before we had customers and product that we are almost, almost ready, we didn't communicate with, with, the, with the press for eight years. Yes, I, I remember the time when you just uh, formed the company and explained to me what the SILA means in Russia. Um, <laughs> Yeah, just it's already one decade past. Yeah, it's amazing. Telling. Yeah. I was just thinking um, how, how different it is. You would actually think kind of the, the fuel cell research community, the battery research community, and the super caps research community, um, or capacitor research um, community. Um, that sort of that um, standardization um, and those test protocols, um, the checklist that Shirley was talking about, um, that they all came about in very different ways, um, which I think to some extent um, is, uh, is, is great that they came about eventually, but they didn't all come about um, in the same way. So, so in the fuel cell industry, um, you know, DOE from the top down said, we are gonna come up with standardized protocols. Um, and so, you know, 
if I look, you know, if I think about it from an editor perspective, life got really easy for me, not because Jax had a checklist, um, but because DOE had said the, you know, if you're DOE funded, you have to, um, you have to do characterization this way, like right down to the pine um, rotator that you had to use, rotating um, disc electrode that you had to use. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of the world basically sort of followed along with that. Um, but if you look at batteries and supercapacitors, those sort of checklists and those protocols and those third party validations uh, have all came about in very um, different ways. And I think, you know, as we start to think about the future of energy storage and conversion as a whole, um, you know, not just one, uh, you know, not just batteries or just fuel cells or just super caps. Um, that's probably something that we need to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think the challenge is also that, you know, in, in, in the universities, we cannot create this automotive or collage batteries, typically, right? And many degradation mechanisms, they happen very differently in small like, coin cells with, with polarity with electrolyte compared to with like real uh, densely packed cells produced by industry. So this is kind of another barrier, maybe it emphasizes the need of this consortium uh, when yeah. proper battery cells could, could be made. Um, because oh, otherwise, yeah. like, you know, uh, sometimes when people do research, it's really not relevant to industry. You cannot do it. You will have very different results. Um, yeah, I, I think the folks who are doing um, the, um, you know, work that uh, not uh, fit this uh, checklist or the protocols just don't make claims right just just say what you have discovered this is the phenomenon mm -hmm. don't say i'm going to improve the battery energy by yeah. 10 times by projection from the tiny little things to the uh, uh automotive battery test i think that's the only thing editor or reviewers needs to be a bit more careful but you know at the same time we don't want to shut down innovative ideas and the people who come out with out of box ideas so yeah i know it's a very delicate balance but uh, at the same time i think for lithium ion technology the bar is very high now mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, much higher than it was 10 years ago for sure yeah mm -hmm. much much higher yeah but for nascent technologies like sodium batteries zinc batteries I think that we will need to leave them some freedom space uh, for developing uh, the technology because uh, there is really no best fit um, format or chemistries for those uh, new battery chemistries, I guess. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, overall, yeah, I, I'm just happy that uh, today battery research is considered, uh, you know, things we even within the academy of uh, engineering academy of science is considered very critical and important because um when i was on the job market in 2006 you know i've interviewed in places where the academy member told me why why are you still wasting time in batteries it's such an old topic i mean literally I'm the, same. I'm the same experience <laughs> uh, somebody i respected a lot said that to me you know during the job interviews Wow. Look, look at it. Look at us now. <laughs> yeah. I think one comment I want to make, I don't know, before we, before we conclude, uh, I don't know how much, how much more time we have, is that I think it's important also to think about kind of inclusive and, and welcoming uh, entrepreneurial environment so that the best scientists, you know, all from all around the world, you know, the best engineers, the best you know, entrepreneurs come to the United States and start their businesses here. And the same for investors. Um, and I think, again, it has to be a different mindset from the both in the federal and local government uh, point of view, that we have to be welcoming instead of being like, overly protective. Um. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. I um I want to be conscious of everyone's time, um and so and Jody, you should weigh in. I think first, you know, huge thanks to Megan for helping us yep. and supporting us and, and putting this together, and Jody for you know you definitely started all this before I even joined the board. So I think this was a pretty incredible discussion. I think if mm -hmm. if there are any final questions, we can certainly take them, but I know we're running a bit behind as is. So I wanted just to make sure I said thank you before we wrap up. Yeah, the, and, and thank you. And I think Gleb and Shirley, um, your talks were um, very informative and, and uh, started a lot of great discussion, which uh, we, we can take home with us to chew on uh, in the coming days and weeks. So thank you so much. And I'm going to hand it over to Megan now.
Yeah, let's wrap things up. Um, thanks again, Shirley Glove, all the speakers for this week, um, Jody and Amy and all of the board member facilitators for this week. I think we were some really thought provoking sessions and thanks to the board for your engagement. DCST needs you and your ideas and um, your insights into chemical sciences to do what we do. So um, the staff will be in touch with you all about scheduling our next meeting. Um, and thanks again. <laughs>